Section 1 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 1 Palace of the Dalai Lama at Lhasa, Tibet. Photograph Frontispiece. Enclosed by nature between barren deserts and the loftiest peaks of the Himalayas, and barred to commerce by the most rigorous edicts against the admission of foreigners, Tibet remained virtually unknown until the eighteenth century. During the last hundred years, a few daring explorers traversed the country, and in 1904, a mission from the Indian government fought its way to the mysterious city of Lhasa, to offset the dreaded influence of Russia with the court of Tibet, and to regulate trade with India. The Dalai Lama fled. He fled again a few years later, when a Chinese army entered the city, returning in 1912. Lamaism, the religion of Tibet, is a corrupt form of buddhism the dalai lama literally priest as great as the ocean who is the supreme pontiff is also the nominal ruler on the death of the dalai lama his soul is supposed to pass into the body of a newborn infant who thereby becomes his successor what child it is who thus automatically succeeds to the honor is determined by lot through strange and complicated ceremonies it is probable however that the final choice is made by the ruler of china who is overlord of tibet during the minority of the dalai lama the authority is exercised by a regent it is said that so many of the dalai lamas die mysteriously just before coming of age that the country is nearly always ruled by a regent the palace of the dalai lama is an enormous fortified structure of nearly five hundred rooms it is made of stone and whitewashed the upper half of the central part is crimson as are also the eaves and the coping of the zigzag steps in this building majestic without but dark and filthy within live three hundred and fifty lamas connected with it are other buildings for printing prayers casting bronze images manufacturing incense and keeping cattle tradition says that this immense edifice was reared some twelve hundred years ago this photograph of a temple little known to western readers was taken by dr s chuan of tientsin china who accompanied the chinese ambassador to lhasa end of section one this recording is in the public domain section two of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by sonia Publisher's Note The scope of the world story is briefly suggested by its subtitle, A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. It is a series of selections from the best prose literature, the most inspiring poetry, and the most striking examples of historical painting made with a view to obtaining, from these three sources, a comprehensive and reasonably complete presentation of the world's history from the earliest recorded events to the present time it aims to utilize the writings of the best authors and the paintings of the greatest artists to present a series of pictures each interesting and instructive in itself and constituting as a whole an illuminating review of the most important events of the world's history art is relied upon to furnish its quota of material in precisely the same manner as literature one scene may be presented by means of the brush of a master painter while another may be the graphic word painting of some great author the selections are arranged in chronological order and under geographical divisions so that the reader may begin with the oldest known civilization that of the oriental countries and following the westward course of empire see in imagination the progress of civilization and something of the manners and customs of the people of all ages and of all parts of the world these selections represent the work of no less than six hundred representative authors and one hundred well-known artists by means of a series of historical notes 
and editorial introductions this vast assemblage of material is welded together into a homogeneous account of the world's history the selection and arrangement together with the editorial introductions and explanations are the work of eva march tappan well known as the author of many volumes of popular history and as the editor of the children's hour she has devoted more than three years to the search for suitable material and has brought together one thousand one hundred selections many of them from books ordinarily inaccessible to the general reader the final volume of the series is an outline of universal history outlining in brief the important events and giving the names of rulers and leaders with dates from the earliest time down to the date of publication in addition there are alphabetical indexes of titles and authors and a general index of all the famous characters and events mentioned in the selections pains have been taken to indicate in the table of contents the sources from which the selections have been made by this means a reference guide is provided to the world's best historical literature and the reader is enabled to extend his study in the portions of the field found most interesting the world's story offers to the general reader a new and agreeable way of reviewing the history of civilization the publishers believe that it will prove of special value to all who for any reason are unable to give the time to a comprehensive study of the vast literature of history but who will be glad to get from their historical reading the same delight that one expects to derive from the reading of novels and poems end of section two this recording is in the public domain section three of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by sonia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section three introduction did you ever stop to consider how the average person becomes acquainted with the history of his own land few people even among the most patriotic have ever read a full and complete work on the story of their country but yet in some mysterious way they have acquired a working knowledge of its annals something of this they gain in even the elementary schools of course but such knowledge of facts is quite a different matter from the feeling of friendly familiarity of being at home in the chronicles of our motherland that comes to most of us in greater or less degree this is our birthright we gain possession of it less by studying than simply by living among our own people we hear legends a blood-curdling narrative of an escape from the indian tomahawk the story of the diary of marie antoinette the tale of the hiding away of some priest or cavalier the tradition of bishop hatto and his tower we read here and there an anecdote of wellington or peter the great or hideyoshi we hear stories of the recent wars from the lips of veterans the relief of lucknow tells us something of the indian mutiny john brown's body of the american civil war the charge of the light brigade of the crimi byron's eve of waterloo of the fall of napoleon the idols of the king gives us a living king arthur the earl of rochester's epitaph on charles the second is an exceedingly good characterization of the merry monarch there are hohenlinden and the battle of the baltic indeed there is no end to the poems that bring the past before us in glowing colors the daily papers are full of phrases that originated in some historical event england expects every man to do his duty forty centuries are looking down upon you prairie schooners forty-niners the cat and mouse law the vicar of bray all these arose from some episode in history proper names too are wonderfully suggestive why is there a ponce de leon hotel in florida how did whitehall street and trafalgar square and west indies alexandria constantinople alhambra pittsburgh the theatre of pompey and the avenue de neuilly get their names there are monuments that are history condensed there is a lion at lucerne 
horses at st mark's there is a lofty shaft on bunker hill a statue of william penn on the top of the city hall of philadelphia there are monuments to wolfe and montcalm to brock frontenac and champlain to washington sir harry vane joan of arc alfred the great wellington richard the lion-hearted indeed we can hardly walk a mile in any city without reading in statue or column or name of street or square or building some chapter in local history our most familiar pictures are historical who does not know the princes in the tower charlotte corday the return of the mayflower queen victoria ascending the steps of the throne napoleon on the bellerophon the death of nelson alfred in the herdsman's cottage so it is in these and a hundred similar ways of which we take little account that the history of our homeland comes to us such knowledge is necessarily incomplete and somewhat fragmentary we do not know the exact latitude and longitude of the spot where the constitution encountered the guerriere perhaps we have even forgotten the year when the famous battle took place but we are reasonably sure to remember that the familiar name of the first mentioned vessel was old ironsides and that holmes wrote a poem with that title unconsciously we join our bits of information together and when we read even the barest outline of our country's history then no matter what our homeland may be we are sure to find these stories and pictures and songs these memories of statues and streets and monuments and names and phrases thronging into our minds and taking their proper places in its chronicles the brief and uninteresting annals throb with interest in proportion as we are able to put something of our own between the lines they become our story and by the aid of a gleam of imagination it is almost the record of our own experiences this is the natural method of learning history it is the way in which we become acquainted with our friends it is the way in which we form for ourselves the image of any person or place that we have not seen if we would form a mental likeness of queen elizabeth for instance we must bring together her genuine devotion to england her ability to choose great ministers her vanity temper love of magnificence and gorgeousness her neglected girlhood her delight in flattery her deceitfulness and her political sagacity these traits and many others come to our minds one by one and with the coming of each we gain a new idea of her character and finally form a mental image of a woman of such traits and such peculiarities but we have only one mother country only one life in which to grow up into the knowledge and history of a land to learn as children her monuments and streets and her memorial phrases to gaze upon her relics to hear from the lips of her people the tales of events within their own recollection our knowledge of other lands must come chiefly through books macaulay says the effect of historical reading is analogous in many respects to that produced by foreign travel the student like the tourist is transported into a new state of society he sees new fashions he hears new modes of expression his mind is enlarged by contemplating the wide diversities of laws of morals and of manners by diligent study one may of course learn the history of a country but is it possible to acquire in some degree the feeling of easy familiarity with the story of a foreign land which we have with that of our own and what means shall we employ in the attempt first of all we may make use of the great historical paintings of the world each one flashing a light upon some chapter of the past in jerome's police verso for instance the scene is in the Colosseum, where the victor stands with sword in hand and foot upon the breast of his conquered adversary the galleries are gorgeous with carvings tapestry brilliant costumes beautiful women and gallant men some of the spectators are a little bored by the familiarity of the entertainment some care for nothing but the display of their own charms the centre of interest is that portion of the gallery which is occupied by the vestal virgins women whose office of honour and sanctity is the care of the worship of vesta the goddess of the burning hearth of the love the quiet the purity of the ideal home they are robed in significant white 
the richest of tapestries hang over the rail before them the wishes of these virgins are so respected that upon their will really depends the life or death of the man who lies under the mailed heel of the victor the conqueror stands gazing upward for their decision the crowds beyond the royal seats peer around to see what it shall be and the venerated women stretch out their beautifully moulded arms and with thumbs pointing downward pollice verso demand the slaughter of the man whose upraised hand pleads for mercy this is an impressive picture of a thrilling moment it is also a chapter in history here we read the bravery and fearlessness of the romans their inherited respect for the servants of the gods their self-restraint and obedience to the law even in the excitement of a moral struggle and their attainments in the arts and in appreciation of luxury and magnificence but there is another side to the picture here is also the roman cruelty the roman obliviousness to the sufferings of others there are smiles and jesting there is curiosity to learn the wishes of the virgins but there is nowhere a gleam of pity for the man who lies writhing in agony here are indicated long periods of history the history of a warlike unfeeling conquering race obedient to law and of great wealth and material progress one may even glance onward from the moment of the picture and prophesy that a nation whose fetish is law rather than justice and mercy cannot long rule the world companion to this is the last token by gabriel max here is again a bit of the arena but now a young girl a christian martyr is the roman victim she stands among savage leopards and hyenas ready to spring upon her she knows her fate and asks no mercy but far up in the seats above some loving friend has dropped at her feet a rose the last token and with one hand on the wall to balance her swaying steps she forgets for the instant the death that lies before her and gazes upward to the face of the friend whose love will help her to meet the horrors of the next moment here too is history and also prophecy a new element has entered into roman life spiritual courage rather than physical is winning admiration the leaven of sympathy for pain and suffering is working in the pitiless roman character this too is not only a vivid painting but a chapter of history there is a vast amount of history in songs and poems he who writes the songs of a nation rules the nation is an old saying but is it not nearer the truth to say that the song is the heart of the people their wishes and their resolutions the thoughts of the many put into the words of the one such songs as the watch on the rhine the marseillaise god save the king my country tis of thee man of harler hale's marching song of stark's men burns bruce at bannockburn browning's song of the cavaliers do not portray events but they do arouse the spirit which brought them into being and thus by a most delicate but most irresistible method they teach history by bringing us into the spirit of the circumstances which inspired their writers the more descriptive poems such as chevy chase macaulay's battle of naseby scott's bonnie dundee the star-spangled banner drayton's agincourt byron's destruction of sennacherib macaulay's horatius at the bridge may not indeed have the minute and mechanical accuracy of a photograph but they vivify the action they so arouse the imagination that we almost feel ourselves a part of the event this too is history and it is in reality far nearer original sources than some of the contemporary and uninspired accounts accurate in every detail though they be which form the body to perfection but forget to add the spirit historical paintings and poems however are limited in number not every episode in the history of a country appeals to the painter neither does it to the poet but the storyteller is ever at hand if a tale is worth narrating there is always someone eager to tell it usually there are many and we may choose among numerous versions the well-written historical story whether it stands alone or whether it comes from the heart of some ponderous publication of many volumes takes time to linger to describe to picture 
to trace the details that make for vividness that give a conviction of truth it is to narrative then that we must turn for our most unfailing help in trying to win familiarity with the chronicles of other countries we must search not only for thrilling tales of battles and conspicuous deeds of heroism but for the simple annals of the masses of the people moreover what were looked upon at the time of their occurrence as important events are not invariably those which time has proved to be of the utmost significance in the middle of the fifteenth century the coronation of frederick the third at rome would have seemed of far more significance than the fact that an unknown workman should be experimenting in an obscure little shop on an invention which must have struck the copyists of the monastery book-rooms as trivial and unnecessary nevertheless the occupation of the copyist is long since vanished and no one remembers much about frederick the third but gutenberg's printing has revolutionized the world but the history of a country is by no means made up of events even such important ones as the invention of printing what people thought of the occurrences of their own day is always interesting and does much to bring us into the spirit of the times in which they lived stray sentences from letters are pictures and chapters of history together after cabot returned to england from his discoveries in america the venetian ambassador wrote home honors are heaped upon cabot he is called grand admiral he is dressed in silk and the english run after him like madmen could anything make one feel more like a spectator than this one sentence with its slight disdain of the english enthusiasm and possibly a bit of patriotic jealousy of the fortunate country under whose auspices cabot had set sail there are two classes of historical narrations both of which may well find a place in conveying knowledge of the past they may either be made up of facts alone or they may cast about those facts that richness and glow of the imagination which make yesterday seem like today the first class of stories may indeed hardly differ from an account or description save that they as far as possible tell the tale of some distinct episode and have a definite beginning middle and end both must be interesting vivid and correct both must be true to the known facts but the second has the opportunity to picture not only a special event but also the human feelings circling around that event and therefore may be true in a wider sense than the first for instance the heroine of cur vadis the beautiful ligia never existed neither did her gigantic protector the powerful ursus but both are drawn in accordance with what such persons were likely to be in those times their pathetic experiences and thrilling adventures are such things as did occur therefore this portrayal is as true as a list of dates but it is broadly humanly true it is history but it is history made vivid by the author's dramatic presentation and skilful drawing of character even in folklore and fable there is truth in plenty and no history can safely overlook them and the facts that they suggest emerson says the beautiful fables of the greeks are universal verities the fairy tales of the little brown gnomes of england for instance who hid themselves in holes by day and who were in constant dread of the touch of iron may well suggest the men of the stone age and their fear of those who had learned to work in metals the truth of this sort of story rests less upon what it tells than upon what it indicates for instance it is quite possible that king arthur never had a round table perhaps there never was any king arthur but the tales of his prowess and that of his knights indicate faithfully the stubborn resistance of the britons to the conquering saxons in like manner it may well be that there never was any living tangible robin hood but the legends of his seizing from the rich and bestowing upon the poor typify the restlessness of his supposed times and the vague feeling of the masses of the people that he who possessed a shilling was necessarily the oppressor of him who possessed none the impossible exploits of the cid are not in themselves facts but they make vivid in most picturesque fashion the sort of man who was a hero to the spaniards of the eleventh century history takes all knowledge to be its province the physical geography of a country is an important part of its story 
that of greece for example was such as to shut in by ranges of mountains little groups of people each in its separate valley and forbid the ease of intercourse that would have made for a lasting union among them in latium on the other hand the clustering together of some hills of moderate height made possible the powerful roman state the manners and customs of a people are a part of its history and so are their pleasures even the sports and games of their children the homes of the people their physical skill which manages a kayak or their intellectual ability which controls an ocean liner their inventions and discoveries their ideals of greatness all these are parts of the history of a nation it is with such thoughts in mind that these volumes of the world's story have been compiled he who reads them may wander from country to country purely for amusement as a luxurious traveller might do he may make a study of his reading and compare the customs the heroes the achievements and the ideals of the various lands or he may if he will take these for a starting point and strike out roads of his own through the spacious realms of the story of the world which to him who will but read it aright is forever old and yet forever new eva march tappan end of section three this recording is in the public domain section four of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by sonia china part one in the earliest days historical note according to chinese mythology there was once a mighty egg wherein there dwelt a living being known as poon kuong suddenly this egg broke into two parts the upper became the heavens and the lower the earth poon kuong stretched forth his right hand and behold the sun was created he stretched forth his left and the moon and the stars were made at the feet of poon kuong lay a piece of gold and a piece of wood he breathed upon them and straightway two clouds arose in the vapour from the gold stood man and in that from the wood stood woman and from these two have come all the people of all the world tradition says that nearly three thousand years before the birth of christ a tribe of wanderers made their way from the west to what is now the province of shansi and began to cultivate the ground one ruler followed another and each taught his people something of value one showed them how to make huts by weaving together the boughs of trees another rubbed two sticks together and produced fire a third chanced to build a fire on the dark brown soil and when the flames had died away there lay bits of metal among the ashes and these were iron later another ruler invented the plough and the wife of yet another unwound the thread of the silkworm spun it and wove it into a web of silk far more startling than these exploits was the feat of one chin nung who is declared to have discovered in one day seventy species of poisonous plants and also an antidote for every one of them behind these stories we can see the wandering tribes of herdsmen slowly developing into tillers of the soil and forming a compact nation as the centuries pass their history grows clearer until in the twelfth century b c china at length emerges from the twilight land of legend as a civilized nation with a feudal government very similar to that of japan end of section four this recording is in the public domain section five of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 5 Shun of You Who Control the Floods by Confucius. The most famous man that ever lived in China was the philosopher Confucius. He studied the ancient records picked out everything that he thought was worth saving and put his information together in the shu king or history book 
his story begins in two thousand three hundred fifty six b c when yao the model emperor was on the throne the editor the emperor said who will search out for me a man according to the times whom i may raise and employ fang tse said there is your heir son chu who is highly intelligent the emperor said alas he is insincere and quarrelsome can he do the emperor said who will search out for me a man equal to the exigency of my affairs Wan tao said oh there is the minister of works whose merits have just been displayed in various ways the emperor said alas when unemployed he can talk but when employed his actions turn out differently he is respectful only in appearance see the floods assail the heavens the emperor said o chief of the four mountains destructive in their overflow are the waters of the inundation in their vast extent they embrace the mountains and overtop the hills threatening the heavens with their floods so that the inferior people groan and murmur is there a capable man to whom i can assign the correction of this calamity all in the court said oh there is kwan the emperor said alas no by no means he is disobedient to orders and tries to injure his peers his eminence said well but try him and then you can have done with him the emperor said to kwan go and be reverend for nine years he labored but the work was unaccomplished the emperor said o oh, you chief of the four mountains i have been on the throne for seventy years you can carry out my appointments i will resign my throne to you his eminence said i have not the virtue i should only disgrace the imperial seat the emperor said point out some one among the illustrious or set forth one from among the poor and mean all in court said to the emperor there is an unmarried man among the lower people called shun of you the emperor said yes i have heard of him what is his character his eminence said he is the son of a blind man his father was obstinately unprincipled his stepmother was insincere his half-brother shang was arrogant he has been able however by his filial piety to live in harmony with them and to lead them gradually to self-government so that they no longer proceed to great wickedness the emperor said i will try him i will wife him and then see his behavior with my two daughters on this he gave orders and sent down his two daughters to the north of the quay to be wives in the family of you the emperor said to them be reverent you appears before the emperor to make his report the emperor said come you you also must have admirable words to bring before me you did obeisance and said oh what can i say after kao yao o emperor i can only think of maintaining a daily assiduity kao yao said alas will you describe it you said the inundating waters seem to assail the heavens and in their vast extent embraced the mountains and overtopped the hills so that people were bewildered and overwhelmed i mounted my four conveyances and all along the hills hewed down the woods at the same time showing the multitudes how to get flesh to eat i also opened passages for the streams throughout the nine provinces and conducted them to the sea i deepened moreover the channels and canals and conducted them to the streams at the same time along with tse sowing grain and showing the multitudes how to procure the food of toil in addition to flesh meat i urged them further to exchange what they had for what they had not and to dispose of their accumulated stores in this way all the people got grain to eat and all the states began to come under good rule kao yao said yes we ought to model ourselves after your excellent words 
a story has been handed down that in memory of Hugh's feat of engineering a record was cut on a rock high up on one of the mountains of sacrifice whether this is true or not no one can say but some of the chinese historians have the utmost confidence in the tradition the venerable emperor said o oh, aid and counsellor who will help me in administering my affairs the great and little islands that is the inhabited places even to their summits the abodes of the beasts and birds and all beings are widely inundated advise send back the waters and raise the dikes for a long time i have quite forgotten my family i repose on the top of the mountain yolu by prudence and my labours i have moved the spirits i know not the hours but repose myself only in my incessant labours the mountains hua yo tai and hung have been the beginning and end of my enterprise when my labours were completed i offered a thanksgiving sacrifice at the solstice my affliction has ceased the confusion in nature has disappeared the deep currents coming from the south flow into the sea clothes can now be made food can be prepared all kingdoms will be at peace and we can give ourselves to continual joy for many years you continued to show himself wise and sagacious and devoted to the welfare of the kingdom one day the emperor sent for him and the following conversation took place the emperor said you i have occupied the imperial throne for thirty and three years i am between ninety and a hundred years old and the laborious duties weary me do you eschewing all indolence take the leadership of my people you said my virtue is not equal to the position the people will not repose in me but there is kao yao with vigorous activity sowing abroad his virtue which has descended on the black-haired people till they cherish him in their hearts o oh, emperor think of him when i think of him my mind rests on him as the man for this office when i would put him out of my thoughts they still rest on him when i name and speak of him my mind rests on him for this the sincere outgoing of my thoughts about him is that he is the man o oh, emperor think of his merits the emperor said kao yao that of these my ministers and people hardly one is found to offend against the regulations of my government is owing to your being the minister of crime and intelligent in the use of the five punishments to assist the inculcation of the five duties with a view to the perfection of my government and that through punishment there may come to be no punishments but the people accord with the path of the mean continue to be strenuous kao yao said your virtue o emperor is faultless you condescend to your ministers with a liberal ease you preside over the multitude with a generous forbearance punishments do not extend to the criminal's heirs while rewards reach to after generations you pardon inadvertent faults however great and punish purposed crimes however small in cases of doubtful crimes you deal with them lightly in cases of doubtful merit you prefer the high estimation rather than put to death an innocent person you will run the risk of irregularity and error this life-loving virtue has penetrated the minds of the people and this is why they do not render themselves liable to be punished by your officers the emperor said to enable me to follow after and obtain what i desire in my government the people everywhere responding as if moved by the wind this is your excellence the emperor said come you the inundating waters filled me with dread when you realized all that you represented and accomplished your task thus showing your superiority to other men without any prideful presumption there is not one in the empire to contest with you the palm of ability without any boasting there is not one in the empire to contest with you the claim of merit i see how great is your virtue how admirable your vast achievements the determinate appointment of heaven rests on your person you must eventually ascend the throne of the great sovereign 
the mind of man is restless prone to err its affinity for the right way is small be discriminating be undivided that you may sincerely hold fast the mean do not listen to unsubstantiated words do not follow undeliberated plans of all who are to be loved is not the sovereign the chief of all who are to be feared are not the people chief if the multitude were without the sovereign whom should they sustain aloft if the sovereign had not the multitude there would be none to guard the country for him be reverent carefully demean yourself on the throne which you will occupy respectfully cultivating the virtues which are to be desired in you if within the four seas there be distress and poverty your heaven conferred revenues will come to a perpetual end it is the mouth which sends forth what is good and gives rise to war my words i will not repeat you said submit the meritorious ministers one by one to the trial of divination and let the fortunate indication be followed the emperor said you the officer of divination when the mind has been made up on a subject then refers it to the great tortoise now in this matter my mind was determined in the first place i consulted and deliberated with all my ministers and people and they were of one accord with me the spirits signified their assent the tortoise and grass having both concurred divination when fortunate may not be repeated you did obeisance with his head to the ground and firmly declined the throne the emperor said do not do so it is you who can suitably occupy my place on the first morning of the first month you received the appointment in the temple of the spiritual ancestor and took the leading of all the officers as had been done at the commencement of the emperor's government End of section 5. This recording is in the public domain. Section 6 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. China, Part 2, Confucius and His Age historical note the period of the chow dynasty eleven twenty two to two fifty five b c is the golden age of china it is marked by the development of literature and art and by the teachings of the philosophers the first of the great sages was lao tse founder of the taoist religion with his watchword of tao reason his fame is obscured however by that of his disciple confucius whose writings have probably had greater influence than those of any other human being mencius the last of the classic philosophers was later than confucius by about one hundred years end of section six this recording is in the public domain section seven of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section seven the story of confucius by rev a w loomis five forty nine to four seventy six b c confucius as a sage and religious teacher is regarded by his countrymen as the greatest man china has produced he was unquestionably an extraordinary man remarkable in the influence he exercised over his countrymen when alive and the still greater influence he has ever since exercised by his writings 
confucius was born about five hundred and forty nine years before christ in the kingdom of lu a portion of northeastern china nearly corresponding with the modern province of shantung at that time china was divided into nine independent states and it was not till three centuries later that it was united into one kingdom from his earliest years confucius was distinguished by an eager pursuit of knowledge from his father who was prime minister of the state in which he lived he inherited a taste for political studies but being left an orphan when still but a child he was educated for the most part in retirement by his mother ching and his grandfather koum tsi the anecdotes which are related of his boyhood tend to show that he was distinguished by those qualities most highly esteemed by his countrymen and afterwards most strictly enforced by himself a profound reverence for his parents and ancestors and for the teaching of the ancient sages Kuamtsi, his grandfather says one of his biographers was one day sitting absorbed in a melancholy reverie in the course of which he fetched several deep sighs the child observing him after some time approached and with many bows and formal reverences spoke thus if i may presume without violating the respect i owe you sir to inquire into the cause of your grief i would gladly do so perhaps you fear that i who am descended from you may reflect discredit on your memory by failing to imitate your virtues his grandfather surprised asked him where he had learned to speak so wisely from yourself sir he replied i listen attentively to your words and i have often heard you say that a son who does not imitate the virtues of his ancestors deserves not to bear their name the position which his father had held in the state seems to have inspired confucius at an early age with a desire to distinguish himself in moral and political studies and prompted him to investigate the early history of his country he laboured zealously to fit himself for filling offices of high political trust and in his endeavours to master the learning of the early sages he was ably assisted by his grandfather he married at nineteen years of age and is said to have divorced his wife a few years afterwards when she had given birth to a son that he might devote himself without interruption to study but owing to the general contempt of women in the east the subject is only slightly alluded to by his biographers he entered upon political employment at twenty years of age as superintendent of cattle an office probably established that the revenue might not be defrauded and necessary where much of it was paid in kind in this situation his reverence for antiquity and the ancients did not prevent confucius from attempting reforms and checking long-established abuses under his administration men who were dishonest were dismissed and a general inquiry was set on foot with a view to the reformation of all that was unworthy or pernicious the activity of confucius brought him into favour with his sovereign and he was promoted to the distribution of the grain an office of which it is not easy to discover the nature whatever were his duties however the energy that confucius displayed was extremely distasteful to his colleagues he was now in the vigorous manhood of thirty-five and the eyes of the nation were turned to him as their future prime minister when a revolution occurred in the state which drove him from power deprived of his office he wandered for eight years through the various provinces of china teaching as he went but without as yet making any great impression upon the mass of the people he returned to Lu in his forty-third year his enemies during those eight years had gradually lost their authority and he was again employed in political offices of trust and responsibility immorality prevailed at this time to a frightful extent confucius set himself up fearlessly as a teacher of virtue 
his admonitions were not thrown away and having gained the approbation of the king a few years after his return from exile he was appointed prime minister with almost absolute authority the enemies of order and virtue excited troubles on his elevation but confucius sternly repressed the symptoms of dissatisfaction and though of compassionate disposition he did not hesitate to resort to capital punishment when necessary to rid himself of his enemies reformation made rapid strides in the territories of lu the nobles became more just and equitable the poor were not oppressed as before roads bridges and canals were formed the food of the people says his biographer was the first care it was not until that had been secured in abundance that the revenues of the state were directed to the advancement of commerce the improvement of the bridges and highways the impartial administration of justice and the repression of the bands of robbers that infested the mountains for four years he steadily persevered in his endeavours until lu began to be regarded as a model state by the surrounding kingdoms at length however a strong party rose against the sage and at the age of fifty-seven he was driven once more from his native state to wander as a teacher through the different provinces of china on leaving lu confucius first bent his steps westward to the state of wai situate about where the present provinces of chi lei and honan adjoin he was now in his fifty-eighth year and felt depressed and melancholy as he went along he gave expression to his feelings in verse fain would i still look towards lu but this kwai hill cuts off my view with an axe i'd hew these thickets through vain thought against the hill i naught can do and again through the valley howls the blast drizzling rain falls thick and fast homeward goes the youthful bride o'er the wild crowds by her side how is it o oh, azure heaven from my home i thus am driven through the land my way to trace with no certain dwelling-place dark dark the minds of men worth in vain comes to their ken hasten on my term of years old age desolate disappears it was only by concealment and disguise that the life of the exiled prime minister was preserved for twelve years he wandered from province to province at first harassed persecuted hunted but after a while allowed to travel unmolested a faithful little band of disciples collected around him in his wanderings and their numbers as time advanced might soon be counted by thousands seventy-two of these we are told were particularly attached to him but only ten of them were truly wise with these ten he finally retired at the age of sixty-nine to a peaceful valley in his native province where in the midst of his disciples he passed a happy literary period of five years in collating and annotating the works of the ancients these sacred books have been for twenty-three centuries the fountains of wisdom and goodness to all the educated of china they are the works in which every student must be a proficient ere he can hope to advance in the political arena and for twenty-three centuries have had an incalculable influence on a third of the human race his life was peacefully concluded in the midst of his friends at the age of seventy-three in the valley to which he had retired five years previously a few days before his death he tottered about the house singing out tai shan kai tui hu liang mu ki kwai hu chi jin ki wai hu the great mountain is broken the strong beam is thrown down the wise man has decayed he died soon after leaving a single descendant his grandson tsitsi 
through whom the succession has been transmitted to the present day during his life the return of the jews from babylon the invasion of greece by xerxes and the conquest of egypt by the persians took place posthumous honours in great variety amounting to idolatrous worship have been conferred upon him his title is the most holy ancient teacher Kungzi, and the holy duke in the reign of Kangji, two thousand one hundred and fifty years after his death there were eleven thousand males alive bearing his name and most of them of the seventy-fourth generation being undoubtedly one of the oldest families in the world in the sacrificial ritual a short account of his life is given which closes with the following paean confucius confucius how great is confucius before confucius there never was a confucius since confucius there never has been a confucius 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 how great is confucius the peaceful valley in which he died has been for all succeeding ages a sacred spot a spot of pilgrimage for the learned and the superstitious and the chinese of eighteen sixty seven amid conflicting buddhism taoism and roman catholicism still point with reverence to the tomb of their great sage in the province of shantung End of section seven this recording is in the public domain section eight of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section eight a visit to a temple of confucius by rev a w loomis we now pushed on to kiu fu hien the city of confucius which we reached about two thirty p m this city is peopled chiefly by the descendants of the great sage eight families out of ten bearing his surname it has two south gates the one on the west side being unused and opened only on the visit of an emperor this gate is in front of the temple of confucius and leads directly to it the temple occupied a large portion of the western part of the city the chief part of it standing on the place where confucius lived its arrangement resembles that usually adopted in buildings of a similar class in china but on a grander and more superb scale take it all in all i have seen nothing like it in other parts of china the enclosure is oblong the building is thirteen halls deep one square is shut off from another by grand gates there are also two bridges crossed by a grand avenue leading from the magnificent south gate through the inner gates and on to the main temple the squares are full of tall old cypress trees and the sides of the avenue are crowded with tablets in honour of the sage every dynasty is here represented and many of the tablets were thus extremely important early in the morning we set out to view this place a small fee soon opened the door and we found the keeper obliging the temple is divided in two parts by a thoroughfare for the convenience of the citizens to avoid a long circuit the chief objects of interest lying on the north side to this we went and from the first moment we stepped in to the last my whole mind was engaged by objects of interest here on the left hand was a cypress said to have been planted by confucius himself and its gnarled and aged trunk bore evidence of its great age here we were shown the place where he taught his disciples now a huge pavilion opened to the south in it was fixed in his praise a poem composed by kien lung engraved on a marble tablet 
now appeared the grand temple a high building for china and a most spacious one it was two-storied the upper veranda on gorgeous marble pillars these pillars were at least twenty-two feet high and about ten feet in diameter around them carved in the solid stone twined two large dragons the marble itself was richly veined the tiles of the roof were of yellow porcelain as in peking and the ornamentation of the eaves was all covered with wire-work to preserve it from the birds within this building was the image or statue of confucius like that of mencius only in far richer style he sat in a gorgeously curtained shrine holding a roll in his hand or rather a slip of bamboo as it was this material that was used for writing in his days the sitting statue was about eighteen feet by six feet the image was well done and lifelike he is represented as a strong well-built man with a full red face and large head a little heavy he sits in the attitude of contemplation his eyes looking upwards he has a much more serious thoughtful aspect than mencius but not that straightforward dogged air which the latter bore his front teeth were exposed his nose thick and round on the tablet was the simple inscription the most holy prescient sage confucius his spirit's resting place on the east were images of his favourite disciples ranged in order in the estimation in which he was said to have held them that of mencius occupied the west side of the building the roof was crowded with tablets in honour of the sage vying with one another in extravagant praise before his image and also in front of these were beautiful incense pots amongst them several most interesting relics here was a clay dish said to be of yao's time also two bronze censers one with a lid bearing the date of the shang dynasty the work on which was superb two bronze elephants dating from the chow dynasty stood by and a large table of the same age made of beautiful hard dark redwood these things spoke volumes for the state of the nation in those far back ages the moulding and carving were most exquisite behind this hall stands a temple in honour of the wife of confucius in it was a tablet but no image in the second temple yet farther back are four tablets erected by kang sai bearing each one of the characters which together mean the teacher of ten thousand ages here also were three engraved figures of the sage on marble one an old man full length rather dim having no date the second smaller with seal characters on the side the third and best giving only his head and shoulders these varied somewhat but were substantially alike all of them gave the mouth or lips open the front teeth exposed and the eyes full and contemplative immediately behind these were incised drawings on marble illustrating all the chief incidents in his life with appropriate explanations at the side there were altogether one hundred and twenty slabs which were built into the back wall the greater part of them were in good preservation and were extremely interesting the more so as they gave us an insight into the dress kind of furniture carriages and houses of those ancient times to the west of this are two temples that in front in honour of the father of the sage who is said to have governed yen chao fu and sao hien the other in honour of his mother they are plain temples and have no images only a tablet each on the east are also temples to his five ancestors here towards the east was a large block of marble on which was engraven a genealogical tree giving all the branches of his family here was also a well from which the sage drank i got the man to let down a bucket and tasted the water which was excellent though a little swedish on this side also was another building which he is said to have used as his school 
the southern division is less interesting than the northern it contains nothing but what i have already named tablets innumerable cypress trees gates walls and bridges there are three gardens four gates and two bridges the duke kung the present head of the family lives in a mansion adjoining the temple on the west End of section eight. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. Section nine of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke some of the proverbs of confucius it is said that after the death of confucius his disciples bewailed his absence until they had all lost their voices then they set to work to bring together what they could remember of his teachings the editor four horses cannot overtake the tongue injury should be recompensed with kindness a man should say i am not concerned that i have no place i am concerned how i may fit myself for one i am not concerned that i am not known i seek to be worthy to be known to be fond of learning is to be near to knowledge seek not every quality in one individual the master said you shall i teach you what knowledge is when you know a thing to hold that you know it and when you do not know a thing to allow that you do not know it this is knowledge what i do not wish men to do to me i also wish not to do to men to see what is right and not to do it is a want of courage the superior man is distressed by his want of ability he is not distressed by men's not knowing him the master said virtue is more to man than either water or fire i have seen men die from treading on water or fire but i have never seen a man die from treading the course of virtue the superior man thinks of virtue the small man thinks of comfort there were four things from which the master was entirely free he had no foregone conclusions no arbitrary predeterminations no obstinacy and no egotism End of section nine this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section ten of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section ten manners and customs of confucius's day by rev william spear the northern part of the country was still divided into the several small principalities which had been granted by the emperors at different times to their sons and brothers who constituted the only hereditary nobility of the state and were all tributary to the chief sovereign each of these petty states contained a city where the prince resided and all around it were numerous villages and detached dwellings inhabited by the peasantry who held small farms which they cultivated for their own advantage growing rice and vegetables in abundance so that every poor man could support his family by his own industry 
they were not held in bondage by the great like the peasantry of europe during the feudal ages and amongst other privileges which they enjoyed were these a ninth part of the land was in common amongst them for pasturage and farming and all the poor were at liberty to fish in the ponds and lakes a right which was denied to the lower orders in feudal countries where the mass of the people were vassals and slaves the peasants of china therefore appear to have been at that period in a better condition than those of any other part of the world working for themselves and paying taxes to their respective princes who by that means raised the tribute which the emperor claimed of them at the time of confucius all taxes and tribute were paid as they are at present chiefly in kind usually as mencius who lived in the next generation says to the amount of about one-tenth of the produce of the earth it is however supposed there was always some sort of coined money current among the chinese and that at a very early period of the monarchy they had coins of gold and silver as well as of lead iron and copper but many ages have elapsed since any other than copper money has been in use among them silver is also used as a medium of exchange beaten out into small bars or pieces and upon these responsible traders generally put their stamp in a small character so that they become in time particularly ragged and broken yet even in these bits adroit rogues make holes which they fill with lead in buying and selling men always scrutinize them carefully and weigh them being always provided with a small pair of scales for that purpose they reckon their accounts by means of an instrument called in the canton dialect the sampan which resembles the roman abacus it consists of a frame across which are fastened thin rods of bamboo but instead of ten balls as with us the chinese use seven a cross-bar divides the frame so that the rods have on one side five balls each on the other side two each the two balls on each rod count however five apiece this makes the process of counting more rapid and certain commencing at any convenient rod or row it counts as units the second as tens the third as hundreds the fourth as thousands and so on to count five either the five balls on the lower side of the unit's row are pushed up or to the middle with the finger or one of the two balls on the other side of it ten is made by the two five balls or by one of them and five of the other balls and thus we go on in each row successively for tens hundreds or thousands for any number between five and ten a five ball is pushed to the middle and the remainder in single balls from the other end of the same row an expert accountant pushes the balls with his fingers as rapidly in adding or subtracting as a player strikes the keys upon a piano it is rarely a mistake is made and when done it is never to the disadvantage of the accountant the invention of the sun pun is attributed to the emperor wang ti the same who is said to have found his way through the forests by means of the compass their arithmetic as well as their weights and measures proceeds universally on the decimal scale and decimal fractions are their vulgar fractions or those in common use it is remarkable that the single exception to this consists in their kin or marketing pound weight which like ours is divided into sixteen ounces or parts this affords another illustration of the common origin of the chinese and our own arithmetic and weights and measures in central asia the roman catholic missionaries relate that when the first of them went to china from europe they found persian astronomers at the chinese court who yielded the field to their superior scientific knowledge there are still many things in the chinese ideas of astronomy which remind us of those of the ancient chaldeans
there were public markets in the towns to which the people generally resorted about noon and there were shops also where the artisans pursued their various callings and sold or exchanged with the farmers the produce of their labours for rice and other commodities of which they stood in need beyond the cultivated lands were pastures for sheep and the rest of the country generally consisted of extensive forests inhabited by tigers and other beasts of prey which were so destructive especially among the flocks that great hunting parties were made every spring for the purpose of destroying them and this dangerous sport seems to have been the favourite amusement of the sovereigns and great men of the land for a long series of years trade even with foreign nations appears to have been remarkably free the markets of china were the resorts of foreign merchants before the romans invaded britain and her ports were annually visited by great squadrons of commercial vessels from the red sea the persian gulf ceylon the malabar coast and the coast of coromandel the principal weapons used both in war and hunting were bows and arrows consequently the practice of archery was a constant and favourite sport of the great and there were particular rules by which it was conducted as for example the imperial target was the skin of a bear while that of a stag was set up as a mark for a prince to aim at and that of a tiger for the grandees of the court yet the chinese have not often during their long history attempted to enter the lists of the world as a martial nation holding literature as they have done husbandry in far higher estimation than military achievements regarding the man who distinguished himself by his literary attainments beyond him who gained renown by his warlike exploits and the husbandman who laboured in the field as a better member of society than the soldier who fought in it yet the petty princes were frequently at war with each other so that the whole of the empire was seldom quite at peace the education of youth was considered of so much importance that every district was obliged by law to maintain a public school where boys were sent at eight years of age to be instructed in reading writing arithmetic and in their several duties to parents teachers elders and magistrates as well as to their equals and inferiors they were also taught to commit to memory a great number of wise maxims and moral sentences contained in the writings of the ancient sages and many of their lessons were in verse that they might be the more readily learned and remembered a new school was always opened with much ceremony in the presence of the chief magistrate who delivered a discourse to the boys exhorting them to be diligent and submissive to the master and setting forth the advantages of learning which has been in every age the only road to wealth and honours in china at fifteen those who had most distinguished themselves were sent to higher schools where public lectures were given by learned professors on the laws and government of the empire and such subjects as were best calculated to fit them for offices of state to which those who attended these schools usually aspired but which were never bestowed on any but such as had studied profoundly and given proofs of their knowledge subordination submission to the laws to parents and to all superiors and a peaceful demeanour were strictly inculcated this instruction has continued unchanged the chinese says a modern writer teach contempt of the rude instead of fighting with them and the man who unreasonably insults another has public opinion against him whilst he who bears and despises the affront is esteemed a chinese would stand and reason with a man when an englishman would knock him down or an italian stab him it is needless to say which is the more rational mode of proceeding among the arts that are held in high estimation among the chinese is that of writing which was known at so distant a period of their history that it must have been one of their earliest steps in civilization this 
art as practised in china is rather difficult of attainment on account of the number and not very simple formation of the characters yet it was rare to meet even with a poor peasant who could not read and write for rich and poor were all educated alike in the manner just described which is mentioned as the ancient system in books that were written more than two thousand years ago the autographs of distinguished men are highly prized the females of china from the empress to the wife of the meanest peasant practised the spinning and weaving of silk which material from the earliest times known was used for clothing by the poor as well as the rich for the same reason that wool was used by the ancient english because it was the material of which they had the greatest abundance when the king of france says barrow introduced the luxury of silk stockings the peasantry of the middle provinces of china were clothed in silks from head to foot and when the nobility of england were sleeping on straw a peasant of china had his mat and his pillow and the man in office enjoyed his silken mattress the empresses in those days were as zealous in promoting the branches of industry adapted for females by their own example as were the emperors in encouraging agriculture by similar means a plantation of mulberry trees was formed within the gardens of the palace and a house built purposely for rearing the silkworms which were tended by the ladies of the court and often fed by the fair hands of royalty every autumn a festival was held to commemorate the invention of silk weaving when the empress attended by the princesses and ladies of her train made sacrifices in the temple of the earth and then proceeded to her mulberry grove where she gathered leaves and wound the cocoons of silk which were afterwards spun and woven by her own hands into small webs these were carefully preserved for the grand spring festival when they were burned in sacrifice great attention was bestowed on the management of silkworms throughout the whole of the empire and as it had been discovered that those which were fed on mulberry leaves produced a finer kind of silk than the common worms of the forest a law was made by one of the early emperors that every man possessing an estate of not less than five acres should plant the boundary with mulberry trees the difference between the garments of the higher and lower orders consisted in the quality and colours of the silks of which they were composed and the fashion in which they were made the robes of the grandees were often richly embroidered with gold and silver and ornamented with various devices according to their rank and occupation the dress of a literary man was ornamented with a bird worked on a square of black silk on the breast or with the figure of a tiger or some other animal or design and these are among the innumerable customs which have been continued from that time to the present the wars among the princes and the efforts of some of them to render themselves independent of the emperor led to a vast deal of disorderly conduct in the several states each petty sovereign being more intent upon his own aggrandizement than on keeping good order among his people who finding that the affairs of government were neglected and the law seldom enforced paid very little attention to them such was the state of the chinese empire when the celebrated philosopher confucius was born in the kingdom of lu one of the small sovereignties in the north of china this event occurred when the ancient greek republics were in all their glory and rome was just beginning to rise into power and greatness the greeks and romans however knew little or nothing of china at that time nor did the chinese imagine there was any truly great empire in the world besides their own an opinion they have maintained even until our own days but on the other hand it is manifest from the remains of great populous and magnificently built cities which stretch in a 
chain from the mediterranean sea to the countries now embraced by the chinese empire from the historic legends and philology of the nations existing there and from hints in the inspired history which the holy men of palestine have given us that there was kept up an intercourse by caravans across the continent and also by sea between the western and eastern sides of the continent the silk the cassia the camphor the broidered work the ivory the porcelain of china were known through the ages of the old jewish dispensation to the people of india central asia and phoenicia and her neighbours the vessels of solomon hiram king of tyre sailed two monsoons eastward and two monsoons back a period of three years which connected them at the indian archipelago with the commerce which in like manner from the beginning of history has vibrated with the semi-annual monsoon up and down the china sea end of section ten this recording is in the public domain Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. Section 11 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. Mencius by S. Wells Williams. Mencius was born about 400 B.C. in the city of Tsao, now in the province of shantung his father died a short time after his son's birth and left the guardianship of the boy to his widow chang shi the care of this prudent and attentive mother to quote from re musa has been cited as a model for all virtuous parents the house she occupied was near that of a butcher she observed that at the first cry of the animals that were being slaughtered the little mang ran to be present at the sight and that on his return he sought to imitate what he had seen fearful that his heart might become hardened and be accustomed to the sight of blood she removed to another house which was in the neighbourhood of a cemetery the relations of those who were buried there came often to weep upon their graves and make the customary libations mencius soon took pleasure in their ceremonies and amused himself in imitating them this was a new subject of uneasiness to chang shi she feared her son might come to consider as a jest what is of all things the most serious and that he would acquire a habit of performing with levity and as a matter of routine merely ceremonies which demand the most exact attention and respect again therefore she anxiously changed her dwelling and went to live in the city opposite to a school where her son found examples the most worthy of imitation and soon began to profit by them i should not have spoken of this trifling anecdote but for the allusion which the chinese constantly make to it in the common proverb formerly the mother of mencius chose out a neighbourhood on another occasion her son seeing persons slaughtering pigs asked her why they did it to feed you she replied but reflecting that this was teaching her son to lightly regard the truth went and bought some pork and gave him mencius devoted himself early to the classics and became the disciple of tsetse the grandson and not unworthy imitator of confucius after his studies were completed he offered his services to the feudal princes of the country and was received by hui wang king of hui but though much respected by this ruler his instructions were not regarded he saw too ere long that among the numerous petty rulers and intriguing statesmen of the day there was no prospect of restoring tranquillity to the empire 
and that discourses upon the mild government and peaceful virtues of yao and shun king wan and ching tang offered little to interest persons whose minds were engrossed with schemes of conquest or pleasure he therefore at length returned to his own country and in concert with his disciples employed himself in composing the work which bears his name and in completing the editorial labours of his great predecessor he died about three sixteen b c aged eighty four years End of section eleven this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section twelve of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia a story of mencius by unknown a certain ruler said to him i am not at present able to do with the levying of a tithe only and abolishing the duties charged at the passes and in the markets with your leave i will lighten however both the tax and the duties until next year and will then make an end of them what do you think of such a course mencius said here is a man who every day appropriates some of his neighbour's strayed fowls some one said to him such is not the way of a good man and he replied with your leave i will diminish my appropriations and will take only one fowl a month until next year when i will make an end of the practice if you know that a thing is unrighteous then use all dispatch in putting an end to it why wait till next year end of section twelve this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section thirteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia proverbs of mencius beware what proceeds from you will return to you again he who loves others is constantly loved by them he that respects others is constantly respected by them respect the old and be kind to the young be not forgetful of strangers and travellers the path of duty lies in what is near and men seek for it in what is remote if each man would love his parents and show due respect to his elders the whole empire would enjoy tranquillity End of section thirteen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section fourteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia china part three times of change and confusion historical note by the sixth century b c luxury misrule and petty warfare had impoverished the nation but with the rise of the tsin dynasty in two fifty five b c its prosperity was restored huang ti greatest of the tsin monarchs abolished the feudal system extended the bounds of the empire drove back the tartars and built the great wall to prevent their further incursions it was from the sin dynasty that the country received its name sinna or china during the reign of the hans the next line of rulers 
buddhism was introduced libraries founded and a system of civil service instituted but in the second century a d the nation again fell into confusion and for four hundred years suffered the oppression of feeble and vicious rulers end of section fourteen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section fifteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section fifteen the strenuous reign of huang ti by rev charles gutzlaff in spite of all the good advice of confucius laotze and mencius the affairs of the kingdom did not go on very smoothly by and by people began to whisper that a change was surely coming centuries before this the ruler yu had set up some brazen vessels with the name of some one of the states on each it was reported that they had been seen to shake violently worse than this a mountain fell into the huang ho river turned the stream from its course and caused terrible floods the central government grew weaker the separate states stronger and finally the prince of the state of tsin became emperor in two forty six b c huang ti ascended the throne he was only thirteen years old but in one way or another he usually succeeded in having his own will the editor before wang ti had succeeded to the throne he had contracted an intimacy with the hereditary prince of yen called tan when he was seated upon the throne tan paid him a visit but was coldly received which made him return to his own country with disappointment on his return than yu k an imperial general having fallen into disgrace had fled to yen the emperor set a price upon his head but tan refused to violate the laws of hospitality though tan appeared very sincere in his regard toward fan yu ki he kept him at his court only with the view of revenging the insult he had received a crafty man called king ko was sent to fan yu ki in order to acquaint him with the dreadful fate his family had suffered by the tsin tyrant on his own account you he added will very soon fall a victim to the tyrant i advise you therefore to commit suicide i shall carry your head to the tyrant and whilst he is viewing it i shall bury this poniard in his breast thus you will revenge your family and the empire will be freed from slavery van yu ki listened with attention he was enchanted with the prospect and cut his throat king ko hastened with his head to huang ti prostrated himself and presented it in a box to the emperor whilst he was examining it king ko drew his poniard but the emperor perceived it in good time he started parried the blow of the assassin received the wound in his leg and thus saved his life king ko was in despair at having missed so good an opportunity of dispatching the monster and again darted his dagger at him which merely grazed the imperial robes after having upon examination found out that the prince of yen had hired the assassin he attacked yen drove the king out of his capital to li yu tung and not yet satisfied with having inflicted so heavy a punishment he satiated his revenge to surfeit by exterminating the whole family 
constantly directing his attention to gain the one great object universal dominion he defeated all the machinations of the minor princesses by a steady course of policy and they were all finally subdued huang ti who had before only borne the name of ching wang as soon as he saw himself the sole master of the whole empire adopted the title of emperor puffed up by his many victories he thought himself by no means inferior to any of the preceding worthies shin nung yao and shun he therefore adopted the epithet of che beginning first which he placed before the title of emperor the imperial colour was changed to black and a regular system of despotism introduced but he did not forget the improvement of his country astronomy during the many troubles of the states had fallen into disuse he re-established it and published a calendar anxious to obliterate all the memory of sanguinary conquest he ordered all the arms to be brought to his capital hin yang and obliged his numerous soldiers to settle themselves in this city where he endeavoured to surpass all his predecessors in luxury and magnificence the palace was tastefully laid out and enriched with the spoils of many kingdoms but the ease of the court could not soften the prince he visited all the provinces of the empire made his own observations and even penetrated to the great ocean with scarcely any train he traversed valleys and plains always intent upon his duty his vigorous mind was restless he could not brook the reproaches of the literati nor conform to their advice of introducing the old order of things he wished to be a founder not a restorer of an empire even in the prevalent superstition he dared to introduce innovations and to offer sacrifices according to his own fancy being almost drowned whilst crossing a river he inquired about the cause the spirit of a mountain which was pointed out to him received all the credit he therefore had the mountain laid bare of all its trees and herbs in order to revenge himself for the insult at another time he dispatched some young men and women in search of the islands of immortality which he was told were situated toward the east the adventurers were driven back from thence by a very heavy gale and returned without bringing with them the liquor of immortality but one of their number who had been driven in a different direction reported to the emperor that he had landed at the isles of immortality where he had found a manuscript which stated that the tsin empire was to end by hu wang ti lent a willing ear to this impostor and immediately resolved to attack the huang nu or huns for these he understood were the hu which would put an end to the reign of his family the huns this scourge of the civilized world dated their empire from one of the princes of the hei dynasty their country was of great extent situated on the west of shen shi of which they possess the western parts and their posterity still inhabit a part of that territory the present l they belong to that extrinsic tribe which the ancients comprised under the name of scythians the country they inhabited was so barren as to render agriculture little available to the maintenance of life their indolent pastoral habits had for them greater attractions than the constant toil of the chinese peasant hunting was their chief amusement and next to their herds their principal means of subsistence without the arts of civilized life they were cruel and bloodthirsty desirous of conquest and insatiable in rapine their victorious arms were only bounded by the eastern ocean the thinly inhabited territories along the banks of the amur acknowledged their sway they conquered countries near the Urdish and imaeus nothing could stop them but the ice-fields of the arctic 
arctic seas their principal strength was in their innumerable cavalry which appears to have been very skilful in the use of the bow their march was checked by neither mountains nor torrents they swam over the deepest rivers and surprised with rapid impetuosity the camps of their enemies against such hordes no military tactics no fortifications proved of any avail they carried all before them with irresistible power and never waited until a numerous army could be assembled to overwhelm them hardy to an extreme they could support fatigue and hunger and never lost view of the object of all their excursions plunder huang ti surprised and sought to extirpate these fierce barbarians and finding them unprepared the conquest was very easy his generals having subdued the people in the south nothing more remained to be done than to subdue these tartars or at least to put a stop to their inroads some of the northern states had eventually built a wall to keep those unbidden guests out of their territories huang ti resolved to erect a monument of his enterprising spirit which would be a lasting memorial of his greatness this was the building of the great wall which commences in the western part of shenshi and terminates in the mountains of li u tung in the sea a distance of more than fifteen hundred miles it runs over hills and rivers through valleys and plains and is perhaps the most stupendous work ever produced by human labour he lined it with fortresses erected towers and battlements and built it so broad that six horsemen might ride abreast upon it to lay the foundation in the sea several vessels loaded with ballast were sunk and upon this the wall was erected every third man in the kingdom was required to work on it the enormous work was finished within five years but the founder had not the satisfaction of seeing it completed during these immense pursuits the emperor was often interrupted in his work by the representations of the literati who desired to restore ancient customs and revert to the glorious times of yao and shun the emperor fond of innovations anxious to perpetuate his name by extraordinary works was highly dissatisfied with their observations let see his prime minister advised him therefore to put a stop to all similar remarks by burning the ancient books probably the emperor had made up his mind long before the matter came up in his council but the following is what let see is reported to have said your majesty has laid the foundations of imperial sway so that it will last for ten thousand generations this is indeed beyond what a stupid scholar can understand and moreover you only talks of things belonging to the three dynasties which are not fit to be models to you at other times when the princes were all striving together they endeavoured to gather the wandering scholars about them but now the empire is in a stable condition laws and ordinances issue from one supreme authority let those of the people who abide in their homes give their strength to the toils of husbandry and those who become scholars should study the various laws and prohibitions instead of doing this however the scholars do not learn what belongs to the present day but study antiquity they go on to condemn the present time leading the masses of the people astray and to disorder at the risk of my life i the prime minister say formerly when the empire was disunited and disturbed there was no one who could give unity to it the princes therefore stood up together constant references were made to antiquity to the injury of the present state baseless statements were dressed up to confound what was real and men made a boast of their own peculiar learning to condemn what the rulers appointed 
and now when your majesty has consolidated the empire and distinguishing black from white has made it a stable unity they still honour their peculiar learning and combine together they teach men what is contrary to your laws when they hear that an ordinance has been issued every one sets to discussing it with his learning in the court they are dissatisfied in heart out of it they keep talking in the streets while they make a pretence of vaunting their master they consider it fine to have extraordinary views of their own and so they lead on the people to be guilty of murmuring and evil speaking if these things are not prohibited your majesty's authority will decline and parties will be formed the best way is to prohibit them i pray that all the records in charge of the historiographers be burned excepting those of tsin that with the exception of those officers belonging to the board of great scholars all throughout the empire who presume to keep copies of the shi king or shu king or of the books of the hundred schools be required to go with them to the officers in charge of the several districts and burn them that all who may dare to speak together about the shi and the shu be put to death and their bodies exposed in the market-place that those who make mention of the past so as to blame the present be put to death along with their relatives that officers who shall know of the violation of those rules and not inform against the offenders be held equally guilty with them and that whoever shall not have burned their books within thirty days after the issuing of the ordinance be branded and sent to labour on the wall for four years the only books which shall be spared are those of medicine divination and husbandry whoever wants to learn the laws may go to the magistrates and learn of them the imperial decision was approved End of section fifteen this recording is in the public domain section sixteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section sixteen the rule of the hans by rev william spear two hundred and six b c to two hundred and twenty one a d in this burning of the books the special aim was to destroy the volumes known as the nine classics the first five are these the shu king or book of history the shi king or book of odes the spring and autumn annals the book of rites and the book of changes of these five the last was used in divination and therefore was not destroyed the other four classics were written by mencius and the other pupils and followers of confucius they are the great learning the doctrine of the mean the confucian analects and the works of mencius in the course of time huang ti died and kao ti a book lover sat upon the throne orders were given to search the land for copies of the books then the delighted scholars hastened forward with the volumes or parts of volumes that they had risked their lives to save some had been hidden in caves in the roofs or walls of houses or under their floors and some had been carefully protected and buried in the beds of rivers a blind man was found who could recite more than one-fourth of the shu king and a young girl supplied another portion of the book 
seventy years after the death of huang ti the house of confucius was torn down and behold in the wall was found a complete copy of the work when kao ti became emperor in two hundred and six b c there were almost no books in the empire but within the two following centuries more than seven thousand were written kao ti was in many ways a noble man and an excellent ruler but he came to the throne because he was the leader of a successful rebellion the editor it is related of this adventurer kao ti that just after the breaking out of the rebellion he happened to meet a fortune-teller on the road who falling at his feet said he offered him this mark of homage because he saw by the lines in his face that he was destined shortly to become emperor in making this prediction the soothsayer no doubt foresaw the probability of its accomplishment for it was not an unlikely termination of the rebellion that the leader if successful should be placed on the throne with this belief therefore the stranger followed up his prophecy by offering his only daughter in marriage to the chief kao ti accepted the proposal and married the lady who was thus by her father's artifice raised to the dignity of empress for after many scenes of violence and bloodshed in which the lawful emperor lost his life the insurgents were victorious and their leader was raised to the imperial throne the new sovereign was a native of the kingdom of han one of those small states into which the empire had formerly been divided therefore he is called the founder of the han dynasty the princes of his race occupied the throne for more than four centuries the first of the race commenced one of the most celebrated periods of chinese history in spite of the great wall the tartars continued their predatory warfare and sorely disquieted the more polished and peaceful chinese who vainly attempted to propitiate them with alliances and tribute the first emperors of this race endeavoured to make friends of the great tartar chiefs by giving them their daughters in marriage a native historian of the period exclaims our disgrace could not be exceeded from this time china lost her honour in the reign of the ninth emperor the tartars having been provoked by the punishment inflicted upon two of their chiefs who had transgressed the boundaries of the great wall while engaged in hunting the empire was again invaded by the erratic nations and a princess was demanded and yielded in marriage these incidents form the subject of one of the hundred plays of yuan an english version of which was printed in london under the name of the sorrows of han the impolitic system of buying off the barbarians which commenced thus early led many centuries afterwards to the total overthrow of the empire by the tartars during this period however the chinese made very important advances in civilization the arts and sciences were improved literature was encouraged agriculture was in a progressive state and several useful inventions date their origin from the same era among the latter one of the most important is the manufacture of paper which is supposed to have been commenced toward the end of the first century the egyptians had long possessed the art of making paper from the rush called papyrus which was also used at rome for the same purpose in the first century but that the chinese obtained their knowledge from either rome or egypt may well be doubted before they were acquainted with this useful art they were accustomed to write on thin slips of bamboo not with ink 
but with pointed tools similar to those used by engravers with which they cut or engraved the characters books were formed of bamboo by taking off the outside bark and cutting it into thin sheets all of the same shape and size which after the writing was finished were strung together in such a manner as to form a compact though rather clumsy volume at length about the year of our era ninety five it was ascertained by what means does not appear that bamboo might be made into a better material for writing upon than it furnished in its natural state by pounding it in a mortar with water until it becomes a thin paste which being spread out on a flat surface was dried into what we call paper the earliest specimens of this new art in china were probably a very rough description but the manufacture was gradually improved by the mixture of silk and other materials until the chinese were able to produce a paper of the most beautiful texture adapted for printing which we now call india paper and another kind for painting known by the name of rice paper the invention of paper naturally leads to that of ink which in china is always made in those cakes which are imported by the merchants of western countries under the name of indian ink it is used with the camel's hair pencils for writing by the chinese who do not require such pens as ours in the formation of their hieroglyphical characters end of section sixteen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section seventeen of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia Rakan feeding the hungry spirit chinese painting page fifty two Rakan feeding the hungry spirit from a chinese painting of the twelfth century the history of chinese painting is a long one reaching back to at least the third century b c the highest development was attained under the sung dynasty a d nine hundred and sixty to twelve hundred eighty the golden age of china especially in landscape and in religious paintings of which the picture shown here is a good example a rakan or buddhist holy man is feeding a wretched spirit that crouches before him in one hand he holds a bowl and with the other offers food to the starving spirit while his disciples regard the scene with an obvious expression of surprise at the length to which the rakan carries his charity buddha taught that the most rapid spiritual progress might be made by withdrawing from the world his rule for those who would devote themselves to the higher life required them to make their abode in the forest though after a time they were provided with monasteries in which they might live during the rainy season they were to dress in simple robes of dull yellow cloth made by sewing rags together their entire wealth must consist of a girdle a razor a needle an alms bowl and a strainer for all water drunk must be strained not to preserve the health of the drinker but rather the lives of any insects that might be in the liquid the rakan rose before daybreak washed swept around the bow tree sacred to the meditations of buddha brought the drinking water for the day and strained it placed flowers before the tree and meditated on his own faults and the virtues of buddha then taking his bowl he followed his superior on a begging tour for all food eaten must be obtained in this way after the single daily meal he retired and meditated on kindness and love after this he studied at sunset he swept the holy places and repeated to his superior what he had learned and listened to instruction he must also confess any wrong-doings of which he had been guilty so passed the day of one who would seek 
quick self-conquest and the joys of the higher life end of section seventeen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section eighteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section eighteen the three religions by w a p martin the invention of gunpowder the compass and printing the manufactures of silk and of porcelain have all been claimed for china it is thought that the chinese were the earliest searchers for the philosopher's stone which should turn baser metals into gold and for the elixir of life by which one's years might be lengthened to whatever extent he chose the chinese have a legend that a demon once offered to teach an alchemist how to turn base metal into gold but will it remain gold the alchemist asked will it not return to its original elements certainly replied the demon but that need not trouble you for no such change will take place until ten thousand ages have passed the alchemist refused the gift i should rather live in poverty he said than bring a loss upon my fellow-men even after ten thousand ages have passed there had been for many years two religions in the country confucianism and taoism confucianism taught its followers to worship heroes their own ancestors and the powers of nature taoism claimed to have been founded by lao tse but if so it had wandered far from his teachings according to taoism there is a soul or a god in everything a god of fire of rain of thunder and so on the taoist priests gain a vast influence by persuading the chinese that they can save them from the attacks of evil spirits at the time of the birth of christ there was a vague feeling through the east that some great religious event had come to pass in the west the wise men from the east looked to the land of the hebrews and journeyed westward to jerusalem to ask where is he that is born king of the jews more than half a century later the rumour of a new faith had reached china and the emperor sent his brother together with eighteen officers of state and a long retinue of attendants to learn what it might be the commission went to india and there they were persuaded that buddhism as the teachings of buddha a former prince of india were called was the new faith of which they were in search a prominent part of buddhism is the belief in metempsychosis or transmigration of souls that is that when a man dies his soul enters some animal it is for this reason that the followers of buddha are forbidden to destroy any animal life the editor it is impossible to apportion the people among these several creeds they are all confucians all buddhists all taoists they all reverence confucius and worship their ancestors and employ the buddhist burial service and all resort to the magical devices of the taoists to protect themselves against the assaults of evil spirits or secure good luck in business they celebrate their marriages according to the confucian rites in building their houses they ask the advice of a taoist and in cases of alarming illness employ him to exorcise evil spirits at death they commit their souls to the keeping of the buddhists the people assert and with truth that these religions originally three have become one and they are accustomed to symbolize this unity by erecting san chow tang temples of the three religions in which confucius and lao tse appear on the right and left of buddha as forming a triad of sages this arrangement however gives great offence to some of the more zealous disciples of confucius and a few years ago a memorial was presented to the emperor praying him to demolish the san chow tang which stood near the tomb of their great teacher who has no equal but heaven 
in the lao chai a collection of tales there is a story which owes its humour to the bizarre intermixture of elements from each of the three religions a young nobleman riding out hawk in hand is thrown from his horse and taken up for dead on being conveyed to his house he opens his eyes and gradually recovers his bodily strength but to the grief of his family he is hopelessly insane he fancies himself a buddhist priest and insists on being conveyed to a distant province where he affirms he has passed his life in a monastery on arriving he proves himself to be the abbot and the mystery of his transfiguration is at once solved he had led a dissolute life and his flimsy soul unable to sustain the shock of death was at once dissipated the soul of a priest who had just expired happened to be floating by and took possession of the still warm corpse the young nobleman was a confucian of the modern type the idea of the soul changing its earthly tenement is buddhistic and that which rendered the metamorphosis possible without waiting for another birth was the taoist doctrine that the soul is dissolved with the body unless it be purified and concentrated by vigorous discipline End of section eighteen recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section nineteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia dream and reality a buddhist story by chuang tzu fourth century b c once upon a time i dreamed i was a butterfly fluttering hither and thither to all intents and purposes a butterfly i was conscious only of following my fancies as a butterfly and was unconscious of my individuality as a man and there i lay myself again i do not know whether i was then dreaming i was a butterfly or whether i am now a butterfly dreaming that it is a man between man and butterfly there is necessarily a barrier and the transition is called metempsychosis end of section nineteen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section twenty of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section twenty milan the maiden chief by unknown from the third century a d to the seventh disorder and crime increased there was a northern an eastern and a western kingdom and there were attacks by the huns one emperor favoured buddhism another banished or slew its priests and destroyed their books in the very death chamber of an emperor one of his sons struck down another that he might gain the kingdom for himself extravagance was carried so far as to become wickedness one ruler built himself a magnificent palace large enough to shelter his ten thousand attendants his bodyguard was a regiment of superbly dressed women mounted on horseback on his amusements money was spent like water wherever he went he found bodies of his subjects hanging from the trees for they had chosen suicide rather than death by starvation but this was nothing to him and his wild extravagance continued one emperor used to run through the streets with a drawn sword slaying every one that was so unfortunate as to come in his way another saw the enemy coming and instead of defending his city he occupied himself in burning the royal library saying that all his studying of books was of no avail when the time of his need had come and now they should be destroyed 
freaks and vagaries ruled the land now and then an emperor arose who loved his people and punished whoever oppressed them one such sovereign was poisoned by his own mother it is small wonder that with his last breath he besought buddha never again to send him to earth as an emperor from this time of warfare come many stories of brave deeds one commander turned a hopeless defence into a victory by his quickness of wit as the foe advanced he threw open the gates of the city called away the sentinels took a seat on a tower in full view and began to play merrily on his guitar naturally the enemy supposed that he had some scheme in hand which made him absolutely certain of safety and they withdrew another commander was so nearly overcome by famine that the enemy confidently expected a surrender within a few days one night the besiegers heard the men in the hostile camp hard at work tramping to and fro in the morning they saw great heaps of rice beside the road this meant of course that food and reinforcements had reached the camp during the night and they retreated they did not guess that the heaps were of sand and that the thin covering of rice was the last bit of food in the possession of the starving soldiers in these times of constant fighting it happened more than once that a woman held a fort against an invading enemy such a warrior was mulan this poem was written between five hundred and two and five hundred and fifty six a d the editor say maiden at your spinning wheel why heave that deep-drawn sigh is it fear perchance or love you feel pray tell oh tell me why nor fear nor love has moved my soul away such idle thought a warrior's glory is the goal by my ambition sought my father's cherished life to save my country to redeem the dangers of the field i'll brave i am not what i seem no son has he his troop to lead no brother dear have i so i must mount my father's steed and to the battle high at dawn of day she quits her door at evening rests her head where loud the mountain torrents roar and mail-clad soldiers tread the northern plains are gained at last the mountains sink from view the sun shines cold and the wintry blast it pierces through and through a thousand foes around her fall and red blood stains the ground but mulan who survives it all returns with glory crowned before the throne they bend the knee in the palace of chanagan full many a knight of high degree but the bravest is mulan nay prince she cries my duty's done no guerdon i desire but let me to my home be gone to cheer my aged sire she nears the door of her father's home a chief with trumpets blare but when she doffs her waving plume she stands a maiden fair End of section twenty this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section twenty one of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section twenty one the prodigal emperor wong ti by rounswell wildman in the middle of the sixth century ruled one wong ti the most reckless and wildly extravagant emperor that ever occupied the dragon throne wong ti lived a short life and a merry one no expenditure appalled him and no sacrifice of blood and treasure deterred him from following to the very end any of his fancies even the building of the canal system that has made his name famous was a whim for the gratification of his own pleasures 
he wished to visit all the prominent cities of the empire in the most comfortable and luxurious way he ordered that canals be immediately dug from the river pin a branch of the han in hupe to the river si a short stream in shantung another from si to communicate with the river huai and that the existing water courses be widened at the same time he ordered built forty thousand dragon boats for the accommodation of his three thousand favorites and immediate court the canals were not mere ditches but magnificent examples of both engineering and artistic skill nothing was left unfinished to offend the critical eye of the dandy they were one hundred and twenty feet wide lined with cut stone with paved roads on either side shaded by full-grown trees taskmasters drove the laborers day and night and of the million men employed it is stated that over forty per cent died in the first royal journey from lo yang the capital to nanking the procession of boats extended for over sixty miles and eighty thousand soldiers were detailed to drag them the royal barge was two hundred feet long and forty feet high with four decks every district through which they passed was levied upon for provisions to support this immense host in transit the magnificent pageant swept through the empire for eight months the wonder and ruin of all who came within its reach the vast palaces gardens towns artificial lakes and mountains that wang ti the magnificent built in the short twelve years of his reign were according to the custom of the times destroyed by his successor but the canals remained a blessing to the descendants of the laborers who had died in their construction nebuchadnezzar the pharaohs nero and louis the fourteenth were but feeble imitators of this royal chinese spendthrift cleopatra's barge and babylon's hanging gardens were duplicated on a magnificent scale by wang ti he had a godlike genius for spending money in his palace garden which was so great that it contained an artificial lake three miles wide and three artificial islands one hundred feet high the flowering shrubs and trees were kept in perpetual bloom by skilled workmen who renewed every fallen flower with such exquisite imitation in silk and satin that no one could tell the natural from the artificial at a short distance after his death it was discovered that he had used all up the precious metals in the empire and that money was so scarce that pieces of leather and paper with their values stamped upon them had to be used in trade he took his dethronement with the same gay nonchalance with which he had sat upon the throne to his queen he said joy and sorrow both come to every man let us then bear each as it comes and make the best of life we can and of his princely executioners he asked politely disinterested what sin have i committed that you wish to take away my life sin they replied why what sin is there that you have not been guilty of what you say may be true answered the royal chesterfield hand me the silken cord i have had more pleasure in my life than you can have at my death the house of tang opened a new era in the history of china and marked the close of what might be styled the middle ages it has appropriately been called the augustan age of chinese literature each emperor strove to outdo his predecessors in the fostering of scholars and the education of the gentry great libraries were established schools sprang up poets essayists and historians thronged the successive courts the complete poems of the tang dynasty will be found in the home of every well-to-do chinaman of to-day the writings of confucius were annotated and popularized and in seven hundred and forty that deathless teacher was raised to the rank of a prince and his statue placed above that of the famous duke of chow the sixth emperor of the tongues founded han lin college a d seven fifty five the great postgraduate university of china end of section twenty one this recording is in the public domain section twenty two of china japan and the islands of the pacific 
Read for LibriVox.org by Mona Jahin. China Part 4 The Augustan Age Historical Note The most glorious period of Chinese history is from 618 to 1126 AD under the Tang and Sang dynasties. The boundaries of the empire were extended from the Caspian Sea to the Pacific Ocean. Commerce flourished and embassies were received from nations as far apart as Rome and Japan. Printing from blocks was in use by the Chinese in the 9th century. 600 years before John Gutenberg set up his press in Germany, and it imparted a powerful stimulus to bookmaking and to the founding of schools and libraries. End of section 22. This recording is in the public domain. Section 23 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 23. Taizung the Good by Rev. William Speer The Emperor Taizung is celebrated by the Chinese as one of their most illustrious sovereigns, and he appears to have merited the praises bestowed on him for his clemency, wisdom, justice, and general attention to the welfare of the people. Under the auspices of this enlightened prince, learning and the arts flourished as in the ancient times, and all the high offices were again filled by men of letters, while in order to promote the revival of literature, which had so long been neglected for war, an academy was instituted within the precincts of the palace, where not less than 8,000 students received instruction from the most able professors. Tai Tsung also founded a great school for archery, where he often attended himself for the purpose of practicing that warlike art, in which it was important for the Chinese to excel, as bows and arrows were their principal weapons. The ministers sometimes remonstrated with the emperor on the imprudence of trusting himself among the archers, but the good prince only replied, Am I not the father of my people? What then should I fear from my children? The attention of Tai Tsung was constantly directed toward improving the condition of the lower orders, which he effected in a material degree by lessening the taxes and sending commissioners into all the provinces to inquire into the conduct of the magistrates and to see that the poor were not oppressed by them. For he often expressed the benevolent wish that every poor man should have enough of the common necessaries of life to make him comfortable in his station, which may remind us of the well-known speech of Henry the Fourth of France, that he should not be satisfied till every peasant in the kingdom could afford to have a fowl in his pot on the Sunday. His strict sentiments with regard to the administration of justice induced him to pass a law for the prevention of bribery by making it an offence punishable with death for any magistrate to receive a present as a propitiation in the exercise of his power. And in order to ascertain whether this law had its proper effect, he employed a person to offer a bribe to a certain magistrate, of whose integrity he had some suspicion. The bribe was accepted, and the guilty magistrate condemned to death. But his life was saved by the interference of one of the ministers, who were always at liberty to speak freely to the emperors on the subject of their conduct. Great prince, said the monitor, the magistrate is guilty and therefore deserves to die according to the law, but are not you who tempted him to commit the crime a sharer in his guilt? 
the emperor at once admitted that he was so and pardoned the offender during the reign of tai tsung some christian missionaries of the nestorian church first arrived in china where they were well received by the emperor who permitted them to build churches and preach christianity among the people they were successful in making many converts one of whom was a minister of state they gave to the tartar tribes on the north of china their own syriac alphabet and great numbers of those people became christians when the first roman priests visited china they found the sign of the cross in use and other customs which bore evidence of the former influence of the nestorians a tablet was discovered at the city of Xingang, cut in the syriac character which relates the success of their early labors their missionary zeal deserves great honor it conferred lasting benefits upon the nations of eastern asia the emperor tai tsung died after a reign of twenty-three years regretted by his subjects who looked up to him as a pattern of wisdom and virtue and preserved many of his excellent maxims which are frequently repeated with great veneration to this day the successors of tai tsung maintained the peace and prosperity which had been established by that great prince and under their dominion the country was much improved and the people enjoyed a considerable share of comfort and tranquillity among the great national works of the seventh century were several extensive canals for the convenience of inland commerce with locks of a peculiar construction or slides placed in embankments over which their flat-bottomed vessels without being unloaded were hauled by ropes attached to large capstans by means of this inland communication trade was so much increased that a great number of vessels came every year to the port of kan fu which was either canton or kan pu near hang chau and about the year seven hundred a d a regular market was opened there for foreign merchandise and an imperial commissioner was appointed to receive the customs on all goods imported from other countries which collectively produced a large revenue to the government End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Brianna. The Rule of the Empress Wu by S. Wells Williams. Taizung was succeeded by his son Kaozung, whose indolent imbecility appears the more despicable after his father's vigor. But his reign fills a large place in Chinese history from the extraordinary career of his empress, Empress Wu, as she is called, who by her blandishments obtained entire control over him. The character of this woman has no doubt suffered much from the bad reputation native historians have given her, but enough can be gathered from their accounts to show that with all her cruelty she understood how to maintain the authority of the crown and provide for the wants of the people. Introduced to the harem of Tai Tsung at the age of fourteen, she was sent at his death to the retreat where all his women were condemned for the rest of their days to honorable imprisonment. While a member of the palace, Kao Tsung had been charmed with her appearance and, having seen her at one of the state ceremonies connected with the ancestral worship, brought her back to the palace. As soon as she became empress, Wu began gradually to assume more and more authority, until, long before the emperor's death in 684, she engrossed the whole management of affairs, and, at his demise, openly assumed the reins of government, which she wielded for twenty-one years with no weak hand. 
her generals extended the limits of the empire and her officers carried into effect her orders to alleviate the miseries of the people her cruelty vented itself in the murder of all who opposed her will even her own sons and relatives and her pride was rather exhibited than gratified by her assuming the titles of queen of heaven holy and divine ruler holy mother and divine sovereign when she was disabled by age her son supported by some of the first men of the land asserted his claim to the throne and by a palace conspiracy succeeded in removing her to her own apartments where she died aged eighty one years end of section twenty four this recording is in the public domain section twenty five of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 25. The Founding of Han Lin College, by Rev. William Speer. The sixth emperor of the Tang Dynasty founded the Han Lin College, the leading literary institution of the Chinese Empire, consisting of forty members from whose number the ministers of state are generally chosen and from whom all successful candidates for honours receive their degrees the members of the han lin are mentioned in old histories as the learned doctors of the empire and in fact possessed quite as much knowledge in those days as they do now for the members of the present day are all educated according to the ancient system nor have any new branches of learning until recently been introduced into the schools of china yet when the han lin college was founded the chinese were far in advance of the europeans both in knowledge and refinement for the modern nations of europe were then only just emerging from the barbarism into which they had been plunged by the conquests of the gothic tribes england was divided among the princes of the heptarchy and france was in that rude state which preceded the reign of charlemagne it may be imagined that only a very small proportion of the boys in any school were gifted with such great talents as would entitle them to attain preferment therefore of the many who presented themselves as candidates for honours at the hall of their province where an examination was held once a year very few perhaps were chosen and those had to pass other examinations by doctors of a higher degree before they were eligible to be appointed to offices of state still each aspirant had a chance and as the object was so important great pains were taken to instil into the minds of youth a due sense of the value of learning and many little stories written with that intent were read to children as soon as they were of an age to comprehend them these juvenile tales are mostly very simple but are not uninteresting as illustrations of the character and manners of the people the following are specimens of their general style there was a boy whose father was so poor that he could not afford to send him to school but was obliged to make him work all day in the fields to help to maintain his family the lad was so anxious to learn that he proposed giving up a part of the night to study but as his mother had not the means of supplying him with a lamp for that purpose he brought home every evening a glow-worm which being held in a thin piece of gauze and applied to the lines of a book gave sufficient light to enable him to read and thus he acquired so much knowledge that in course of time he became a minister of state and supported his parents with ease and comfort in their old age another youth who was rather dull of intellect found it a very laborious task to apply himself to learning and made such slow progress that he was often rather disheartened yet he was not idle and for several years continued to study with unceasing diligence 
at length the time arrived for his examination and he repaired with many others to the hall of the province where he had the mortification after all his exertions of being dismissed as unqualified to pass in returning homeward very much depressed in spirits and thinking it would be better to give up literary pursuits altogether and turn his attention to some other employment he happened to see an old woman busily employed in rubbing an iron pestle on a whetstone what are you doing there good mother said he i am grinding down this pestle replied the old dame till it becomes sharp enough to use for working embroidery and she continued her employment Li Pi, such was the name of the student struck with the patience and perseverance of the woman applied her answer to his own case she will no doubt succeed at last said he then why should i despair so he returned to his studies and in a few years on appearing again before the board he acquitted himself so well that he passed with honour and rose in time to one of the highest offices in the state these short and simple tales of which the chinese have whole volumes serve to show the bias they have endeavoured to give to the minds of their children and account for the studious habits of so large a portion of the community end of section twenty five this recording is in the public domain. Section 26 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Andrea The Binding of Feet by Rev. William Spear It was about this period that the strange custom was first adopted in China of binding the feet of female children to prevent their growth. The origin of this absurd and unnatural practice is unknown, nor is it easy to imagine what could have induced women, in the first instance, thus to deform themselves. For although vanity may be a powerful incitement for the continuance of a custom which distinguishes the higher from the lower classes, it hardly accounts for the first introduction of this practice as any other distinctive mark less painful and less inconvenient might have answered the same purpose the daughters of all people of rank are obliged to submit at an early age to have their feet cramped up and confined with bandages which are not removed for about three years when the bones are so far compressed that the feet never assume their natural shape and size. The health of the children generally suffers much from the want of proper exercise during this cruel process, and the enjoyment of afterlife must be greatly diminished by the difficulty which females find in walking or even standing without support. Yet they are proud of their very helplessness, and would think it excessively vulgar to be able to walk with a firm and dignified step. The lower classes cannot follow a fashion which would disable them from pursuing their daily labors. Yet many parents, in a very humble station of life, are not free from the vanity of desiring to have one daughter with small feet, the prettiest child being usually selected for that distinction and such is the force of fashion that the little damsel who is thus tortured and crippled is looked upon as an object of envy rather than of pity end of section 26 this recording is in the public domain section number 27 of china japan and the islands of the pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Hollis House. Printing by Reverend William Spear. It was in the ninth century that printing began to be practiced in China, an event which occurred about 500 years before the art was known in Europe. The method first adopted in China was to engrave the characters on stone. Consequently, when the impression was taken off, the ground of the paper was black and the letters were white. But this mode was shortly superseded by the invention of wooden blocks, cut in such a manner that the letters were raised instead of indented, and thus were impressed in black on white ground. 
This mode of printing from wood is still practiced in China, and is well adapted to the written language of the Chinese, as its words are not formed of vowels and consonants like those of Western languages, but a single character, of which there are many thousands, expresses a whole word. Yet it is necessarily very slow, and for this reason must yield in the end to the use of divisible metal type and of our swift machinery. The superior beauty of the typography of our books already wins the wonder and praise of the Chinese. Before the invention of printing, there must have been a vast number of Chinese constantly employed in writing, as they were always a reading people, and even the poorest peasants were able to obtain books in manuscript. While in Europe, a book was a thing unknown among the lower classes and seldom to be met with, except in monasteries or palaces of princes. End of section twenty-seven. This recording is in the public domain. Section twenty-eight of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. China, Part Five: The Coming of the Tartars. Historical note. The Tartars of Mongols are in some respects the most remarkable race that has inhabited the world. Their armies, the mightiest that have ever been gathered together, conquered and ruled an empire the greatest in population and extent that has ever existed. They bore their ox-hide banners over every state of Europe and Asia, save Spain, England, and Japan, and for more than a thousand years terrorized a great part of the human race. The toll of lives taken by Genghis Khan alone is reckoned at four and one-half million. The Tartars had been the torment of China for many ages, and during the tenth and eleventh centuries they had become much more powerful. In 926 the Khatan Tartars helped to overthrow one of the Chinese dynasties, but when the new ruler came to the throne, they claimed their reward, sixteen cities, and an annual tribute of three hundred thousand taels of silver, about two hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and a great number of pieces of silk neither arms nor tribute nor the gift of princesses availed and early in the twelfth century the chinese invited the kin tartars the ancestors of the present manchus to drive the katans from a province that they had seized the kin had not the slightest ob objection to performing this neighborly office they drove the katans out but they kept the province for themselves one chinese ruler tried his best to gain their good will by flattery when he addressed their chief he spoke of himself as chin that is your servant but even this humility did not win them and they pushed on their conquest to the yangtze kiang river end of section twenty eight this recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jim Locke. Section 29 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Schmidt. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 29, The Tartars and Their Customs, by Marco Polo. To the north of China lived the Tartars, a wild, savage, wandering tribe. Their custom is to spend the winter in warm plains, where they find good pasture for their cattle, whilst in summer they betake themselves to a cool climate among the mountains and valleys, where water is to be found, as well as woods and pastures. Their houses are circular, and are made of wands covered with felt. These are carried along with them, 
whithersoever they go for the ones are so strongly bound together and likewise so well combined that the frame can be made very light whenever they erect these huts the door is always to the south they also have wagons covered with black felt so efficaciously that no rain can get in these are drawn by oxen and camels and the women and children travel in them the women do the buying and selling and whatever is necessary to provide for the husband and household for the men all lead the life of gentlemen troubling themselves about nothing but hunting and hawking and looking after their goshawks and falcons unless it be the practice of warlike exercises they live on the milk and meat which their herds supply and on the produce of the chase and they eat all kinds of flesh including that of horses and dogs and pharaohs rats the gerbo of which last there are great numbers in burrows on the plains their drink is mare's milk this is the fashion of their religion they say there is a most high god of heaven whom they worship daily with thurible and incense but they pray to him only for health of mind and body but they have also a certain other god of theirs called natigai and they say he is the god of the earth who watches over their children cattle and crops they show him great worship and honour and every man has a figure of him in his house made of felt and cloth and they also make in the same manner images of his wife and children the wife they put on the left hand and the children in front and when they eat they take the fat of the meat and grease the god's mouth withal as well as the mouths of his wife and children then they take of the broth and sprinkle it before the door of the house and that done they deem that their god and his family have had their share of the dinner the clothes of the wealthy tartars are for the most part of gold and silk stuffs lined with costly furs such as sable and ermine vair and fox skin in the richest fashion all their harness of war is excellent and costly their arms are bows and arrows sword and mace but above all the bow for they are capital archers indeed the best that are known on their backs they wear armour of queer bouillie prepared from buffalo and other hides which is very strong they are excellent soldiers and passing valiant in battle they are also more capable of hardship than other nations for many a time if need be they will go for a month without any supply of food living only on the milk of their mares and on such game as their bows may win them their horses also will subsist entirely on the grass of the plains so that there is no need to carry store of barley or straw or oats and they are very docile to their riders these in case of need will abide on horseback the livelong night armed at all points while the horse will be continually grazing of all troops in the world these are they which endure the greatest hardship and fatigue and which cost the least and they are the best of all for making wide conquests of country and this you will perceive from what you have heard and shall hear in this book and as a fact there can be no manner of doubt that now they are the masters of the biggest half of the world their troops are admirably ordered in the manner that i shall now relate you see when a tartar prince goes forth to war he takes with him say one hundred thousand horse well he appoints an officer to every ten men one to every hundred one to every thousand and one to every ten thousand so that his own orders have to be given to ten persons only and each of these ten persons has to pass the orders to other ten and so on no one having to give orders to more than ten and every one in turn is responsible only to the officer immediately over him and the discipline and order that comes of this method is marvellous for they are a people very obedient to their chiefs and when the army is on the march they have always two hundred horsemen very well mounted who are sent a distance of two marches in advance to reconnoitre and these always keep ahead they have a similar party detached in the rear and on either flank so that there is a good lookout kept on all sides against a surprise when they are going on a distant expedition they take no gear with them except two leather bottles for milk a little earthenware pot to cook their meat in 
and a little tent to shelter them from rain and in case of great urgency they will ride ten days on end without lighting a fire or taking a meal on such an occasion they will sustain themselves on the blood of their horses opening a vein and letting the blood jet into their mouths drinking till they have had enough and then stanching it they have also milk dried into a kind of paste to carry with them and when they need food they put this in water and beat it up until it dissolves and then drink it it is prepared in this way they boil the milk and when the rich part floats on the top they skim it into another vessel and of that they make butter for the milk will not become solid till this is removed then they put the milk in the sun to dry and when they go on an expedition every man takes some ten pounds of this dried milk with him and of a morning he will take a half pound of it and put it into his leather bottle with as much water as he pleases so as he rides along the milk paste and the water in the bottle get well churned together into a kind of pep and that makes his dinner when they come to an engagement with the enemy they will gain the victory in this fashion they never let themselves get into a regular medley but keep perpetually riding round and shooting into the enemy and as they do not count it any shame to run away in battle they will sometimes pretend to do so and in running away they turn in the saddle and shoot hard and strong at the foe and in this way make great havoc their horses are trained so perfectly that they will double hither and thither just like a dog in a way that is quite astonishing thus they fight to as good purpose in running away as if they stood and faced the enemy because of the vast volley of arrows that they shoot in this way turning round upon their pursuers who are fancying that they have won the battle but when the tartars see that they have killed and wounded a good many horses and men they wheel round bodily and return to the charge in perfect order and with loud cries and in a very short time the enemy are routed in truth they are stout and valiant soldiers and inured to war and you perceive that it is just when the enemy sees them run and imagines that he has gained the battle that he has in reality lost it for the tartars wheel around in a moment when they judge the right time has come and after this fashion they have won many a fight all this that i have been telling you is true of the manners and customs of the genuine tartars but i must add that in these days they are greatly degenerated for those who are settled in cathay have taken up the practices of the idolaters of the country and have abandoned their own institutions whilst those who have settled in the levant have adopted the customs of the saracens the way they administer justice is this when any one has committed a petty theft they give him under the orders of authority seven blows of a stick or seventeen or twenty-seven or thirty-seven or forty-seven and so forth always increasing by tens in proportion to the injury done and running up to one hundred and seven of these beatings sometimes they die but if the offence be horse-stealing or some other great matter they cut the thief in two with a sword howbeit if he be able to ransom himself by paying nine times the value of the thing stolen he is let off every lord or other person who possesses beasts has them marked with his peculiar brand be they horses mares camels oxen cows or other great cattle and then they are sent abroad to graze over the plains without any keeper they get all mixed together but eventually every beast is recovered by means of its owner's brand which is known for their sheep and goats they have shepherds all their cattle are remarkably fine big and in good condition they have another notable custom which is this if any man have a daughter who dies before marriage and another man have had a son also die before marriage the parents of the two arrange a grand wedding between the dead lad and lass and marry them they do making a regular contract and when the contract papers are made out they put them into the fire in order as they will have it that the parties in the other world may know the fact and so look on each other as man and wife and the parents henceforth consider themselves sib to each other just as if their children had lived and married whatever may be agreed on between the parties as dowry 
those who have to pay it cause to be painted on pieces of paper and then put these into the fire saying that in that way the dead person will get all the real articles in the other world end of section twenty nine this recording is in the public domain section thirty of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section thirty the Chinese Theater by Archibald Little When traveling in China through the scenes made famous in song and history, I have been astonished at the accurate knowledge of the old wars and dynasties displayed by illiterate boatmen on the river and by our porters on land journeys. They are never tired of pointing out historic sites to the foreign traveler and expatiating upon the great deeds of former generations it was a long time before i could learn whence these men derived their knowledge so far surpassing the acquaintance with history displayed by similar classes in our own country i at last discovered that they had learned their history in that pleasantest and most impressive of all schools the theater Elaborate historical dramas form the bulk of the performances given in the public theater, which almost every village in China possesses, by companies of strolling players who are paid by subscriptions from the more wealthy inhabitants. These companies are generally hired for a week or a fortnight. The performance commences at noon and goes on till about nine at night. The extraordinary endurance of the actors, an endurance characteristic of the Chinese in all their avocations, is shown by the long successive hours they spend upon the stage. And as all the important pieces are sung to the accompaniment of the band, how they support the strain upon the voice is almost incomprehensible. They have a large repertoire which they carry in their heads. Many of them have no books of the plays. They are apprenticed as children, and so learn the pieces by rote at an age when the memory is especially vigorous. A mark of attention to a distinguished visitor is to hand him the repertoire and ask him to choose a play out of some hundred pieces contained therein. I have often selected an unpopular and seldom performed play, and never found the test too much for them, the piece being produced immediately. On the other hand, should a play on the program happen to contain a character of the same name as that of the visitor, it is at once suppressed. Although there is no scenery, the dresses are extremely handsome, elaborate embroideries being worn by princes and generals, and generally the dressing and get-up are careful and accurate. There is no curtain and no drop scene, and curiously enough, there is no interval between successive plays. Only a peculiar note is sounded on the cymbals, a signal known to the initiated. This has led Europeans to state that a Chinese play went on forever. It is true that sometimes, when a succession of historical plays is given, the same story may go on for three or four successive days. There is, moreover, one celebrated play which has no less than twenty-four acts. As a rule, however, the lighter Chinese pieces are even shorter than ours. While theatricals are being performed, the whole village is on fete all in their best clothes, the ladies in the galleries with little tables on which are tea and cakes and other delicacies, while families in the wide area of the open pit sit all day long with their tea and pipes, enjoying themselves in a way that it is a pleasure to see. 
In the cities, plays are given in the very handsome theatres attached to the guild halls, of which every large trading city in China has several. Performances are given on the feast days of the guilds, when the members are invited to the dinners quite as elaborate as those given by our own city companies. The feast, which extends over several hours, is accompanied with much ceremony and ancient ritual observances, while the plays go on uninterruptedly. A common penalty when disputes are arbitrated by the guilds is fining the defendant in a theatrical performance, which, if extended over the usual three days, costs about ten pounds, the average number of a company being thirty men, female parts being all taken by men and boys, as in the Middle Ages. During their long hours of song, the actors are refreshed by means of shabbily dressed coolies who walk casually onto the stage and hand them tea at intervals, but whom the audience are supposed to regard as invisible. Rough indications of scenery are given in a primitive way. A beleaguered general, sitting on a chair raised on a table, addressing an actor standing on the stage is supposed to be parlaying with the commander of the besieging force. Cavalry are indicated by a whip held in the hand, and when dismounting or mounting to ride off, they go through the action of bestriding a horse. The actors who take women's parts speak in a high falsetto voice, and in their makeup and get up are indistinguishable from real women. A table covered with an embroidered cloth may represent a throne, or with plain red cloth, a magistrate's yeoman. End of section 30. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator, Nemo as the emperor, Todd as the attendant, Eva Davis as the lady princess, Sarah Hale as the envoy, and Thomas Peter as the President of the Council. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 31. The Sorrows of Han, by Unknown. The Tartars realized how much more civilized the Chinese were than they themselves, and the savage chief, who had just overcome a Chinese force in battle, was often willing to make peace if a Chinese princess might be sent him for his wife. It is upon this custom that the following play is founded. With only two actors on the stage of the theatre, there is not often an opportunity to bring out in conversation who a man is and what he is seeking, and so the chief characters have to make little speeches and introduce themselves. In the prologue to this play, the Khan of the Tartars appears first, declares his greatness and speaks of the custom of wedding a princess of China. Then comes the minister, who is bidden to search out beautiful maidens that the emperor may choose among them. In Act Two, the minister declares that he has found the loveliest woman in the world. He admits her to the palace, but as her father is too poor to give him a bribe, he disfigures her portrait that she may have no chance of being chosen by the emperor. Behold, the emperor enters and finds her playing on a lute. The Editor Since the beauties were selected to grace our palace, we have not yet discovered a worthy object on whom to fix our preference. Vexed and disappointed, we pass this day of leisure, roaming in search of her who may be destined for our imperial choice. He is the lute. Is not that some lady's lute? It is. I hasten to advise her of your majesty's approach. 
No, hold. Keeper of the Yellow Gate, discover to what part of our palace that lady pertains, and bid her approach our presence. But beware lest you alarm her. Attendant approaches in the direction of the sound and speaks. What lady plays there? The emperor comes. Approach to meet him. Lady advances. Keeper of the yellow gate, see that the light burns brightly within your gauze lamp, and hold it nearer to us. Lady approaching. Had your handmaid but known it was your majesty, she would have been less tardy. Forgive, then, this delay. Truly, this is a very perfect beauty. From what quarter come such superior charms? My name is Chao. My father cultivates at Chitu the fields which he has derived from his family. Born in a humble station, I am ignorant of the manners that befit a palace. But with such uncommon attractions, what chance has kept you from our sight? When I was chosen by the minister, my Posho, he demanded of my father an amount of treasure which our poverty could not supply. He therefore disfigured my portrait by representing a scar under the eyes, and caused me to be consigned to seclusion and neglect. Keeper of the Yellow Gate, bring us that picture that we may view it. Seize the picture. Ah, how has he dimmed the purity of the gem, bright as the waves in autumn. To the attendant. Transmit our pleasure to the officer of the guard, to be head, Mayupin Show, and report to us his execution. My parents, sir, are subject to the tax in their native district. Let me entreat your majesty to remit their contributions and extend favor towards them. That shall readily be done. Approach, and hear our imperial pleasure. We create you a princess of our palace. How unworthy is your handmaid of such gracious distinction. Goes to the form of returning thanks. Early tomorrow I attend your majesty's commands in this place. The emperor is gone. Let the attendant close the doors. I will retire to rest. The false minister contrives to escape to the Tartars. He shows to the Tartar Khan a true portrait of the princess and persuades him to demand her hand in marriage. The Khan does this with the threat that if the maiden is refused, he will ravage the country. The emperor's counsellors insist that for the sake of the empire, the princess shall be given up, and at length the emperor yields. In Act Three, the princess grieves at leaving the palace and going to the winds and snows and the strange husband of a foreign land. There is a farewell scene between her and the emperor. Alas, when shall I again behold your majesty? I will take off my robes of distinction and leave them behind me. Today in the palace of Han, tomorrow I shall be a spouse to a stranger. I cease to wear these splendid vestments. They shall no longer adorn my beauty in the eyes of men. Again, let us urge you, princess, to depart. We have delayed but too long already. Tis done. Princess, when you are gone, let your thoughts forbear to dwell with sorrow and resentment upon us. They part. And am I the great monarch of the line of Han? Let your majesty cease to dwell with such grief upon this subject. She is gone. In vain have we maintained those armed heroes on the frontier. Mention but swords and spears, and they tremble at their hearts like a young deer. The princess has this day performed what belonged to themselves, and yet they affect the semblance of men. Your majesty is entreated to return to the palace. Dwell not so bitterly, sir, on her memory. Allow her to depart. Did I not think of her? I had a heart of iron. A heart of iron! 
the tears of my grief stream in a thousand channels this evening shall her likeness be suspended in the palace where i will sacrifice to it and tapers with her silver lights shall illuminate her chamber let your majesty return to the palace the princess is already far distant the princess is now seen in the camp of the tartars on the bank of the amur river and in despair she throws herself into the stream the khan refuses to keep in his domain such a traitor as maui and shao and in act four the minister is given over to the emperor and his head is struck off as an offering to the shades of the princess end of section thirty one this recording is in the public domain section thirty two of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by sandra the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section thirty two genghis khan the perfect warrior by d pettis de la croix another tartar force was now coming to the front their leader was a remarkable man whose name as a child was temuchin his father had been chief of several tribes he died leaving the boy of thirteen to take his place naturally some of the tribes promptly revolted but the mother of temuchin seized her son's banner and by the aid of those who were still faithful she brought back half of the rebels until the boy had become a man of forty-four years he had to fight against enemies and be on his guard against traitors at length the time came when he felt that his position was secure he called together his chief men and told them that the fates had promised him the rule of the whole earth they were enthusiastic for they had already seen the ability of their leader he took the name of genghis khan or perfect warrior and gave his people the name of mongols or the bold he made laws and had some books translated from foreign languages one tribe rose against him but he soon subdued it the editor all things looked now as if he desired to live in repose and taste the sweets of that peaceful estate which by such vast fatigues he had obtained but the love of arms the darling passion of his soul permitted him not to rest and he thought of nothing else but how to find a pretext to fall out with the chinese against whom in particular he had formed some designs the present state of affairs all being now in peace affording him no means to quarrel he sought amongst the transactions of past ages for something fit to urge against them and calling to mind the injuries the kings of china had heretofore done to his ancestors nay to his own father and people he conferred with his nevians and other princes of his court continually entertaining them with discourses of the injuries and wrongs their fathers had suffered by the chinese this was the cause said he that our country was looked upon with so much scorn and despised by the other nations of asia in fine he excited them to revenge by urging them that they had no other way to vindicate their honour and make themselves famous to posterity neither did he forget to remind them of the promise god had made to him to assist and render him victorious over all his enemies the mogul princes and lords failed not to applaud their emperor's design whether it was out of complaisance or that they found it agreeable to reason and justice is not the question a council was called to consult on ways and means how to bring this great enterprise to pass and it was resolved that first of all an ambassador be sent to altu khan king of china to demand satisfaction for all the damages and injuries done to the moguls by his predecessors with orders that in case he refused to comply war should be declared against him for this purpose they chose jafer an old courtier a man perfectly skilled in state affairs and sent him away in the winter season jafer being arrived at kambaluk which was the old city of peking 
one of the capital cities of Cathay, had an audience of the king, whom he accidentally found in this city, for he was not used to reside there, but only in the summer. This ambassador made a long harangue, which he began with expostulating on his master's greatness, his elevation to the empire of the Moguls and Tartars, and the choice God had made of him to govern the world. He afterwards demanded reparation of the king for all the damages and injuries which his predecessor had done the Moguls, telling him that, if he refused to comply with these demands, he had orders to declare war against him, and to assure him that Genghis Khan, at the head of a most powerful army, would come and drive him out of his kingdom, and establish one of his own children on his throne. Japhar's discourse appeared very surprising to the king of China, who was much astonished that the Mogul emperor should form such a design, and venture to attack and begin a war against a nation whom he had reason to fear, considering the great damages and losses he himself confessed his nation had sustained by them. The king complained to the ambassador, saying, Your master treats me as if he thought me a Turk or a Mogul. And with this answer he sent him back. Go tell Genghis Khan that, although I cannot hinder him from making war with me, yet I will meet him with an army that shall make him repent his rashness. Japhar returned with all diligence to Karakorum, and gave his master an account of his negotiations and the observations he had made pursuant to the orders he had given him. End of section 32. This recording is in the public domain. Section 33 of China, Japan and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra. Genghis Khan Captures Peking by D. Petit de la Croix. Although the King of China had put abundance of troops into Peking, the Mongols, instigated by the Chinese rebels that accompanied them, resolved to lay siege to this city. They even tried to take it by assault, but the Prince of China, to whom the King, his father, had entrusted the management of the first war, defended it so vigorously that all the besiegers' efforts proved in vain. It was impossible to tell how many brave actions were performed on both sides during the siege, by reason that the fate of China seemed to depend on the good or ill fortune of this its capital city. The bravest Chinese and the greatest lords of the empire were entered into it to share the honor of the long and brave defense. The great number of troops that were in this city took away from the besiegers all hope of taking it by open force. Therefore, they resolved to starve it out. And the famine became so great in Peking that the men chose rather to eat one another than to yield. Notwithstanding, the Chinese bravery availed them nothing, for the city was taken by a stratagem, which being reported to the king of China, he conceived such displeasure that he poisoned himself. This is the tale of the capture. The besiegers suffered so horrible a famine that they were obliged to decimate the men and out of every ten kill one to feed the other nine. The besieged defended themselves so valiantly with their arrows and engines that when stones came to fail the engineers, they melted down their gold and silver, which were in great abundance in that place, and used it to shoot against their enemies. But at last, the Moguls having received a supply of provisions, and finding they were no nearer taking the city than they were the first day, undermined it, and made a way underground, which reached to the middle of the city, and in the night assailed the Chinese, who, surprised with a stratagem so new and strange, lost all courage, and were obliged to surrender the city to the Moguls. The king of China, believing this place impregnable, had shut himself in it, and was killed with his son. The Moguls and Tartars, who were entered into the city, opened the gates to those without, and gave no quarter to any they met with, and they plundered it of all that was precious or valuable, and afterwards divided the booty according to Genghis Khan's law. End of section 33. This recording is in the public domain. Section 34 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. 
The Dirge of Genghis Khan by Unknown Genghis Khan conquered Central Asia from the Caspian Sea and the Indus River to Korea and the Yangtze Kiang. He was about to attack southern China when he died in 1227. His body was buried in his own country, and it is said that it was borne to his native land on a two-wheeled wagon, escorted by his enormous number of followers. As they journeyed, they wept and wailed, and one of the old comrades of the dead warrior chanted a dirge which has been handed down to this day. The Editor Willem, thou didst swoop like a falcon, a rumbling wagon now trundles thee off. O oh, my king, hast thou in truth, then, forsaken thy wife and thy children and the diet of thy people, O oh, my king? Circling in pride like an eagle, will whom thou didst lead us, O oh, my king? But now thou hast stumbled and fallen like an unbroken coat, O oh, my king. End of section 34 this recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Ready for LibriVox.org by Brianna China Part 4 Stories of the Great Ken Historical Note Not many years after the death of Genghis Khan, Kublai ascended the throne. He overcame what opposition survived and reigned as emperor of all China, save for Arabia, Hindustan, and some of the western districts of Asia, he ruled from the Pacific to the Dnieper River, and from the Arctic Ocean to the Straits of Malacca. There was much for these white Tartars to learn from the Chinese. The Mongols had had no definite laws. For instance, if a man was accused of a crime, he was tried before some official, and if he was found guilty, he was punished as the official thought best. Moreover, the Tartars gave nothing in charity. If a poor man begged of one of them, he would receive the reply, Go with the curse of God, for if he loved you as he loves me, he would have provided for you. Many of the Tartars now adopted the religion of Buddha. This teaches charity to men and beasts, for who could say but the soul of some one of a man's own relatives was embodied in the beggar who pleaded for alms, or in the hungry dogs whose wistful eyes pleaded for a meal. End of section 35. This recording is in the public domain. Section 36 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 36. The Palace of the Great Khan in Kambalik, Peking. By Marco Polo. Kublai Khan was a good ruler to the Chinese and did well for the country. He was anxious to know more about the rest of the world, and when he was told that two merchants from Venice were in his city, he was delighted and sent for them at once to ask questions about their rulers, how they lived, how they went forth to battle, and in what manner they administered justice. After these two merchants, the Polos, had remained in China for some time, they returned to Italy. Then they journeyed eastward again, and this time they brought with them young Marco, the son of one of them. The young man put on the Chinese dress, and learned the four languages most used in the country. This pleased the Khan, but something else pleased him much more. 
he was hungry to know about the distant lands and the manners and customs of people but when his officers returned from an embassage they had nothing to say except to make reports of the business on which they had been sent they are fools and dolts declared the emperor and to the men themselves he said i had far liefer hearken about the strange things and manners of the different countries you have seen than merely be told of the business you went upon it chanced that marco was once sent away on a business matter he kept his eyes open and when he returned he had a long story to tell of what he had seen the emperor was delighted at last he had found a man after his own heart he sent the young venetian on most important missions and listened eagerly to the lively stories that he has always had to tell on his return after the polos had gone back to their own country marco wrote a very interesting book about his years in china or cafe as it was then called the following stories are taken from this book the editor you must know that it is the greatest palace that ever was it is all on the ground floor only the basement is raised some ten palms above the surrounding soil and this elevation is retained by a wall of marble raised to the level of the pavement two paces in width and projecting beyond the base of the palace so as to form a kind of terrace walk by which people can pass round the building and which is exposed to view whilst on the outer edge of the wall there is a very fine pillared balustrade and up to this the people are allowed to come the roof is very lofty and the walls of the palace are all covered with gold and silver they are also adorned with representations of dragons sculptured and gilt beasts and birds knights and idols and sundry other subjects and on the ceiling too you will see nothing but gold and silver and painting on each of the four sides there is a great marble staircase leading to the top of the marble wall and forming the approach to the palace the hall of the palace is so large that it could easily dine six thousand people and it is quite a marvel to see how many rooms there are besides the building is altogether so vast so rich and so beautiful that no man on earth could design anything superior to it the outside of the roof also is all colored with vermilion and yellow and green and blue and other hues which are fixed with a varnish so fine and exquisite that they shine like crystal and lend a resplendent lustre to the palace as seen for a great way around this roof is made too with such strength and solidity that it is fit to last for ever between the two walls of the enclosure there are fine parks and beautiful trees bearing a variety of fruits there are beasts also of sundry kinds such as white stags and fallow deer gazelles and roebucks and fine squirrels of various sorts with numbers also of the animal that gives the musk and all manner of other beautiful creatures insomuch that the whole place is full of them and no spot remains void except where there is traffic of people going and coming the parks are covered with abundant grass and the roads through them being all paved and raised two cubits above the surface they never become muddy nor does the rain lodge on them but flows off into the meadows quickening the soil and producing the abundance of herbage from that corner of the enclosure which is toward the northwest there extends a fine lake containing foison of fish of different kinds which the emperor hath caused to be put in there so that whenever he desires any he can have them at his pleasure a river enters this lake and issues from it but there is a grating of iron or brass put up so that the fish cannot escape in that way moreover on the north side of the palace about a bow shot off there is a hill which has been made by art from the earth dug out of the lake it is a good hundred paces in height and a mile in compass 
this hill is entirely covered with trees that never lose their leaves but remain ever green and i assure you that wherever a beautiful tree may exist and the emperor gets news of it he sends for it and has it transported bodily with all its roots and the earth attached to them and planted on that hill of his no matter how big the tree may be he gets it carried by his elephants and in this way he has got together the most beautiful collection of trees in all the world and he has also caused the whole hill to be covered with the ore of azure which is very green and thus not only are the trees all green but the hill itself is all green likewise and there is nothing to be seen on it that is not green and hence it is called the green mount and in good sooth it is named well on the top of the hill again there is a fine big palace which is all green inside and out and thus the hill and the trees and the palace form together a charming spectacle and it is marvellous to see their uniformity of colour everybody who sees them is delighted and the great khan had caused this beautiful prospect to be formed for the comfort and solace and delectation of his heart End of section 36. This recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section thirty seven how the great khan ate his dinner by marco polo and when the great khan sits at table on any great court occasion it is in this fashion his table is elevated a good deal above the others and he sits at the north end of the hall looking towards the south with his chief wife beside him on the left on his right sit his sons and his nephews and other kinsmen of the blood imperial but lower so that their heads are on a level with the emperor's feet and then the other barons sit at other tables lower still so also with the women for all the wives of the lord's sons and of his nephews and other kinsmen sit at the lower table to his right and below them again the ladies of the other barons and knights each in the place assigned by the lord's orders the tables are so disposed that the emperor can see the whole of them from end to end many as they are further you are not to suppose that everybody sits at a table on the contrary the greater part of the soldiers and their officers sit at their meal in the hall on the carpets outside the hall will be found more than forty thousand people for there is a great concourse of folk bringing presents to the lord or come from foreign countries with curiosities in a certain part of the hall near where the great khan holds his table there is set a large and very beautiful piece of workmanship in the form of a square coffer or buffet about three paces each way exquisitely wrought with figures of animals finely carved and gilt the middle is hollow and in it stands a great vessel of pure gold holding as much as an ordinary butt and at each corner of the great vessel is one of a smaller size of the capacity of a firkin and from the former the wine or beverage flavored with fine and costly spices is drawn off into the latter and on the buffet aforesaid are set all the lord's drinking vessels among which are certain pitchers of the finest gold which are called verniques and are big enough to hold drink for eight or ten persons and one of these is put between every two persons 
besides a couple of golden cups with handles, so that every man helps himself from the pitcher that stands between him and his neighbor. And the ladies are supplied in the same way. The value of these pitchers and cups is something immense. In fact, the great Khan has such a quantity of this kind of plate, and of gold and silver in other shapes, as no one ever before saw or heard tell of or could believe. There are certain barons specially deputed to see that foreigners who do not know the customs of the court are provided with places suited to their rank, and these barons are continually moving to and fro in the hall, looking to the wants of the guests at table, and causing the servants to supply them promptly with wine, milk, meat, or whatever they lack. At every door of the hall, or indeed wherever the emperor may be, there stand a couple of big men, like giants, one on each side, armed with staves. Their business is to see that no one steps upon the threshold in entering, and if this does happen, they strip the offender of his clothes, and he must pay a forfeit to have them back again or in lieu of taking his clothes they give him a certain number of blows if they are foreigners ignorant of the order then there are barons appointed to introduce them and explain it to them they think in fact that it brings bad luck if any one touches the threshold howbeit they are not expected to stick at this in going forth again for at that time some are like to be the worse for liquor and incapable of looking to their steps and you must know that those who wait upon the great Khan, with his dishes and his drink, are some of the great barons. They have the mouth and nose muffled with fine napkins of silk and gold, so that no breath nor odor from their persons should taint the dish or the goblet presented to the Lord. And when the emperor is going to drink, all the musical instruments, of which he has a vast store of every kind, begin to play, and when he takes the cup, all the barons and the rest of the company drop on their knees and make the deepest obeisance before him, and then the emperor doth drink. But each time that he does so, the whole ceremony is repeated. I will say naught about the dishes, as you may easily conceive that there is a great plenty of every possible kind. But you should know that in every case where a baron or knight dines at those tables, their wives also dine there with the other ladies. And when all have dined, and the tables have been removed, then come in a great number of players and jugglers, adepts at all sorts of wonderful feats, and perform before the emperor and the rest of the company, creating great diversion and mirth so that everybody is full of laughter and enjoyment. And when the performance is over, the company breaks up and everyone goes to his quarters. End of section 37. This recording is in the public domain. Section 38 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 38. How Kublai Khan Went A-Hunting, by Marco Polo. The Great Khan starts off the first day of March and travels southward towards the ocean sea journey of two days. He takes with him full ten thousand falconers, and some five hundred gerfalcons, besides peregrines, sakers, and other hawks in great numbers, and goshawks also to fly at the waterfowl. But do not suppose that he keeps all these together by him. They are distributed about, hither and thither, one hundred together, or two hundred at the utmost as he thinks proper. But they are always fouling as they advance, and the most part of the quarry taken is carried to the emperor. And let me tell you, when he goes thus a-fouling, 
with his gerfalcons and other hawks, he is attended by full ten thousand men who are disposed in couples. These are called toshio, which is as much as to say watchers, and the name describes their business. They are posted from spot to spot, always in couples, and thus they cover a great deal of ground. Every man of them is provided with a whistle and hood, so as to be able to call in a hawk and hold it in his hand. And when the emperor makes a cast, there is no need that he follow it up, for those men I speak of keep so good a lookout that they never lose sight of the birds. And if these have need of help, they are ready to render it. All the emperor's hawks, and those of the barons as well, have a little label attached to the leg to mark them, on which is written the names of the owner and the keeper of the bird. And in this way, the hawk, when caught, is at once identified and handed over to its owner. But if not, the bird is carried to a certain baron, who is styled the Buller Gucci, which is as much to say the keeper of lost property. And I tell you that whatever may be found without a known owner, whether it be a horse, or a sword, or a hawk, or what not, it is carried to that baron straightway, and he takes charge of it. And if the finder neglects to carry his trover to the baron, the latter punishes him. Likewise, the loser of any article goes to the baron, and if the thing be in his hands, it is immediately given up to the owner. Moreover, the said baron always pitches on the highest spot of the camp, with his banner displayed, in order that those who have lost or found anything may have no difficulty in finding their way to him. Thus, nothing can be lost, but it shall be incontinently found and restored. And so the emperor follows this road that I have mentioned, leading along in the vicinity of the ocean sea, which is within two days' journey of his capital city, Kambaluk, and as he goes there, is many a fine sight to be seen, and plenty of the very best entertainment in hawking. In fact, there is no sport in the world to equal it. The emperor himself is carried upon four elephants in a fine chamber made of timber, lined inside with plates of beaten gold, and outside with Hans' skins, for he always travels in this way on his fowling expeditions, because he is troubled with gout. He always keeps beside him a dozen of his choicest gerfalcons, and is attended by several of his barons who ride on horseback alongside. And sometimes, as they may be going along, and the emperor from his chamber is holding discourse with the barons, one of the latter shall exclaim, Sire, look out for cranes! Then the emperor instantly has the top of his chamber thrown open, and having marked the cranes, he casts one of his gerfalcons, whichever he pleases, and often the quarry is struck within his view, so that he has the more exquisite sport and diversion there as he sits in his chamber, or he's on his bed, and all the barons with him get the enjoyment of it likewise. So it is not without reason... I tell you that I do not believe there ever existed in the world, or ever will exist, a man with such sport and enjoyment as he has, or with such rare opportunities. And when he has traveled till he reaches a place called Keshar Modin, there he finds his tents pitched with the tents of his sons, and his barons, and those of his ladies, and theirs so that there shall be full ten thousand tents in all, and all fine and rich ones. And I will tell you how his own quarters are disposed. The tent in which he holds his courts is large enough to give cover easily to a thousand souls. It is pitched with its door to the south, and the barons and the knights remain in waiting in it, whilst the lord abides in another close to it on the west side. When he wishes to speak with anyone, he causes the person to be summoned to that other tent. 
immediately behind the great tent there is a fine large chamber where the lord sleeps and there are also many other tents and chambers but they are not in contact with the great tent as these are the two audience tents and the sleeping chamber are constructed in this way each of the audience tents has three poles which are of spice wood and are most artfully covered with lion skins striped with black and white and red so that they do not suffer from any weather all three apartments are also covered outside with similar skins of striped lions a substance that lasts forever and inside they are all lined with ermine and sable these two being the finest and most costly furs in existence for a robe of sable large enough to line a mantle is worth two thousand bezants of gold or one thousand at least and this kind of skin is called by the tatars the king of furs the beast itself is about the size of a marten these two furs of which i speak are applied and inlaid so exquisitely that it is really worth seeing all the tent ropes are of silk and in short i may say that those tents to wit the two audience halls and the sleeping chamber are so costly that it is not every king could pay for them round about these tents are others also fine ones and beautifully pitched in which are the emperor's ladies and the ladies of the other princes and officers and then there are the tents for the hawks and their keepers so that altogether the number of tents there on the plain is something wonderful to see the many people that are thronging to and fro on every side and every day there you would take the camp for a good big city for you must reckon the leeches and the astrologers and the falconers and all of the other attendants on so great a company and add that everybody there has his whole family with him for such is their custom the lord remains encamped there until the spring and all that time he does nothing but go hawking round about among the canebrakes along the lakes and rivers that abound in that region and across fine plains on which are plenty of cranes and swans and all sorts of other fowl the other gentry of the camp also are never done with hunting and hawking and every day they bring home great store of venison and feathered game of all sorts indeed without having witnessed it you would never believe what quantities of game are taken and what marvellous sport and diversion they all have whilst they are in camp there end of section thirty eight this recording is in the public domain Section 39 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 39. How the Khan Sent His Messages by marco polo now you must know that from this city of cambaluc proceeded many roads and highways leading to a variety of provinces one to one province another to another and each road receives the name of the province to which it leads and it is a very sensible plan and the messengers of the emperor in travelling from cambaluc be the road which soever they will, find at every twenty-five miles of a journey a station which they call Yam, or, as we should say, the horse post-house. And at each of these stations, used by the messengers, there is a large and handsome building for them to put up at, in which they find all the rooms furnished with fine beds and all other necessary articles in rich silk and where they are provided with everything they can want. 
if even a king were to arrive at one of these he would find himself well lodged at some of these stations moreover there shall be posted some four hundred horses standing ready for the use of the messengers at others there shall be two hundred according to the requirements and to what the emperor has established in each case at every twenty-five miles as i said or anyhow at every thirty miles you find one of these stations on all the principal highways leading to the different provincial governments and the same is the case throughout all the chief provinces subject to the great khan even when the messengers have to pass through a roadless tract where neither house nor hostel exists still there the station houses have been established just the same excepting that the intervals are somewhat greater and the day's journey is fixed at thirty-five to forty miles instead of twenty-five to thirty but they are provided with horses and all the other necessaries just like those we have described so that the emperor's messengers come they from what region they may find everything ready for them and in sooth this is a thing done on the greatest scale of magnificence that ever was seen never had emperor king or lord such wealth as this manifests for it is a fact that on all these posts taken together there are more than three hundred thousand horses kept up specially for the use of the messengers and the great buildings that i have mentioned are more than ten thousand in number all richly furnished as i told you the thing is on a scale so wonderful and costly that it is hard to bring one's self to describe it but now i will tell you another thing that i had forgotten but which ought to be told whilst i am on the subject you must know that by the great khan's orders there has been established between these post-houses at every interval of three miles a little fort with some forty houses round about it in which dwell the people who act as the emperor's foot-runners every one of those runners wears a great wide belt set all over with bells so that as they run the three miles from post to post their bells are heard jingling a long way off and thus on reaching the post the runner finds another man similarly equipped and all ready to take his place who instantly takes over whatsoever he has in charge and with it receives a slip of paper from the clerk who is always at hand for the purpose and so the new man sets off and runs his three miles at the next station he finds his relief ready in like manner and so the post proceeds with a change every three miles and in this way the emperor who has an immense number of these runners receives dispatches with news from places ten days journey off in one day and a night or if need be news from a hundred days off in ten days and nights and that is no small matter in fact in the fruit season many a time fruit shall be gathered one morning in Kambaluk, and the evening of the next day it shall reach the great khan at shandu a distance of ten days journey the clerk at each of the posts notes the time of each courier's arrival and departure and there are often other officers whose business it is to make monthly visitation of all the posts and to punish those runners who have been slack in their work the emperor exempts these men from all tribute and pays them besides moreover there are also at those stations other men equipped similarly with girdles hung with bells who are employed for expresses when there is a call for great haste in sending dispatches to any governor of a province or to give news when any baron has revolted or in any other such emergencies and these men travel a good two hundred or two hundred and fifty miles in the day and as much more in the night i'll tell you how it stands they take a horse from those at the station which are standing ready saddled all fresh and in wind and mount and go at full speed as hard as they can ride in fact and when those at the next post hear the bells they get ready another horse 
and a man equipped in the same way, and he takes over the letter, or whatever it may be, and is off full speed to the third station, where again a fresh horse is found already. And so the dispatch speeds along from post to post, always at full gallop with regular change of horses. And the speed at which they go is marvelous. By night, however, they cannot go so fast as by day, because they have to be accompanied by footmen with torches, who could not keep up with them at full speed. Those men are highly prized, and they could never do it, did they not bind hard the stomach, chest, and head with strong bands. And each of them carries with him a gerfalcon tablet, in sign that he is bound on an urgent express, so that if perchance his horse break down, or he meet with other mishap, whomsoever he may fall in with on that road, he is empowered to make dismount and give up his horse. Nobody dares refuse in such a case, so that the courier hath always a good fresh nag to carry him. Now all these numbers of post horses cost the emperor nothing at all, and I will tell you the how and the why. Every city or village or hamlet that stands near one of those post stations has a fixed demand made on it for as many horses as it can supply, and these it must furnish to the post, and in this way are provided all the posts of the cities, as well as the towns and villages round about them. Only in uninhabited tracts the horses are furnished at the expense of the emperor himself. Nor do the cities maintain the full number, say, of four hundred horses always at their station, but month by month two hundred shall be kept at the station, and the other two hundred at grass, coming in their turn to relieve the first two hundred. And if there chance to be some river or lake to be passed by the runners and horse posts, the neighboring cities are bound to keep three or four boats in constant readiness for that purpose. End of section 39. This recording is in the public domain. Section 40 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The King's Messenger by Chuang Tzu. Fourth century BC. Brilliant, bright, the blossoms glow on the level heights and the marshlands low. The royal messenger am I. At the king's command I can swiftly fly. Equipped with all that man may need, alert, determined to succeed. Three teams of horses, young and strong, I have to whirl my car along. My steeds are white, or grey, or pied. Well skilled am I each team to guide. We gallop till the sweat flakes stain With large wet spots each glossy rain. Each man I meet without delay Must tell me all he has to say. The realm I traverse till I bring The counsel sought for by the king. End of section 40 this recording is in the public domain. Section 41 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 41. The Polos Teach the Khan How to Capture a City. By Marco Polo. Now you must know that the city, Sayanfu, held out against the Great Khan for three years after the rest of Mansi, southern China, had surrendered. The great Khan's troops made incessant attempts to take it, but they could not succeed because of the great and deep waters that were round about it, so that they could approach from one side only, which was the north. And I tell you they never would have taken it, but for a circumstance that I am going to relate. You must know 
that when the great khan's host had lain three years before the city without being able to take it they were greatly chafed thereat then mr nicolo polo and mr maffio and mr marco said we could find you a way of forcing the city to surrender speedily whereupon those of the army replied that they would be right glad to know how that should be all this talk took place in the presence of the great khan for messengers had been dispatched from the camp to tell him that there was no taking the city by blockade for it continually received supplies of victuals from those sides which they were unable to invest and the great khan had sent back word that take it they must and find a way how then spoke up the two brothers and mr marco the son and said great prince we have with us among our followers men who are able to construct mangonels which shall cast such great stones that the garrison will never be able to stand them but will surrender incontinently as soon as the mangonels or trebuchets shall have shot into the town the khan bade them with all his heart have such mangonels made as speedily as possible now mr nicolo and his brother and his son immediately caused timber to be brought as much as they desired and fit for the work in hand and they had two men among their followers a german and an historian christian who were masters of that business and these they directed to construct two or three mangonels capable of casting stones of three hundred pounds weight accordingly they made three fine mangonels each of which cast stones of three hundred pounds weight and more and when they were complete and ready for use the emperor and the others were greatly pleased to see them and caused several stones to be shot in their presence whereat they marvelled greatly and greatly praised the work and the khan ordered that the engine should be carried to his army which was at the leaguer of sanfu and when the engines were gotten to the camp they were forthwith set up to the great admiration of the tartars and what shall i tell you when the engines were set up and put in gear a stone was shot from each of them into the town these took effect among the buildings crashing and smashing through everything with huge din and commotion and when the townspeople witnessed this new and strange visitation they were so astonished and dismayed that they knew not what to do or say they took counsel together but no counsel could be suggested how to escape from these engines for the things seemed to them to be done by sorcery they declared that they were all dead men if they yielded not so they determined to surrender on such conditions as they could get wherefore they straightway sent word to the commander of the army that they were ready to surrender on the same terms as the other cities of the province had done and to become the subjects of the great khan and to this the captain of the host consented so the men of the city surrendered and were received to terms and this all came about through the exertions of mr nicolo and mr maffio and mr marco and it was no small matter for this city and province is one of the best that the great khan possesses and brings him in great revenues end of section forty one this recording is in the public domain section forty two of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Schmidt. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 42. A Chinese City at the End of the 13th Century. By Marco Polo. When you have left the city of Chang'an, and have travelled for three days through a splendid country passing a number of towns and villages you arrive at the most noble city of kinsai hang chau a name which is as much as to say in our tongue the city of heaven and since we have got thither i will enter into particulars about its magnificence and these are well worth the telling for the city is beyond dispute the finest and the noblest in the world in this we shall speak according to the written statement which the queen of this realm sent to bayan the conqueror of the country for transmission to the great khan in order that he might be aware of the surpassing grandeur of the city and might be moved to save it from destruction or injury 
I will tell you all the truth as it was set down in that document. For truth it was, as the said Messer Marco Polo, at a later date, was able to witness with his own eyes. And now we shall rehearse these particulars. First and foremost, then, the document stated the city of Kinsai to be so great that it has a hundred miles of compass, and there are in it twelve thousand bridges of stone, for the most part so lofty that a great fleet could pass beneath them. And let no man marvel that there are so many bridges, for you see, the whole city stands, as it were, in the water and surrounded by water, so that a great many bridges are required to give free passage about it. And though the bridges be so high, the approaches are so well contrived that carts and horses do cross them. The document aforesaid also went on to state that there were in this city twelve guilds of the different crafts, and that each guild had twelve thousand houses in the occupation of its workmen. Each of these houses contains at least twelve men, whilst some contain twenty and some forty. Not that these are all masters, but inclusive of the journeymen, who work under the masters. And yet all these craftsmen had full occupation, for many other cities of the kingdom are supplied from this city with what they require. The document aforesaid also stated that the number and wealth of the merchants, and the amount of goods that passed through their hands, was so enormous that no man could form a just estimate thereof. And I should have told you with regard to those masters of the different crafts, who are at the head of such houses as I have mentioned, that neither they nor their wives ever touch a piece of work with their own hands, but live as nicely and delicately as if they were kings and queens. The wives, indeed, are most dainty and angelic creatures. Moreover, it was an ordinance laid down by the king that every man should follow his father's business, and no other, no matter if he possessed one hundred thousand peasants. Inside of the city there is a lake which has a compass of some thirty miles, and all around it are erected beautiful palaces and mansions of the richest and most exquisite structure that you can imagine, belonging to the nobles of the city. There are also on its shores many abbeys and churches of the idolaters. In the middle of the lake are two islands, on each of which stands a rich, beautiful and spacious edifice, furnished in such style as to seem fit for the palace of an emperor. And when any one of the citizens desired to hold a marriage feast or to give any other entertainment, it used to be done at one of these palaces and everything would be found there ready to order, such as silver plate, trenchers and dishes, napkins and tablecloths, and whatever else was needful. The king made this provision for the gratification of his people, and the place was open to every one who desired to give an entertainment. Sometimes there would be at these palaces a hundred different parties, some holding a banquet, others celebrating a wedding, and yet all would find good accommodation in the different apartments and pavilions, and that in so well-ordered a manner that one party was never in the way of another. The houses of the city are provided with lofty towers of stone, in which articles of value are stored for fear of fire, for most of the houses themselves are of timber, and fires are very frequent in the city. The people are idolaters, and since they were conquered by the great Khan, they use paper money. Both men and women are fair and comely, and for the most part clothe themselves in silk, so vast is the supply of that material both from the whole district of Kinsai and from the imports by traders from other provinces. And you must know they eat every kind of flesh, even that of dogs and other unclean beasts, which nothing would induce a Christian to eat. Since the great Khan occupied the city, he has ordained that each of the twelve thousand bridges should be provided with a guard of ten men, in case of any disturbance, or of any being so rash as to plot treason or insurrection against him. Each guard is provided with a hollow instrument of wood, and with a metal basin, and with a timekeeper, to enable them to know the hour of the day or night. And so, when one hour of the night is passed, the sentry strikes one on the wooden instrument and on the basin so that the whole quarter of the city is made aware that one hour of the night is gone. At the second hour he gives two strokes, and so on, keeping always wide awake and on the lookout. In the morning again from the sunrise, 
they begin to count anew and strike one hour as they did in the night and so on hour after hour part of the watch patrols the quarter to see if any light or fire is burning after the lawful hours if they find any they mark the door and in the morning the owner is summoned before the magistrates and unless he can plead a good excuse he is punished also if they find anyone going about the streets at unlawful hours they arrest him and in the morning they bring him before the magistrates likewise if in the daytime they find any poor cripple unable to work for his livelihood they take him to one of the hospitals of which there are many founded by the ancient kings and endowed with great revenues or if he be capable of work they oblige him to take up some trade if they see that any house has caught fire they immediately beat upon that wooden instrument to give the alarm and this brings together the watchmen from the other bridges to help to extinguish it and to save the goods of the merchants or others either by removing them to the towers above mentioned or by putting them in boats and transporting them to the islands in the lake for no citizen dares leave his house at night or to come near the fire only those who own the property and those watchmen who flock to help of whom there shall come one or two thousand at the least moreover within the city there is an eminence on which stands a tower and at the top of the tower is hung a slab of wood whenever fire or any other alarm breaks out in the city a man who stands there with a mallet in his hand beats upon the slab making a noise that is heard to a great distance so when the blows upon this slab are heard everybody is aware that fire has broken out or that there is some cause of alarm all the streets of the city are paved with stone or brick as indeed are all the highways throughout manzi so that you ride and travel in every direction without inconvenience were it not for this pavement you could not do so for the country is very low and flat and after rain it is deep in mire and water but as the great khan's couriers could not gallop their horses over the pavement the side of the road is left unpaved for their convenience the pavement of the main street of the city also is laid out in two parallel ways of ten paces in width on either side leaving a space in the middle laid with fine gravel under which are vaulted drains which convey the rain water into the canals and thus the road is kept ever dry you must know also that the city of kinsai has some three thousand baths the water of which is supplied by springs they are hot baths and the people take great delight in them frequenting them several times a month for they are very cleanly in their persons they are the finest and largest baths in the world large enough for one hundred persons to bathe together when any one dies the friends and relations make a great mourning for the deceased and clothe themselves in hempen garments and follow the corpse playing on a variety of instruments and singing hymns to their idols and when they come to the burning place they take representations of things cut out of parchment such as caparisoned horses male and female slaves camels armor suits of cloth of gold and money in great quantities and these things they put on the fire along with the corpse so that they are all burned with it and they tell you that the dead man shall have all these slaves and animals of which the effigies are burned alive in flesh and blood and the money in gold at his disposal in the next world and that the instruments which they have caused to be played at his funeral and the idle hymns that have been chanted shall also be produced again to welcome him in the next world and that the idols themselves will come to do him honour furthermore there exists in this city a palace of the king who fled him who was emperor of manzi and that is the greatest palace in the world as i shall tell you more particularly for you must know its domain has a compass of ten miles all enclosed with lofty battlemented walls and inside the walls are the finest and most delectable gardens upon earth and filled with the finest fruits there are numerous fountains in it also and lakes full of fish in the middle is the palace itself a great and splendid building it contains twenty great and handsome halls one of which is more spacious than the rest and affords room for a vast multitude to dine it is all painted in gold 
with many histories and representations of beasts and birds, of knights and dames, and many marvellous things. It forms a really magnificent spectacle, for over all the walls and all the ceiling you see nothing but paintings in gold. And besides these halls, the palace contains one thousand large and handsome chambers, all painted in gold and diverse colours. There is one church only, belonging to the Nestorian Christians. There is another thing I must tell you. It is the custom for every burgess of this city, and in fact for every description of person in it, to write over his door his own name, the name of his wife, and those of his children, his slaves, and all the inmates of his house, and also the number of animals that he keeps. And if any one dies in the house, then the name of that person is erased, and if any child is born, its name is added. So in this way, the sovereign is able to know exactly the population of the city, and this is the practice also throughout all Manzi and Cathay. And I must tell you that every hosteler who keeps a hostel for travellers is bound to register their names and surnames, as well as the day and month of their arrival and departure, and thus the sovereign has the means of knowing, whenever it pleases him, who come and go throughout his dominions, and certs, this is a wise order and a provident. End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Ready for LibriVox.org by Brianna. The Peking Observatory. Photograph page 128. In the 13th century, 300 years before the birth of Galileo, and at a time when Europe was just emerging from the Dark Ages, this astronomical observatory was erected by the Mongol emperors. The instrument shown in this picture is made of solid bronze. It is of huge dimensions, and the beautiful workmanship shows that even in that early age, the art of casting had been carried to perfection by the Chinese. The outer framework is a heavy metal horizon, divided into twelve equal parts for the twelve hours into which the Chinese divide their day and night, and also marked to designate the points of the compass. The inside of the ring bears the names of the twelve states into which which China was anciently divided, every part of the empire being supposed to be under the influence of a particular quarter of the heavens. Within this is a complicated arrangement of circles and elliptics illustrating the various movements of the earth and planets, and divided into portions representing the constellations and the months and days of the year. In the center is a revolving tube for taking sights, and at the four corners are miniature rocks of bronze marked Northwest Mountain, Southwest Mountain, Southeast Mountain, and Northeast Mountain. An interesting touch of superstition is given by the four dragons which uphold the instrument and are chained to the earth to prevent their flying away. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. China, Part 7. Chinese Fables and Tales. Historical Note. Chinese literature is richest in histories, commentaries on the classics, and poetry. One of its most striking features is the colossal scale on which works have been compiled. An official history, completed in 1633, comprised 3,706 books, a collection of the Chinese classics, with their commentaries begun by the Emperor Qin Long, is said to have numbered 180,000 volumes and an anthology published in 1707 contained nearly 50,000 poems arranged in 900 volumes. 
most remarkable of all is an encyclopedia of history, philosophy, and literature, ordered by the third emperor of the Ming dynasty. More than two thousand writers labored on this for five years, and the result was a work of nine hundred and seventeen thousand four hundred and eighty pages, the equivalent of about four hundred and eighty nine million two hundred and twenty six thousand English words. This extraordinary work was never published owing to lack of money, but three copies were made by hand, all of which have since perished. However, as with us, while the classics are respected and studied in school, the great mass of people depend on stories for their reading. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Andrea The Boy Philosopher by Unknown There was a wealthy man of Qi named Tian Tzu who daily fed a thousand people in his own mansion. Among them was one who reverently presented his host with a fish and a goose. Tian Tzu looked at the offering and sighed. How bountiful, he exclaimed, is heaven to men. It gives us the nutritious grain for food and produces birds and fishes for our use. All the guests applauded this pious sentiment to the echo, except the young son of a certain Mr. Pao, a lad of twelve years old who, leaving his back seat and running forward, said, You would be nearer the truth, sir, if you said that heaven, earth, and everything else belong to the same category, and that therefore nothing in that category is superior to the rest. The only difference which exists is a matter of size, intelligence, and strength, by virtue of which all these things act and prey upon each other. So it is quite a mistake to say that one is created for the sake of others. Whatever a man can get to eat, he eats. How can it be that heaven originally intended it for the use of men, and therefore created it? Besides, we all know that gnats and mosquitoes suck our skins, and tigers and wolves devour our flesh, so that, according to your theory, we were ourselves created by heaven for the special benefit of gnats and mosquitoes, tigers and wolves. Do you believe that, pray, End of section 45. This recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Ready for LibriVox.org by Brianna. The Elixir of Life. Once upon a time, it was reported that there was a person who professed to have the secret of immortality. The king of Yen, therefore, sent messengers to inquire about it. But they dawdled on the road, and before they had arrived at their destination, the man was already dead. Then the king was very angry and sought to slay the messengers. But his favorite minister expostulated with him, saying, There is nothing which causes greater sorrow to men than death. There is nothing they value more highly than life. Now, the very man who said he possessed the secret of immortality is dead himself. How then could he have prevented your majesty from dying? So the man's lives were spared. End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Hale. The Tiger and the Monkey by Unknown. A tiger, having clapped his paw, on an unlucky monkey. The latter begged to be released on the score of his insignificance. 
and promised to show the tiger where he might find more valuable prey. The tiger complied, and the monkey conducted him to a hillside where an ass was feeding, an animal which the tiger till then had never seen. My good brother, said the ass to the monkey, hitherto you have always brought me two tigers. How is it that you have only brought me one today? Hearing these words, the tiger fled for his life. Thus ready wit may often ward off great dangers. End of section 47. This recording is in the public domain. Section 48 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Was he the only cheat? By unknown. At Hang Chow there lived a costermonger who understood how to keep oranges a whole year without letting them spoil. His fruit was always fresh looking, firm as jade, and of a beautiful golden hue, but inside, dry as an old cocoon. One day I asked him, saying, Are your oranges for altar or sacrificial purposes, or for show at banquets, or do you make this outside display merely to cheat the foolish, as cheat them you most outrageously do? Sir, replied the orangeman, I have carried on this trade now for many years. It is my source of livelihood. I sell, the world buys, and I have yet to learn that you are the only honest man about, and that I am the only cheat. Perhaps it never struck you in this light. The baton bearers of today, seated on their tiger skins, pose as the martial guardians of the state. But what are they compared with the captains of old? The broad brimmed, long robed ministers of today pose as pillars of the Constitution. But have they the wisdom of our ancient counselors? Evil doers arise, and none can subdue them. The people are in misery, and none can relieve them. Clerks are corrupt, and none can restrain them. Laws decay, and none can renew them. Our officials eat the bread of the state, and know no shame. They sit in lofty halls, ride fine steeds, drink themselves drunk with wine, and batten on the richest fare. Which of them but puts on an awe-inspiring look, a dignified mien? All gold and gems without, but dry cocoons within. You pay, sir, no heed to these things, while you are very particular about my oranges. I had no answer to make. I retired to ponder over this costermonger's wit. Was he really out of conceit with the age, or only quizzing me in defense of his fruit? End of section 48. This recording is in the public domain. Section 49 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. The Appeal of Lady Chang. May it please your majesty. My husband was a censor attached to the Board of Rights. For his folly in recklessly advising your majesty, he deserved indeed a thousand deaths. Yet, under the imperial clemency, he was doomed only to await his sentence in prison. Since then, fourteen years have passed away. His aged parents are still alive, but there are no children in his hall, and the wretched man has none on whom he can rely. I alone remain, a lodger at an inn, working day and night at my needle to provide the necessaries of life, encompassed on all sides by difficulties to whom every day seems a year. My father-in-law is eighty-seven years of age. He trembles on the brink of the grave. He is like a candle in the wind. I have not wherewith to nourish him alive, or to honor him when dead. I am a lone woman. If I tend the one, I lose the other. If I return to my father-in-law, my husband will die of starvation. If I remain to feed him, 
My father-in-law may die at any hour. My husband is a criminal bound in jail. He dares give no thought to his home. Yet can it be when all living things are rejoicing in life under the wise and generous rule of today, we alone should taste the cup of poverty and distress and find ourselves beyond the pale of universal peace. Oft, as I think of these things, the desire to die comes upon me. But I swallow my grief and live on, trusting in providence for some happy termination, some moistening with the dew of imperial grace. And now that my father-in-law is face to face with death, now that my husband can hardly expect to live, I venture to offer this body as a hostage, to be bound in prison, while my husband returns to watch over the last hours of his father. Then, when all is over, he will resume his place and await your majesty's pleasure. Thus, my husband will greet his father once again, and the feelings of father and child will be in some measure relieved. Thus, I shall give to my father-in-law the comfort of his son, and the duty of a wife towards her husband will be fulfilled. Lady Chang won her petition, and her husband was released. End of section 49. This recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava Mark. Tapan. Section 50. The Soul of the Great Bell by Lafcadio Hearn. The water clock marks the hour in the Tachungse, in the tower of the Great Bell. Now the mallet is lifted to smite the lips of the metal monster, the vast lips inscribed with Buddhist texts from the sacred Tahua King, from the chapters of the holy Ling Yen King. Here, the great bell responding, how mighty her voice, though tongueless, Ko Nagai! All the little dragons, on the high-tilted eaves of the green roofs, shiver to the tips of their gilded tails under that deep wave of sound. All the porcelain gargoyles tremble on their carven perches all the hundred little bells of the pagodas quiver with desire to speak ko nagai all the green and gold tiles of the temple are vibrating the wooden goldfish above them are writhing against the sky the uplifted finger of fo shakes high over the heads of the worshippers through the blue fog of incense. Ko Nagai! What a thunder tone was that! All the lacquered goblins on the palace cornices wriggle their fire-coloured tongues, and after each huge shock, how wondrous the multiple echo and the great golden moan, and, at last, the sudden sibilant sobbing in the ears when the immense tone faints away in broken whispers of silver, as though a woman should whisper, Yai! Even so, the great bell hath sounded every day for well nigh five hundred years. Ko Nagai! First with stupendous clang, then with immeasurable moan of gold, then with silver murmuring of hi and there is not a child in all the many-coloured ways of the old chinese city who does not know the story of the great bell who cannot tell you why the great bell says 
Ko Nagai and Hai. Now, this is the story of the great bell in the Tachungse, as the same is related in the Pe Hiao To Choi, written by the learned Yu Pao Chen of the city of Kwang Chao Fu. Nearly five hundred years ago, the celestially august, the son of heaven, Yong Lo, of the illustrious or Ming dynasty, commanded the worthy official, Kuan Yu, that he should have a bell made of such size that the sound thereof might be heard for one hundred li. And he further ordained that the voice of the bell should be strengthened with brass and deepened with gold and sweetened with silver, and that the face and the great lips of it should be graven with blessed sayings from the sacred books, and that it should be suspended in the centre of the imperial capital to sound through all the many-coloured ways of the city of Peking. Therefore the worthy Mandarin, Kuan Yu, assembled the master moulders and the renowned bellsmiths of the empire, and all men of great repute and cunning in foundry work, and they measured the materials for the alloy, and treated them skilfully, and prepared the moulds, the fires, the instruments, and the monstrous melting pot for fusing the metal. And they laboured exceedingly like giants, neglecting only rest and sleep, and the comforts of life, toiling both night and day in obedience to Kuan Yu, and striving in all things to do the behest of the Son of Heaven. But when the metal had been cast, and the earthen mould separated from the glowing casting, it was discovered that, despite their great labour and ceaseless care, the result was void of work, for the metals had rebelled one against the other. The gold had scorned alliance with the brass, the silver would not mingle with the molten iron, Therefore the moulds had to be once more prepared, and the fires rekindled, and the metal remelted, and all the work tediously and toilsomely repeated. The Son of Heaven heard, and was angry, but spake nothing. A second time the bell was cast, and the result was even worse. Still the metals obstinately refused to blend one with the other, and there was no uniformity in the bell, and the sides of it were cracked and fissured, and the lips of it were slagged and split asunder, so that all the labour had to be repeated even a third time, to the great dismay of Kuan Yu. And when the Son of Heaven heard these things, he was angrier than before, and sent his messenger to Kuan Yu with a letter, written upon lemon-coloured silk, and sealed with the seal of the dragon, containing these words. From the mighty Yong Lo, the sublime Tai Tsung, the celestial and august, whose reign is called Ming, to Kuan Yu, the Fu Yin, twice thou hast betrayed the trust we have deigned graciously, to place in thee, if thou fail a third time in fulfilling a command, thy head shall be severed from thy neck. Tremble and obey. Now Kuan Yu had a daughter of dazzling loveliness, whose name, Ko Nagai, was ever in the mouths of poets, and whose heart was even more beautiful than her face. Ko Nagai loved her father with such love that she had refused a hundred worthy suitors rather than make his home desolate by her absence. And when she had seen the awful yellow missive sealed with the dragon seal, she fainted away with fear for her father's sake. And when her senses and her strength returned to her, she could not rest or sleep 
for thinking of her parents' danger, until she had secretly sold some of her jewels, and with the money so obtained, had hastened to an astrologer, and paid him a great price to advise her by what means her father might be saved from the peril impending over him. So the astrologer made observations of the heavens, and marked the aspect of the silver stream, which we call the Milky Way, and examined the signs of the zodiac, the Huang Tao, or yellow road, and consulted the table of the five Hin, or principles of the universe, and the mystical books of the alchemists, and after a long silence he made answer to her, saying, Gold and brass will never meet in wedlock, silver and iron never will embrace, until the flesh of a maiden be melted in the crucible, until the blood of a virgin be mixed with the metals in their fusion. So Kornagai returned home sorrowful at heart, but she kept secret all that she had heard, and told no one what she had done. At last came the awful day, when the third and last effort to cast the great bell was to be made, and Kod Nagai, together with her waiting woman, accompanied her father to the foundry, and they took their places upon a platform overlooking the toiling of the moulders and the lava of liquefied metal. All the workmen wrought their tasks in silence. There was no sound heard but the muttering of the fires, and the muttering deepened into a roar like the roar of typhoons approaching, and the blood-red lake of metal slowly brightened like the vermilion of a sunrise, and the vermilion was transmuted into a radiant glow of gold, and the gold whitened blindingly like the silver face of a full moon. Then the workers ceased to feed the raving flame, and all fixed their eyes upon the eyes of Kuan Yu, and Kuan Yu prepared to give the signal to cast. But ere ever he lifted his finger, a cry caused him to turn his head, and all heard the voice of Ko Nagai sounding sharply sweet as a bird's song above the great thunder of the fires. For thy sake, O my father! And even as she cried, she leaped into the white flood of metal, and the lava of the furnace roared to receive her, and spattered monstrous flakes of flame to the roof, and burst over the verge of the earthen crater, and cast up a whirling fountain of many-coloured fires, and subsided quakingly with lightnings, and with thunders, and with mutterings. Then the father of Konagai, wild with his grief, would have leaped after her, but that strong men held him back, and kept firm grasp upon him, until he had fainted dead away, and they could bear him like one dead to his home. And the serving-woman of Konagai, dizzy and speechless for pain, stood before the furnace, still holding in her hands a shoe, a tiny, dainty shoe, with embroidery of pearls and flowers, the shoe of her beautiful mistress that was. For she had sought to grasp Konagai by the foot as she leaped, but had only been able to clutch the shoe, and the pretty shoe came off in her hand, and she continued to stare at it like one gone mad. But in spite of all these things, the command of the celestial and august had to be obeyed, and the work of the moulders to be finished, hopeless as the result might be. Yet the glow of the metal seemed purer and whiter than before, and there was no sign of the beautiful body that had been entombed therein. So the ponderous casting was made, and lo, when the metal had become cool, it was found that the bell was beautiful to look upon, and perfect in form, and wonderful in colour above all other bells. Nor was there any trace found of the body of Konagai, for it had been totally absorbed by the precious alloy, and blended with the well-blended brass and gold 
with the intermingling of the silver and the iron and when they sounded the bell its tones were found to be deeper and mellower and mightier than the tones of any other bell reaching even beyond the distance of one hundred li like a pealing of summer thunder and yet also like some vast voice uttering a name a woman's name the name of konagai and still between each mighty stroke there is a long low moaning heard and ever the moaning ends with a sound of sobbing and of complaining as though a weeping woman should murmur hi and still when the people hear that great golden moan they keep silence but when the sharp sweet shuddering comes in the air and the sobbing of Ey! then indeed do all the chinese mothers in all the many-coloured ways of peking whisper to the little ones listen that is konagai crying for her shoe that is konagai calling for her shoe End of section 50. This recording is in the public domain. Section 51 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Engineer STL. China, Part 8. The Coming of the Missionaries. Historical Note. Just when Christianity first made its way to China is not known. There is a tradition that St. Thomas traveled far to the east, but the first Christian preaching that is recorded took place in the 7th century. The missionaries were of the sect known as Nestorians. No one has ever found any of their books or writings in China, but a thousand years after they are said to have come to the country, some workmen in northwestern China who were digging a trench came upon a slab of stone on which was writing, partly in Chinese and partly in Syriac letters used by Nestorians. This told of the work of the Nestorians, of the buildings of churches, and of the emperors who favored the faith. In the 13th century, a few Franciscan missionaries braved the perilous journey and made many converts, but with the fall of the Mongol dynasty, Christianity for a second time vanished and was not again preached in China until the 16th century, this time by the Jesuits. At first their teaching met with success, but with the coming of the Dominicans and Franciscans, disputes arose which greatly discredited the new religion among the Chinese, for they could not understand why teachers of the same faith should quarrel among themselves. At last the emperor's patience was exhausted, and he ordered all friars, except those needed for his imperial observatory, to be killed. The first Protestant missionary arrived in China in 1807. End of section 51. This recording is in the public domain. Section 52 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific read for LibriVox.org by Engineer STL, An Enterprising Missionary by John of Corvino. In the 13th and 14th centuries, the Franciscans made their way to the east. One of them, the John of Corvino, who gives the following account of his efforts, worked in entirely alone for 11 years. The Editor I, Brother John, of Mount Corvine, of the order of minor friars, made my way to Cathay, the realm of the emperor of the Tartars, who is called the Grand Khan. To him I presented the letter of our Lord the Pope, and invited him to adopt the Catholic faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he had grown too old in idolatry. However, he bestows many kindnesses upon the Christians, and these two years past I am abiding with him. I have built a church in the city of Peking, in which the king has his chief residence. This I completed six years ago, and I have built a bell tower to it and put three bells in it. I have baptized there, as well as I can estimate, 
up to this time some 6,000 persons. Also I have gradually bought 150 boys, the children of pagan parents, and of ages varying from 7 to 11, who had never learned any religion. These boys I have baptized, and I have taught them Greek and Latin after our manner. Also I have written out psalters for them, with thirty hymnaries and two breveries. By help of these, eleven of the boys already know our service, and form a choir, and take their weekly turn of duty as they do in convents, whether I am there or not. Many of the boys are also employed in writing out psalters and other things suitable. His Majesty the Emperor moreover delights much to hear them chanting. I have the bells rung at all the canonical hours, and with my congregation of babes and sucklings I perform divine service, and the chanting we do by ear because I have no service book with the notes. I beg the Minister General of our order to supply me with the antiphonarium, with the legend of the saints, a gradual, and a psalter with the musical notes as a copy. For I have nothing but a pocket breviary, with the short lessons and a little missile. If I had one for a copy, the boys of whom I have spoken could transcribe others from it. Just now I am building a church with the view of distributing the boys in more places than one. I have grown old and gray, more with toil and trouble than with years, for I am not more than fifty-eight. I have a competent knowledge of the language and character which is most generally used by the Tartars, and I have already translated into that language and character the New Testament and the Psalter, and have caused them to be written out in the fairest penmanship they have. And so by writing, reading, and preaching, I bear open and public testimony to the law of Christ. End of section 52. This recording is in the public domain. Section 53 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. The World's Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section fifty three the woman with the cross by mendez pinto chained together as we were we went up and down the streets craving of alms which were very liberally given us by the inhabitants who wondering to see such men as we demanded of us what kind of people we were of what kingdom and how our country was called hereunto we answered conformably to what we had said before namely that we were natives of the kingdom of siam that going from liampu to nanquin we had lost all our goods by shipwreck and that although they beheld us then in so poor a case yet we had formerly been very rich whereupon a woman who was come thither among the rest to see us it is very likely said she speaking to them about her that what these poor strangers have related is most true for daily experience doth show how those that trade by sea do oftentimes make it their grave wherefore it is best and surest to travel upon the earth and to esteem of it as of that whereof it has pleased god to frame us saying so she gave us two mazes which amounts to about sixteen pence of our money advising us to make no more such long voyages since our lives were so short hereupon she unbuttoned one of the sleeves of a red satin gown she had on and bearing her left arm she showed us a cross imprinted upon it like the mark of a slave do any of you know this sign which amongst those that follow the way of truth is called a cross or have any of you heard it named to this falling down on our knees we answered with tears in our eyes that we knew exceeding well then lifting up her hands she cried out our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name speaking these words in the 
portugal tongue and because she could speak no more of our language she very earnestly desired us in chinese to tell her whether we were christians we replied that we were and for proof thereof after we had kissed that arm whereon the cross was we repeated all the rest of the lord's prayer which she had left unsaid wherewith being assured that we were christians indeed she drew aside from the rest there present and weeping said to us come along christians of the other end of the world with her that is your true sister in the faith of jesus christ or peradventure a kinswoman to one of you by his side that begot me in this miserable exile and so going to carry us to her house the hoopus which guarded us would not suffer her saying that if we would not continue our craving of alms they would return us back to the ship but this they spake in regard of their own interest for that they were to have the moiety of what was given us and accordingly they made as though they would have led us thither again which the woman perceiving i understand your meaning said she and indeed it is but reason you should make the best of your places for thereby you live so opening her purse she gave them two tias in silver wherewith they were very well satisfied whereupon she carried us home to her house and there kept us all the while we remained in that place making much of us and using us very charitably here she showed us an oratory wherein she had a cross of wood gilt as also candlesticks and a lamp of silver furthermore she told us that she was named inez de laria and her father tome pires who had been great ambassador from portugal to the king of china and that in regard of an insurrection with a portuguese captain made at canton the chineses taking him for a spy and not for an ambassador as he termed himself clapped him and all his followers up in prison where by order of justice five of them were put to torture receiving so many such cruel stripes on their bodies as they died instantly and the rest were all banished into several parts together with her father into this place where he married with her mother that had some means and how he made her a christian living so seven and twenty years together and converting many gentiles to the faith of christ whereof there were above three hundred then abiding in that town which every sunday assembled in her house to say the catechism whereupon demanding of her what were their accustomed prayers she answered that she used no other but these which on their knees with their eyes and hands lift up to heaven they pronounced in this manner o lord jesus christ as it is most true that thou art the very son of god conceived by the holy ghost of the virgin mary for the salvation of sinners so thou wilt be pleased to forgive us our offences that thereby we may become worthy to behold thy face in the glory of thy kingdom where thou art sitting at the right hand of the almighty our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost amen and so all of them kissing the cross embraced one another and thereupon every one returned to his own home moreover she told us that her father had left her many other prayers which the chineses had stolen from her so that she had none left but those before recited whereunto we replied that those we had heard from her were very good but before we went away we would leave her divers other good and wholesome prayers do so then answered she for the respect you owe to so good a god as yours is and that hath done such things for you for me and all in general then causing the cloth to be laid she gave us a very good and plentiful dinner and treated us in like sort every meal during the five days we continued in her house which was permitted by the 
chiffiu in regard of a present that this good woman sent his wife whom she earnestly entreated so to deal with her husband as we might be well entreated for that we were men of whom god had a particular care as the chiffiu's wife promised her to do with many thanks to her for the present she had received in the mean space during the five days we remained in her house we read the catechism seven times to the christians wherewithal they were very much edified besides christoforo borbalho made them a little book in the chinese tongue containing the pater noster the creed the ten commandments and many other good prayers after these things we took our leaves of inez de leria and the christians who gave us fifty tias in silver which stood us since in good stead and withal inez de leria gave us secretly fifty tias more humbly desiring us to remember her in our prayers to god end of section fifty three this recording is in the public domain recorded by jim locke section number fifty four of china japan and the islands of the pacific ready for librivox dot org by brianna the worship of ancestors by w a p martin one of the greatest difficulties met by the missionaries in trying to convert the chinese was that if they became christians they would be obliged to give up worshipping their ancestors and offering up prayers to them this was a most important matter. One Wu Wang, who founded the famous Chao dynasty in which Confucius lived, declared that it was right to rebel against the former emperor, because with all his other misdeeds, he had even neglected to offer up the proper sacrifices at the tombs of his ancestors. The Editor Every household has somewhere within its doors a small shrine in which are deposited the tablets of ancestors and of all deceased members of the family who have passed the age of infancy each clan has its ancestral temple which forms a rallying point for all who belong to the common stock in such temples as in the smaller shrines the household the objects of reverence are not images but tablets slips of wood inscribed with the name of the deceased together with the dates of birth and death in these tablets according to popular belief dwell the spirits of the dead before them ascends the smoke of a daily incense and twice in the month offerings of fruits and other eatables are presented accompanied by solemn prostrations in some cases particularly during a period of mourning the members of the family salute the dead morning and evening as they do the living and on special occasions such as marriage or a funeral there are religious services of a more elaborate character accompanied sometimes by feasts and theatrical shows Besides worship in presence of the representative tablet, periodical rites are performed at the family cemetery. In spring and autumn, when the mildness of the air is such as to invite excursions, city families are wont to choose a day for visiting the resting places of their dead, clearing away the grass and covering the tombs with a layer of fresh earth they present offerings and perform acts of worship this done they pass the rest of the day in enjoying the scenery of the country end of section 54 this recording is in the public domain section 55 of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia 
the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section fifty five teaching science to the emperor by pere du halde in the sixteenth century ricci a jesuit missionary came to china and was followed by others of the same order they showed a great amount of tact in dealing with the natives the following account explains one method by which they made their way the editor this nation naturally proud looked upon themselves as the most learned in the world and they enjoyed this reputation without disturbance because they were acquainted with no other people more knowing than themselves but they were undeceived by the ingenuity of the missionaries who appeared at court the proof which they gave of their capacity served greatly to authorize their ministry and to gain esteem for the religion which they preached the late emperor kang he whose chief delight was to acquire knowledge was never weary of seeing or hearing them on the other hand the jesuits perceiving how necessary the protection of this great prince was to the progress of the gospel omitted nothing that might excite his curiosity and satisfy this natural relish for the sciences they gave him an insight into optics by making him a present of a semi-cylinder of a light kind of wood in the middle of its axis was placed a convex glass which being turned toward any object painted the image within the tube to a great nicety the emperor was greatly pleased with so unusual a sight and desired to have a machine made in his garden at peking wherein without being seen himself he might see everything that passed in the streets and neighbouring places they prepared for this purpose an object glass of much greater diameter and made in the thickest garden wall a great window in the shape of a pyramid the basis of which was towards the garden and the point toward the street at the point they fixed the glass eye over against the place where there was the greatest concourse of people at the basis was made a large closet shut up close on all sides and very dark it was there the emperor came with his queens to observe the lively images of everything that passed in the street and this sight pleased him extremely but it charmed the princesses a great deal more who could not otherwise behold this spectacle the custom of china not allowing them to go out of the palace pere grimaldi gave another wonderful spectacle by his skill in optics in the jesuits garden at peking which greatly astonished the grandees of the emperor they made upon the four walls four human figures every one being of the same length as the wall which was fifty feet as he had perfectly observed the optic rules there was nothing seen on the front but mountains forests chases and other things of this nature but at a certain point they perceived the figure of a man well made and well proportioned the emperor honoured the jesuit's house with his presence and beheld these figures a long time with admiration the grandees and principal mandarins who came in crowds were equally surprised but that which struck them most was to see the figures so regular and so exact upon irregular walls that in several places had large windows and doors it would be too tedious to mention all the figures that seemed in confusion and yet were seen distinctly at a certain point or were put in order with conic cylindric pyramidal mirrors and the many other wonders in optics that pere grimaldi discovered to the finest geniuses in china and which raised their surprise and wonder in catoptrics they presented the emperor with all sorts of telescopes as well for astronomical observation as for taking great and small distances upon the earth and likewise glasses for diminishing magnifying and multiplying 
among other things they presented him with a tube made like a prism having eight sides which being placed parallel with the horizon presented eight different scenes so lifelike that they might be mistaken for the objects themselves this being joined to the variety of painting entertained the emperor a long time they likewise presented another tube wherein was a polygon glass which by its different facets collected into one image several parts of different objects insomuch that instead of a landscape woods flocks and a hundred other things represented in a picture there was seen distinctly a human face or some other figure very exact there was also another machine which contained a lighted lamp the light of which came through a tube at the end whereof was a convex glass near which several small pieces of glass painted with divers figures were made to slide these figures were seen upon the opposite wall of a size proportioned to the size of the wall this spectacle in the night-time or in a very dark place frightened those who were ignorant of the artifice as much as it pleased those who were acquainted with it on this account they have given it the name of the magic lantern nor was the perspective forgotten pere bruglio gave the emperor three draughts wherein the rules were exactly kept he showed three copies of the same in the jesuits garden at peking the mandarins who flocked to this city from all parts came to see them out of curiosity and were all equally struck with the sight they could not conceive how it was possible on a plain cloth to represent halls galleries porticoes roads and alleys that seemed to reach as far as the eye could see and all this so naturally that at the first sight they were deceived by it statics likewise had its turn they offered the emperor a machine the principal parts of which were only four notched wheels and an iron grapple with the help of this machine a child raised several thousand weight without difficulty and stood firm against the efforts of twenty strong men with respect to hydrostatics they made for the emperor pumps canals siphons wheels and several other machines proper to raise water above the level of the spring and among others a machine which they made use of to raise water out of the river called the ten thousand springs and to carry it into the ground belonging to the emperor's demesnes as he had desired pere grimaldi also made a present to the emperor of a hydraulic machine of a new type there appeared in it a ceaseless jet d'eau or cascade a clock that went very true the motions of the heavens and an accurate alarm the pneumatic machines also did no less excite the emperor's curiosity they caused a wagon to be made of light wood about two feet long in the middle of it they placed a brazen vessel full of live coals and upon that an ilo pile the wind of which came through a little pipe upon a sort of wheel made like the sails of a windmill this little wheel turned another with an axle-tree and by that means set the wagon in motion for two hours together but lest room should be wanting to proceed constantly forward it was contrived to move circularly in the following manner to the axle-tree of the two hind wheels was fixed a small beam and at the end of this beam another axle-tree which went through the centre of another wheel somewhat larger than the rest and according as this wheel was nearer or farther from the wagon it described a greater or lesser circle the same contrivance was likewise fixed to a little ship with four wheels the ilo pile was hid in the middle of the ship and the wind proceeding out of two small pipes filled the little sails and made it wheel about a long while the artifice being concealed there was nothing heard but a noise like a blast of wind or like that which water makes about a vessel i have already spoken of the organ which was presented to the emperor but as this was defective in many things pere pereira 
made a larger one and placed it in the jesuits church at peking the novelty of this harmony charmed the chinese but that which astonished them most was that this organ played of itself chinese as well as european airs and sometimes both together it was well known as i have elsewhere mentioned that what gave pere ricci a favourable admission into the emperor's court was a clock and a striking watch of which he made him a present this prince was so much charmed with it that he built a magnificent tower purposely to place it in and because the queen-mother had a desire for a striking watch the emperor had recourse to a stratagem to disappoint her by ordering the watch to be shown her without calling her attention to the striking part so that she not finding it according to her fancy sent it back they did not fail afterwards to comply with the emperor's taste for great quantities of curious things were sent out of europe by christian princes who had the conversion of this great empire at heart insomuch that the emperor's cabinet was soon filled with various rarities especially clocks of the most recently invented type and most curious workmanship pere pereira who had singular talent for music placed a large and magnificent clock on the top of the jesuits church he had made a great number of small bells in a musical proportion and placed them in a tower appointed for that purpose every hammer was fastened to an iron wire which raised it and immediately let it fall upon the bell within the tower was a large barrel upon which christian airs were marked with small spikes immediately before the hour the barrel was disengaged from the teeth of a wheel by which it was suspended and stopped it then was instantly set in motion by a great weight the string of which was wound about the barrel the spikes raised the wires of the hammers according to the order of the tune so that by this means the finest airs of the country were heard this was a diversion entirely new both for the court and city and crowds of all sorts came constantly to hear it the church though large was not sufficient for the throng that incessantly went backward and forward whenever any extraordinary phenomena such as a parhelion rainbows etc appeared in the heavens the emperor immediately sent for the missionaries to explain their causes they composed several books concerning these natural appearances and to support their explanations in the most sensible manner they contrived a machine to represent the effects of nature in the heavens it was a drum made very close and whitened on the inside the inward surface represented the heavens the light of the sun entering through a little hole passed through a triangular prism of glass and fell upon a polished cylinder from this cylinder it was reflected upon the concavity of the drum and exactly painted the colour of the rainbow from a part of the cylinder a little flattened was reflected the image of the sun and by other refractions and reflections were shown the halos about sun and moon and all the rest of the phenomena relating to celestial colours according as the prism was more or less inclined towards the cylinder they also presented the emperor with thermometers to show the several degrees of heat and cold to which was added a very nice hygrometer to discover the several degrees of moisture and dryness it was a barrel of a large diameter suspended by a thick string made of catgut of a proper length and parallel to the horizon the least change in the air contracts or relaxes the string and causes the barrel to turn sometimes to the right sometimes to the left and stretches or loosens to the right or left upon the circumference of the barrel a small string which draws a little pendulum and marks the several degrees of humidity on one and on the other those of dryness 
all these different inventions of human wit till then unknown to the chinese abated something of their natural pride and taught them not to have too contemptible an opinion of foreigners nay it so far altered their way of thinking that they began to look upon europeans as their masters end of section fifty five this recording is in the public domain Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. Section 56 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific edited by eva march tappan section fifty six the emperor and the musician by per du halde the chinese like the european music well enough provided that there is but one voice to accompany the sound of several instruments but as for the contrast of different voices of grave and acute sounds they are not at all agreeable to their taste for they look upon them as no better than disagreeable confusion they have no musical notes nor any sign to denote the diversity of tones the rising or falling of the voice and the rest of the variations that constitute harmony the airs which they sing or play upon their instruments are got only by rote and are learned by the ear nevertheless they make new ones from time to time the ease wherewith we retain an air after the first hearing by the assistance of notes extremely surprised the late emperor in the year 1679, he sent for Per Grimaldi and Per Pereira to play upon an organ and the harpsichord that they had formerly presented him. He liked our European airs and seemed to take great pleasure in them. Then he ordered his musicians to play a Chinese air upon their instruments, and played likewise himself in a very graceful manner. Per Pereira took his pocket-book and pricked down all the tune while the musicians were playing, and when they had finished repeated it without missing a note, which the emperor could scarcely believe. His surprise was so great that the father had learned in so short a time an air which had been so troublesome to him and his musicians, and that by the assistance of the characters he could recollect it at any time with pleasure. To be more certain of this, he put him to trial several times and sang several different airs, which the father took down in his book and then repeated exactly with the greatest accuracy it must be owned cried the emperor european music is incomparable and this father has not his equal in all the empire this prince afterward established an academy of music and made the most skilful persons in that science members of it and committed it to the care of his third son a man of letters and who had read much they began by examining all the authors that had written upon the subject they caused all sorts of instruments to be made after the ancient manner and according to the size proposed the faults of these instruments were discovered and corrected after which they composed a book in four tomes with the title the true doctrine of liu lu written by the order of the emperor to these four tomes they added a fifth concerning the elements of european music made by p pereira chinese music End of section 56. This recording is in the public domain. Section 57 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, read for LibriVox.org by Andrea. 
The Man Who Was Afraid of Becoming a Horse by Père Duhalde. Although these stories were written by Père Duhalde, they were made up from letters and reports of a number of Jesuit missionaries, the editor. They called me one day to baptize a sick person who was an old man of seventy and lived upon a small pension given him by the emperor. When I entered his room, he said, I am obliged to you, my father, that you are going to deliver me from a heavy punishment. That is not all, replied I. Baptism not only delivers persons from hell, but conducts them to a life of blessedness. I do not comprehend, replied the sick person, what it is you say, and perhaps I have not sufficiently explained myself. You know that for some time I have lived on the emperor's benevolence, and the bonzes, Buddhist priests, who are well instructed in what passes in the next world, have assured me that out of gratitude I should be obliged to serve him after death and that my soul would infallibly pass into a post-horse to carry dispatches out of the provinces to court. For this reason they exhort me to perform my duty well when I shall have assumed my new being, and to take care not to stumble, nor wince, nor bite, nor hurt anybody. Besides, they direct me to travel well, to eat little, to be patient, and by that means move the compassion of the deities, who often convert a good beast into a man of quality, and make him a considerable mandarin. I own, father, that this thought makes me shudder, and I cannot think on it without trembling. I dream of it every night, and sometimes when I am asleep I think myself, harnessed and ready to set out at the first stroke of the rider. I then wake in a sweat, and under great concern, not being able to determine whether I am a man or a horse, but alas, what will become of me when I shall be a horse in reality? This, then, my father, is the resolution that I am come to. They say that those of your religion are not subject to these miseries, that men continue to be men and shall be the same in the next world as they are in this. I beseech you to receive me among you. I know that your religion is hard to be observed, but if it was still more difficult, I am ready to embrace it. And whatever it cost me, I should rather be a Christian than become a beast. This discourse and the present condition of the sick person excited my compassion, but reflecting afterwards that God makes use of simplicity and ignorance to lead men to the truth, I took occasion to undeceive him in his errors and to direct him in the way of salvation. I gave him instructions a long time, and at length he believed that I had the consolation to see him die not only with the most rational sentiments, but with all the marks of a good Christian. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain. Section 58 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Brianna How the Bounces Got the Ducks by Père Lecomte There was no end to the deceits that these bones practiced upon the Chinese. The following tale of their trickery is a favorite among the more intelligent Chinamen. The Editor Two of these bonzes, one day perceiving in the court of a rich peasant two or three large ducks, prostrated themselves before the door and began to sigh and weep bitterly. The good woman who perceived them from her chamber came out to learn the reason of their grief. We know, they said, that the souls of our fathers have passed into the bodies of these creatures, and the fear we are under that you should kill them will certainly make us die with grief. I own, said the woman, that we were determined to sell them. But since they are your parents, I promise to keep them. 
This was not what the Bonzes wanted, and therefore they added, Perhaps your husband will not be so charitable as yourself, and you may rest assured that it will be fatal to us if any accident happens to them. In short, after a great deal of discourse, the good woman was so moved with their seeming grief that she gave them the ducks to take care of, which they took very respectfully after several protestations, and the self-same evening made a feast of them for their little society. End of section 58 this recording is in the public domain. Section 59 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section fifty nine a visit to a lama by pere gerbillon among the tartars the priests of buddha are all called lamas but are of greatly differing rank the editor our ambassadors upon their coming into the town went directly to the chief pagoda several lamas coming to receive them and to conduct them across the square court quite large and well paved with square tiles to the pagoda where was one of their chiefs he was one of those whom the impostors say never die they affirm that when his soul is separated from his body it immediately enters into that of a newborn child the veneration which the tartars have for these impostors is incredible even worshipping them as gods upon earth i was witness of this respect which our ambassador and a part of his retinue particularly the mongols paid him the person who then pretended to be thus brought again into life was a young man about twenty-five years old his face was very long and rather flat he was seated under a canopy at the farther end of the pagoda upon two cushions one of brocade and the other of yellow satin a large mantle of the finest chinese yellow damask covered his body from head to foot so that nothing of him could be seen but his head which was quite bare his hair was curled his gown edged with a sort of party-coloured silk lace four or five fingers broad much as our church copes are and which the mantle of this lama was not much unlike all the civility which he showed the ambassadors was to rise from his seat when they appeared in the pagoda and to continue standing the whole time he received their compliments or rather adoration the ceremonial was as follows the ambassadors when they were five or six paces distant from the lama first veiled their bonnets to the very ground then prostrated themselves thrice striking the ground with their foreheads after this adoration they went one after the other to kneel at his feet the lama put his hands upon their heads and made them touch his bead roll or string of beads after this the ambassadors retired and made the same adoration a second time then they went to sit down under canopies got ready on each side the counterfeit god being first seated the ambassadors took their places one on his right hand and the other on his left some of the most considerable mandarins seating themselves next to them when they had sat down the people of their retinue came also to pay their adoration to receive the imposition of hands and to touch the bead roll but there were not many there who had this respect shown them in the meantime there was tartarian tea brought in in large silver pots with a special one for this pretended immortal carried by a lama who poured it out for him into a fine china cup which he reached himself from a silver stand that was placed near him the motion he at that time used opened his mantle and i observed that his arms were naked up to the shoulders and that he had no other clothes under his mantle but red and yellow scarfs which were wrapped round his body he was always served first 
the ambassador saluted him by bowing the head both before and after drinking tea according to the custom of the tartars but he did not make the least motion in return to their civility a little after a collation was served up a table being first set before this living idol then one was set before each of the ambassadors and the mandarin who attended them per Pereira and i had also the same honour done us there were upon these tables dishes of certain wretched dried fruits and a sort of long thin cakes made of flour and oil which had a very strong smell after this collation which i had no inclination to taste of but with which our tartars and their attendants were very well entertained tea was brought a second time a little after the same tables were brought in covered with meat and rice there was upon each table a large dish of beef and mutton half dressed a china dish full of rice very white and clean and another of broth and some salt dissolved in water and vinegar the same sort of meat was set before the attendants of the ambassadors who sat behind us what surprised me was to see the great mandarin devour this meat which was half dressed cold and so hard that having put a piece into my mouth only to taste it i was forced to turn it out again but there was none played their part so well as two calchas tartars who came in whilst we were at table having paid the adoration to and received the imposition of hands from the living idol they fell upon one of these dishes of meat with a surprising appetite each of them taking a piece of flesh in one hand and his knife in the other and cutting unusually large slices after which they dipped them in the salt and water and swallowed them down all being taken away tea was brought once more after which there was quite a long conversation the living idol keeping his countenance very well i don't think that during the whole time we were there he spoke more than five or six words and that very low and only in answer to some questions which the ambassadors asked him he kept continually turning his eyes around and staring very earnestly on each side and sometimes smiling there was another lama seated near one of the ambassadors who kept up the conversation probably because he was the superior for all the other lamas who waited at table as well as the servants received orders from him after a short conversation the ambassadors arose and went about the pagoda to take a view of the paintings which are very coarse after the manner of the chinese there is not a statue in it as in other pagodas only figures of the deities painted on the walls at the bottom of the pagoda there is a throne or sort of altar upon which the living idol is placed having over his head a canopy of yellow silk and here he receives the adoration of the people on the sides there are several lamps though we saw but one lighted going out of the pagoda we went upstairs where we found a wretched gallery with chambers on all sides of it in one of them there was a child of seven or eight years old dressed and seated as a living idol with a lamp burning by him it was probable this child was designed one time or other to succeed the present idol for these deceivers have always one ready to substitute in the place of another in case of death and feed the stupidity of the tartars with this extravagant notion that the idol comes to life and appears again in the body of a young man into whom his soul passed this is the reason for their so great veneration for the lamas whom they not only implicitly obey in all their commands but make them an offering of the best of everything they have and therefore some of the mongols of the ambassador's retinue paid the same adoration to this child as they had done to the other lama this child did not make the least motion nor speak one single word we found also in another chamber a lama singing his prayers written upon leaves of coarse brown paper when our curiosity was satisfied our ambassadors took leave of this impostor who neither stirred from his seat nor paid them the least civility after which they went to another pagoda to visit another living idol who came to meet them the day before but per Pereira and i returned to the camp end of section fifty nine this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia
Section 60 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter China, Part 9 The First Two Centuries of Manchu Rule Historical Note By the 14th century, the kingdom founded by Kublai Khan had fallen to pieces, and China was once again ruled by native sovereigns. The Tartars still harassed the frontiers, however, and in 1644, the warlike Manchus were called in to defend the kingdom against them. They entered it as conquerors, and established a Manchu dynasty that ruled until the revolution of 1912. Meanwhile, several nations were seeking commercial privileges. Portugal, Holland, Russia, and England were all eager to extend their trade. Russia met with favor. But England's attempt to make the country into a market for her Indian opium aroused the just wrath of the Chinese. They seized some twenty million dollars worth of the drug and destroyed it. War followed. By the treaty which closed the war, five ports were thrown open to all nations. One year later, in 1844, the United States signed a treaty with China. But the hatred of the Chinese for foreigners made the privileges that the Americans had won of comparatively small value. The Chinese had never been content under their Manchu rulers, and in 1850 a formidable revolt broke out against them in southern China. The Taiping Rebellion, as it was called, lasted for fourteen years, but was finally suppressed by General Gordon, who was given command of the Imperial Army. In 1873, the Chinese emperor, for the first time, gave a personal audience to foreign envoys without obliging them to kowtow or pay him homage, thus admitting the equality of other nations and putting an end to the old policy of isolation. End of section 60. This recording is in the public domain. Section 61 of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by jim lock of floyd virginia the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section sixty one the coming of the kalmucks by thomas de quincey seventeen seventy one a d in sixteen sixteen a tartar tribe the torgotes or kalmucks left china and went to the shores of the caspian sea the russian rule however finally became so unbearable that in seventeen seventy one the descendants of these people determined to return to china there were six hundred thousand of them men women and children their flight began in the winter for thousands of miles they waded through deep snow they crossed rivers they fought hostile tribes who pursued them like demons they suffered from famine and from cold and heat of the six hundred thousand one hundred and forty thousand had died when at last they drew near to the great wall the following extract describes their approach the editor on a fine morning of early autumn of the year seventeen seventy one kien long the emperor of china was pursuing his amusements in a wild frontier district lying on the outside of the great wall for many hundred square leagues the country was desolate of inhabitants but rich in woods of ancient growth and overrun with game of every description in a central spot of this solitary region the emperor had built a gorgeous hunting lodge to which he resorted annually for recreation and relief from the cares of government led onwards in pursuit of game he had rambled to a distance of two hundred miles or more from his lodge followed at a little distance by a sufficient military escort and every night pitching his tent in a different situation until at length he had arrived on the very margin of the vast central deserts of asia 
here he was standing by accident at an opening of his pavilion enjoying the morning sunshine when suddenly to the westward there arose a vast cloudy vapour which by degrees expanded mounted and seemed to be slowly diffusing itself over the whole face of the heavens by and by this vast sheet of mist began to thicken toward the horizon and to roll forward in billowy volumes the emperor's suite assembled from all quarters the silver trumpets were sounded in the rear and from all the glades and forest avenues began to trot forwards towards the pavilion the jaegers half cavalry half huntsmen who composed the imperial escort conjecture was on the stretch to divine the cause of this phenomenon and the interest continually increased in proportion as simple curiosity gradually deepened into the anxiety of uncertain danger at first it had been imagined that some vast troops of deer or other wild animals of the chase had been disturbed in their forest haunts by the emperor's movements or possibly by wild beasts prowling for prey and might be fetching a compass by way of re-entering the forest grounds at some remoter point secure from molestation but this conjecture was dissipated by the slow increase of the cloud and the steadiness of its motion in the course of two hours the vast phenomenon had advanced to a point which was judged to be within five miles of the spectators though all calculations of distance were difficult and often fallacious when applied to the endless expanses of the tartar deserts through the next hour during which the gentle morning breeze had a little freshened the dusty vapour had developed itself far and wide into the appearance of huge aerial draperies hanging in mighty volumes from the sky to the earth and at particular points where the eddies of the breeze acted upon the pendulous skirts of these aerial curtains rents were perceived sometimes taking the form of regular arches portals and windows windows through which began dimly to gleam the heads of camels endorsed with human beings and at intervals the moving of men and horses in tumultuous array and then through other openings or vistas at far distant points the flashing of polished arms but sometimes as the wind slackened or died away all those openings of whatever form in the cloudy pall would slowly close and for a time the whole pageant was shut up from view although the growing din the clamours the shrieks and groans ascending from infuriated myriads reported in a language not to be misunderstood what was going on behind the cloudy screen these were the kalmuks pursued by their savage enemies the emperor had known that they were coming but he had no reason to expect them for at least three months by the clangour of weapons and the cries of agony he knew what was happening he summoned the cavalry and artillery that always guarded him and the wretched wanderers were soon free from their foes food and clothes and money and land and cattle and agricultural implements were already provided for them on the margin of the desert great columns of granite and brass were afterwards reared with the following inscription telling the story of this flight the editor by the will of god here upon the brink of these deserts which from this point begin and stretch away pathless treeless waterless for thousands of miles and along the margins of many mighty nations rested from their labours and from great afflictions under the shadow of the chinese wall and by the favour of kien long god's lieutenant upon earth the ancient children of the wilderness the torgote tartars flying before the wrath of the grecian czar wandering sheep who had strayed away from the celestial empire in the year sixteen sixteen 
but are now mercifully gathered again after infinite sorrow into the fold of their forgiving shepherd hallowed be the spot for ever and hallowed be the day september eighth seventeen seventy one amen end of section sixty one this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section sixty two of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march japan section sixty two chinese punishments by per du halt no crimes pass unpunished in china the bastinado is the common punishment for slight faults and the number of blows is proportionable to the nature of the fault this is the punishment which the officers of war immediately inflict upon the soldiers who being placed as sentinels in the night time in the streets and public places of great cities are found asleep when the number of blows does not exceed twenty it is accounted a fatherly correction and not an infamous the emperor himself sometimes commands it to be inflicted on great persons and afterwards sees them and treats them as usual a very small matter will incur this correction as having taken a trifle said opprobious things given a few blows with the fist if these things reach the mandarin's ears he immediately sets the battoon at work after the correction is over they are to kneel before the judge bow their bodies three times to the earth and thank him for the care he takes of their education the instrument wherewith he inflicts the bastinado is a thick cane cloven in two and several feet long the lower part is as broad as one's hand and the upper is smooth and small that it may more easily be managed it is made of the bamboo which is a wood that is hard strong and heavy when the mandarin sits in judgment he is placed before a table upon which is a case full of small staves about half a foot long and two fingers broad and he is surrounded with tall footmen with batoons in their hands at a certain sign that he gives by taking out and throwing down these staves they seize the criminal and lay him down with his face towards the ground and as many small staves as the mandarin draws out of the case and throws on the ground so many footmen succeed each other every one giving five blows with a batoon on the guilty person's bare skin however it is observable that four blows are always reckoned as five which they call the grace of the emperor who as a father has compassion on the people always subtracting something from the punishment there is another method of mitigating the punishment which is to bribe those that apply it for they have the art of managing in such a manner that the blows shall fall very lightly and the punishment become almost insensible it is not only in this tribunal that the mandarin has power to give the bastinado it is the same thing in whatever place he is even out of his district for which reason when he goes abroad he has always officers of justice in his train who carry the batoon as for one of the vulgar it is sufficient not to have alighted if he was on horseback when the mandarin passed by or to have crossed the street in his presence to receive five or six blows by his order the performance of it is so quick that it is often done before those who are present perceive anything of the matter masters use the same correction to their scholars fathers to their children and noblemen to punish their domestics with this difference that the batoon is every way less another punishment less painful but more infamous is the wooden collar which the portuguese have called cangue 
This gangway is composed of two pieces of wood hollowed in the middle to place the neck of the criminal in. When he has been condemned by the mandarin, they take these two pieces of wood, lay them on his shoulders and join them together in such a manner that there is room only for the neck. By this means, the person can neither see his feet nor put his hand to his mouth, but is obliged to be fed by some other person. He carries night and day this disagreeable load, which is heavier or lighter according to the nature of the fault. Some kangus weigh two hundred pounds and are so troublesome to criminals that out of shame, confusion, pain, want or nourishment in sleep, they die under them. Some are three feet square and five or six inches thick. The common sort weigh fifty or sixty pounds. The criminals find different ways to mitigate the punishment. Some walk in company with their relations and friends who support the four corners of the kangwe that it may not gall their shoulders. Others rest it on a table or on a bench. Others have a chair made proper to support the four corners and so sit tolerably easy. When, in the presence of the mandarin, they have joined the two pieces of wood about the neck of the criminal, they paste on each side two long slips of paper about four fingers broad, on which they fix a seal, that the two pieces which compose the kangwe may not be separated without its being perceived. Then they write in large characters the crime for which this punishment is inflicted and the time that it ought to last. For instance, if it be a thief or seditious person or a disturber of the peace of families, a gamester, etc., he must wear the kangwe for three months in a particular place. The place where they are exposed is generally at the gate of a temple, which is much frequented or where two streets cross, or at the gate of the city, or in a public square, or even at the principal gate of the mandarin's tribunal. When the time of punishment is expired, the officers of the tribunal bring back the criminal to the mandarin, who, after having exhorted him to amend his conduct, frees him from the kangwe, and to take his leave of him, orders him twenty strokes of the batoon, for it is the common custom of the Chinese justices not to inflict any punishment unless it be a pecuniary one, which is not preceded and succeeded by the bastinado, inasmuch that it may be said that the Chinese government subsists by the exercise of the batoon. Besides the punishment of the kangwe, there are still others which are inflicted for slight faults. A missionary entering into a tribunal found young people upon their knees. Some bore on their heads a stone, weighing seven or eight pounds. Others held a book in their hand and seemed to read diligently. Among these was a young married man about thirty years old who loved gaming to excess. He had lost one part of the money with which his father had furnished him to carry on his business. Exhortations, reprimands, threatenings proved ineffectual to root out this passion, so that his father, being still desirous to cure him of this disease, conducted him to the Mandarin's tribunal. The Mandarin, who was a man of honor and probity, hearing the father's complaint, caused the young man to draw near, and after a severe reprimand and proper advice, he was going to have him bastinadoed. When his mother entered all of a sudden, and throwing herself at the mandarin's feet with tears in her eyes, besought him to pardon her son. The mandarin granted her petition and ordered a book to be brought, composed by the emperor for the instruction of the empire, and opening it chose the article which related to filial obedience. You promise me, he said to the young man, to renounce play and to listen to your father's directions. I therefore pardon you this time, but go and kneel in the gallery on the side of the hall of audience and learn by heart this article of filial obedience. You shall not depart from the tribunal till you repeat it and promise to observe it the remainder of your life. 
This order was exactly put in execution. The young man remained three days in the gallery, learned the article, and was dismissed. There are some crimes for which the criminals are marked on the cheek, and the mark which is impressed in a Chinese character signifying their crime. There are others for which they are condemned to banishment or to draw the royal barks. This servitude lasts no longer than three years. As for banishment, it is often perpetual, especially if Tartary is the place of exile. But before they depart, they are sure to be bastinadoed, and the number of blows is proportionable to their crime. Unless in some extraordinary cases which are mentioned in the body of the Chinese laws, or for which the emperor permits immediate execution upon the spot, no mandarin or superior tribunal can pronounce definitively the sentence of death. The judgments of all crimes worthy of death are to be examined, decided, and subscribed by the emperor. The mandarins send to court the account of the trials and their decision, mentioning the particular law on which their sentence is founded. For instance, such a one is guilty of a crime and the law declares that those who are convicted of it shall be strangled, for which reason I have condemned him to be strangled. These informations being come to court, the superior tribunal of criminal affairs examines the fact, the circumstances, and the decision. If the fact is not clearly proved or the tribunal has need of fresh information, it presents a memorial to the emperor containing the proof of the crime and the sentence of the inferior mandarin, and it adds, To give a just judgment, it seems necessary that we should be informed of such a circumstance. Therefore, we think it requisite to refer the matter to such a mandarin that he may clear up the difficulty that lies in our way. The emperor gives what order he pleases but his clemency always inclines him to do what is desired, that a man's life may not be taken away for a slight cause and without sufficient proof. When the superior has received the information that it required, it presents a second time the deliberation to the emperor. Then the emperor either confirms the sentence or diminishes the rigor of the punishment. Sometimes he sends back the memorial writing these words with his own hand. Let the tribunal deliberate further upon this matter and make their report to me. Every part of the judicature is extremely scrupulous when a man's life is concerned. End of section 62. This recording is in the public domain. Section 63 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, read for LibriVox.org by Monica M. C. The Temple of Heaven, Peking, photograph, page 186. It has been rather unkindly declared that China has no architecture. However that may be, she has certainly some extremely interesting buildings. The most peculiar of these are the pagodas, or tars, as the Chinese call them. These are high, tapering towers, built in stories, each story with a projecting roof. Generally, these roofs have an appearance of sagging like an awning or a tent. Light bells are hung upon them, which tinkle in the breeze. The towers are made of brick, covered with either marble or glazed tiles. Some of these structures are 13 stories in height. The temples are built on the same general plan, but have pavilions for idols, rooms for priests, and enclosures for animals to be used in sacrifice. The Temple of Heaven at Peking, with its triple roof and deep blue porcelain tiles, is the most imposing of all Confucian temples. Here the Emperor of China was wont to offer sacrifice every 22nd of December, and also whenever drought or famine called for the special favor of the god Shang-Ti. 
the dwellings of the Chinese must by law correspond to the rank of the owners. A common plan is to make the house about four times as deep as it is wide, with a broad passage from the front to the dining room, which runs across the house in the rear. The kitchen is behind this. The larger rooms may at a moment's notice be divided by movable partitions, which are always kept ready. The Chinese begin a building by first making a roof supported by wooden posts. As the walls are built, these posts are removed. End of section 63. This recording is in the public domain. Section 64 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke Why the Chinaman Wears a Cue by William Elliot Griffiths The mark of nationality among these northeastern Tartars, the Manchus, was the cue. They shaved the whole front of the scalp and then let their hair grow behind into a long tail. A young Manchu warrior was as proud of his tail of hair as a Mohawk or Pawnee Indian was of his scalp lock before this time the chinese wore their hair as the koreans do that is done up in a sort of knot or chignon at the back of the head thus it happens that chinese on first coming to korea are amused at seeing the fashion of top knots prevalent just as it was among their ancestors of the ming period if short by nature the queue was lengthened out by means of black silk or false hair so as to reach below the knees in china this queue became the solemn mark of loyalty to the manchu sovereign millions of natives were slaughtered before they would submit their heads to the razor although chinese males wash their own clothes being laundry men by habit they do not shave themselves but pay for their tonsure to the manchus the barbers of china are very grateful until our twentieth century in china not to wear the queue or to cut it off was a sign of disloyalty to the emperor some of the anti-dynastic secret societies showed their enmity to the peking rulers by secretly snipping off the queues of prominent citizens or men high in office thus bringing disgrace and shame upon them nevertheless the chinese are not peculiar in priding themselves on their hair tails for it was the fashion with europeans and americans in the eighteenth century to wear them most of the continental soldiers and sailors in the revolution had pigtails which they larded powdered or wore in eel skins looking just as funny as do the chinese in every country in the world there is a language of hair the fashions of hair and headgear serve as signs of nationality sex marital promise or condition the japanese however cut off their top knots in eighteen seventy the koreans two decades later and the chinese are now slowly following the example of the world at large in china whether with or without hair tails the men follow a uniform fashion but there is an amazing variety among the women in arranging their tresses when the manchus appeared before the oft besieged and many times captured city of lao yang the people submitted to their new masters giving signs of their sincerity by shaving the front part of their scalps and waiting for their cues to grow end of section sixty four this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section sixty five of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jim locke 
of floyd virginia the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section sixty five how the chinese received the first english ambassador by charles gutzloff seventeen ninety two a d for many centuries china had little intercourse with other countries various european nations tried to form commercial relations with her and there was buying and selling between them but it was most unsatisfactory the rules made by the chinese were as fickle as the wind often the merchants or foreign devils as the chinese call them were in danger of their lives several nations had sent representatives to china and in seventeen ninety two england decided to send lord macartney as an ambassador to the emperor in the hope of establishing safe and reasonable relations of trade even before the ambassador landed the tricky chinamen contrived to run up a flag on the vessel that bore him up the pai ho whereon was written tribute bearer from england this was quite in accordance with the chinese custom of claiming all gifts as tribute another custom of theirs was that whoever approached the throne of the emperor must perform the kowtow that is must kneel three times and at each kneeling must bow three times till his head touched the floor this was the way in which the greater idols were approached and signified that the emperor was a god lord macartney told the chinese legate that he would not perform the kotow unless a high officer of state would kotow before a picture of the king of england the emperor finally agreed to admit the ambassador who bent his knee as he would have done before his own sovereign the editor on the day of audience the ambassadors were ushered into the garden of jiho tents had been pitched the imperial one had nothing magnificent but was distinguished from all the others by its yellow colour the imperial family as well as mandarins of the first rank had all collected shortly after daylight the sound of musical instruments announced the approach of the emperor he was seated in an open chair borne by sixteen men and seen emerging from a grove in the background clad in a plain dark silk with a velvet bonnet and a pearl in front of it he wore no other distinguishing mark of his high rank as soon as the monarch was seated upon his throne the master of the ceremonies led the ambassador toward the steps the latter approached bent his knee and handed in a casket set with diamonds the letter addressed to his imperial majesty by the king of england the emperor assured him of the satisfaction he felt at the testimony which his britannic majesty gave him of his esteem and good will in sending him an embassy with a letter and rare presents that he on his part entertained sentiments of the same kind toward the sovereign of great britain and hoped that harmony would always be maintained between their respective subjects he then presented to the ambassador a stone sceptre whilst he graciously received the private presence of the principal personages of the embassy he was perfectly good-humoured and especially pleased with the son of sir g staunton who talked a little chinese and received as a token of imperial favour a yellow plain tobacco pouch with the figure of the five-clawed dragon embroidered upon it afterward the ambassadors from burma and little bukharia were introduced and performed the nine prostrations a sumptuous banquet was then served up and after their departure they had presents sent to them consisting of silks porcelain and teas 
upon an application made to the prime minister respecting a merchant ship which had accompanied the ambassador's frigate they received the most flattering answer and every request was fully granted to them having accompanied the embassy the ship was to pay no duty after their return to peking it was intimated to them that his majesty on his way to yuen ming yuen would be delighted if the ambassador came to meet him on the road when the emperor observed him he stopped short and graciously addressed him he was carried in a chair and followed by a clumsy cart which could not be distinguished from other vehicles if it had not been for the yellow cloth over it on his arrival at yuen ming yuen he viewed with great delight the various presents which the ambassador had brought with him a model of the royal sovereign a ship of war of a hundred and ten guns attracted much of his notice in consequence of this embassy his imperial majesty called together a council to deliberate what answer ought to be given to the letter the result of this conference was that the ambassador was given to understand that as the winter approached he ought to be thinking about his departure at an interview with the minister of state to which he was invited in the palace he found the emperor's answer contained in a large roll covered with yellow silk and placed in a chair of state from thence it was sent into the ambassador's hotel accompanied by several presents news which arrived from canton stating the probability of a rupture between england and the french republic hastened the departure of the ambassador he had been very anxious to obtain some privileges for the british trade but the prime minister was as anxious to evade all conversation upon business the splendid embassy was only viewed as a congratulatory mission and treated as such the chinese were certainly not wanting in politeness nor did the emperor even treat them rudely but empty compliments were not the object of this expensive expedition the next english ambassador lord amherst who came in eighteen seventeen refused to kotow was told that he was a rude man who did not know how to behave and was bidden to go home at once the editor end of section sixty five this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia Section 66 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Ready for LibriVox.org by Brianna. Opium Eaters by William Spear. The Chinese were certainly the most exasperating of mortals, but trade with them was growing more and more valuable, especially to the English, for in British India, there were vast fields of the poppy from which opium is obtained the chinese were fast becoming a nation of opium users the emperor forbade the introduction of the drug into china but it was easy to bribe the chinese officials and the quantity sold increased every year this is the way its effects are described by a man who lived in the country for many years the editor the face becomes pale and haggard the eyes moist and vacant the whole expression miserable and idiotic the body wastes to a skeleton the joints are tortured with pain the sensation of gnawing in the stomach when the private of the drug is described by those addicted to its use to be like the tearing of its tender coats by the claws of an animal of prey while a return to it fills the brain with horrid and tormenting visions like the mania of delirium tremens i have seen strong men when unable to obtain their accustomed dose 
crazy with the suffering. The face crimsoned in some cases, and the perspiration streaming down in a shower. Few individuals of those whom it possesses are able to find a sufficient antidote. The subject lingers a few years, and a dreary and unpitied death ends the scene. End of section 66. This recording is in the public domain. Section 67 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica M.C. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 67. A Boston Tea Party in China by William Spear. Some of the Chinese officials urged the emperor to allow the sale of opium. The traders would pay him a large tax, they said, and thus an immense revenue would come to the government, the emperor positively refused. I will not receive a revenue, he declared, from a thing that will destroy the lives and happiness of my people. The Editor In January 1839, the government sent the police to search the native houses of Canton and seize opium wherever found. This led to a curious scene, highly characteristic of the democratic character of the Chinese institutions and the independence of the people. The people would not allow the search to begin until they had first searched the policemen, who were generally known as the greatest opium smokers in the city. A few days after this, the canton authorities caused a native opium smuggler to be executed in front of the factories, whereupon all the foreign flags were immediately struck. The governor took no notice of a remonstrance addressed by him by Captain Elliot, the British superintendent of trade. A week after these occurrences, the celebrated Commissioner Lin arrived from court, vested with the most absolute powers that were ever delegated by the emperor. When he arrived at Canton, there were several British ships in the river, having not less than 20,000 chests of opium on port. These, he demanded, should be given up without delay to be destroyed. He blockaded the factories and even threatened to put the occupants to death, on which the British superintendent, Captain Elliot, deemed it advisable to agree to the surrender of the opium, in order to secure the safety of his countrymen. Several weeks were occupied in the landing of the forfeited drug, during which the merchants were still detained in the factories. But as soon as it was ascertained that all the chests had been brought on shore, the troops were withdrawn and the captives left at liberty to depart. In the meantime, the commissioner had sent to Peking for instructions how to dispose of the property he had seized, and received the following order in the name of the emperor. Lin and his colleagues are to assemble the civil and military officers and destroy the opium before their eyes, thus manifesting to the natives dwelling on the sea coast and the foreigners of the outside nations an awful warning. Respect this. Obey respectfully. In obedience to this comment, on the 3rd of June, 1839, the High Commissioner, accompanied by all the officers, proceeded to Chan Hao, near the mouth of the river, where large trenches had been dug into which the opium was thrown, with a quantity of quicklime salt and water, so that it was decomposed, and the mixture ran into the sea. The operations for destroying the drug continued about twenty days and were witnessed on the 16th by several English merchants who had an interview with Commissioner Lin. The market value of the property at the time was about 12 millions of Spanish dollars. 
Great Britain demanded that China should pay this twelve millions of Spanish dollars. China had no idea of doing any such thing and therefore war was declared. The Chinese firmly believed that they were the best soldiers in the world and had the best weapons. When they were confronted by English troops and English artillery, and especially when they found that these foreigners had so little regard for their notions of military etiquette as to attack a fort from the rear, and, what was almost as bad, actually to capture it, they were horrified. Of course, such a war could have but one ending. The Chinese were obliged to pay 21 millions of dollars to open the ports of Canton, Amoy, Fuzhou, Ningpo and Shanghai to foreign trade with a definite tariff and to allow foreigners to reside in these cities. The island of Hong Kong was to be given to England, British prisoners were to be released and all Chinese who had been in the service of the English were to be pardoned. It was agreed that intercourse between the rulers of the two nations should be on terms of perfect equality. The Editor End of section 67 This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Ready for LibriVox.org by Brianna What the Chinese Thought About English by Unknown From a paper that was agreed to at a great public meeting in Canton Behold that vile English nation its ruler is at one time a woman, then a man, and then perhaps a woman again. Its people are at one time like vultures, and then they are like wild beasts, with dispositions more fierce and furious than the tiger or wolf, and natures more greedy than anacondas or swine. These people have long steadily devoured all the western barbarians, and like demons of the night, they now suddenly exalt themselves here. During the reigns of the emperors Qian Lung and Kia King, these English barbarians humbly besought an entrance and permission to deliver tribute and presents. They afterwards presumptuously asked to have two son, but our sovereigns, clearly perceiving their traitorous designs, gave them a determined refusal. From that time, linking themselves with traitorous Chinese traders, they have carried on a large trade and poisoned our brave people with opium. Verily, the English barbarians murder all of us that they can. They are dogs whose desires can never be satisfied. Therefore, we need not inquire whether the peace they have now made be real or pretended. Let us all rise, arm, unite, and go against them. We do here bind ourselves to vengeance, and express these our sincere intentions in order to exhibit our high principles and patriotism. The gods from on high now look down on us. Let us not lose our just and firm resolution. End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 69. How the Arrow War Began by W. A. P. Martin In 1850, what has been called an old-fashioned rebellion broke out in China. 
The leader was one Hung Tzu Tzuin. He called himself a Christian, and made his camp into a sort of Sunday school, though some of the doctrines taught there were anything but Christian. His followers called their leader Tai Ping Wang, that is, Prince of Peace, because they believed that his victory would drive the Tartar rule from the country, and would give the throne to Chinese sovereigns forever. There were neither telegraphs nor railroads in the land. A leader could collect about him a few thousand malcontents, swoop down on a city, add it to his force, and continue without much opposition until one or more provinces, and an army of two hundred thousand men stood at his back, before the imperial ears at Peking had received a hint as to the disturbance. For some years, Hung Tzu Tsuen met with much success. In 1853, he captured Nanking and proclaimed himself emperor. This was trouble sufficient for an empire, but while this rebellion was still going on, the Arrow War broke out. The Editor In the autumn of 1856, a chance spark at Canton produced an explosion that shook the empire and opened wider the breach already made in the wall of exclusiveness. The occurrence was on this wise. The Lorcha Arrow, a Chinese vessel flying the British flag, a privilege for which she had, in conformity with the vicious system then in vogue, paid a small fee to the government of Hong Kong, was seized by the Chinese authorities and her crew thrown into prison on a charge of piracy. The British Council lodged a protest, claiming jurisdiction on the grounds that the Lorcha was registered in a British colony, and demanding, not merely that the prisoners be restored to the deck of their vessel, but that the British flag be hoisted at the masthead, in expiation of the affront offered in hauling it down. The viceroy, who was notoriously proud and obstinate, yielded so far as to send the captives under guard to the consulate. It takes two to make a quarrel, but no two could be better fitted to produce one and to nurse it into a war than the two who were parties in this dispute. Had prompt release of the captives been accepted as sufficient amends, there would have been no war, at least no arrow war. But the consul, young, hot-headed, and inexperienced, unwilling to abate a jot of his demands, refused to receive the captives. They were carried back to the viceroy, who, in a fit of anger, ordered them to be beheaded. He was a truculent wretch, who boasted of the thousands he had decapitated for complicity in rebellion. No wonder, therefore, that he was hasty in cutting off the heads of a dozen boatmen. At this stage, the consul referred the matter to the governor of Hong Kong, and the viceroy proving obdurate to all attempts to extract an apology, the governor placed the affair in the hands of Admiral Seymour. That brave officer, having lost an eye by the explosion of a Russian torpedo in the Baltic, could see only one way to negotiate. Appearing before the city, he invited the viceroy to meet him outside the gates. The stubborn old Mandarin declining the interview, he announced his intention of calling at the viceregal palace. This he did at the hour named though he had to blow up one of the city gates in order to keep his engagement. He, however, reckoned without his host. The viceroy was not at home, and the little squad of marines, only three hundred, withdrew to their ships, their daring feet having had no other effect than to fan a firebrand into a conflagration. Scarcely had they retired when the foreign quarter was set on fire by an infuriated populace. The foreigners took refuge on the shipping, and the shipping dropped down the river to Hong Kong. The little settlement at Hong Kong was in no small peril, its chief danger being a possible rising of the Chinese. But overwhelming as were their numbers, they refrained from open action, trusting, perhaps, to the effect of poison, which Alum, the city baker, mixed with his dough. The mixture was too strong and defeated its object. Only two or three died, though many suffered, and it was agreed on all hands that for once there was too much Alum in the bread. This rupture was recognized at the beginning of a war, and troops were dispatched to the scene. End of section 69. Recording by Todd. Section 70 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE WORLD STORY, VOLUME 1, CHINA, JAPAN, AND THE ISLANDS OF THE PACIFIC, EDITED BY EVA MARCH TAPPAN, SECTION 70, RECEIVING THE YELLOW JACKET, BY A. EGMONT HAKE. THE TREATY WHICH CLOSED THE WAR WAS SIGNED IN 1860. THE MANCHUS WERE THEN FREE TO SUPPRESS HANG SU TO SUIN, IF THEY COULD. 
By this time they had learned that the Chinese army was not the mightiest force in the world, and they appealed to their former foes. Major Gordon, afterwards General Gordon, took command, and now the fortunes of the rebels changed. In 1864 they were completely suppressed. The greatest honor that could be shown to Major Gordon was to bestow upon him the Order of the Yellow Jacket. Of course this, like all Chinese proceedings, was carried on with a vast amount of ceremony. The Editor The Emperor of China had granted to Gordon for his eminent services the distinguished order of the Yellow Jacket. The number of the recipients of this order is, I believe, limited to twelve, and these twelve constitute His Imperial Majesty's bodyguard. Gordon had received, during our absence from the Camp of Instruction, a notification that the distinguished Chinese officials who were deputed to invest him with his order had arrived from Peking, and were awaiting his pleasure to settle when the ceremony of investiture should take place. A very large force of imperial Chinese troops arrived and stockaded themselves about three miles from us. Gunboats conveying and escorting the Chinese dignitaries arrived, and an enormous amount of gunpowder was burnt in the way of salutes to them. It was decided that the ceremony should take place at the camp of instruction, and two very large marquee tents were pitched for the ceremony. The day arrived. All the Chinese officials wore their gorgeous robes. The air smelt of the villainous powder that they burnt in the countless salutes and crackers let off to do honor to the occasion, and countless banners and flags of all hues were flying. Altogether, it was a very bright and animated scene. For some two or three hours, Gordon did nothing but put on one suit of clothes, take them off and put on another, and to onlookers it became rather monotonous. The donning of the yellow jacket with all its paraphernalia was the climax of this interesting scene. More guns fired, crackers fizzed and burst, gongs were clashed, and huge brass horns brayed. The Chinese officials went down on their knees, and appeared as if seized with a sudden desire to find out which was the softer, their heads or the ground. After trying conclusions with the ground three times, all got up, looking very solemn, bewildered, and marching about the place with spectacles and hats in very dissipated positions on their faces and heads, and garments very much disarranged. All the time that this was going on, Gordon's face bore a sort of half-amused, half-satirical smile, and, though he hated the whole ceremony and fuss, still he entered into the whole affair with interest, asked about the various garments, and made comical allusions to his appearance in them. Altogether, the ceremony lasted close on five hours. This over, the Chinese dignitaries left in the same ostentatious and noisy way as they had arrived. The paraphernalia connected with the Order of the Yellow Jacket is very considerable, and the outfit must have cost a very large sum of money, as it comprises silk dresses, robes, jackets, hats, caps, boots, shoes, fans, girdles, thumb rings of jade, and necklaces for all seasons and occasions. The outfit sent down by the Emperor was in fair sized wood boxes, covered with white parchment and the device of the Imperial Dragon in red painted on them. Each box contained a complete suit appertaining to the order. How many there were altogether I forget, but there were a great number. End of section 70. Recording by Todd. Section 71 of China, Japan and the Islands of the Pacific, read for LibriVox.org by Mona Jahin. China Part 10, Language, Schools and Examinations, Historical Note. A national system of education has been one of the strongest forces in holding together the different races that make up the Chinese nation. For 17 centuries, all government offices have been filled by civil service, examination, and consequently, education is eagerly sought after by all classes. The Chinese language is extremely difficult to master. Words have but one syllable, and the same word may be a noun, adjective, verb, or adverb, masculine or feminine, singular or plural. The Chinese write in vertical columns, using brushes dipped in ink. Writing is an art with them, and fine specimens 
are as much admired as paintings are with us. End of section 71. This recording is in the public domain. Section 72 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 72. The Mandarin Language. By Pierre de Halde. The Chinese have two sorts of languages. The first, vulgar, which is spoken by the common people and varies according to the different provinces. The other is called the Mandarin language, and is like the Latin in Europe among the learned. This latter appears poor, for it has not above 330 words, which are all monosyllables and indeclinable, and almost all end with a vowel or the consonant N or NG. Yet this small number of words is sufficient to express oneself upon all subjects, because without multiplying words the sense is varied almost to infinity by the variety of the accents, inflections, tones, aspirations, and other changes of the voice. And this variety of pronunciation is the reason that those who do not well understand the language frequently mistake one word for another. This will be explained by an example. The word T-C-H-U, pronounced slowly, drawing out the U and raising the voice, signifies Lord or Master. If it is pronounced with an even tone, lengthening the U, it signifies a hog. When it is pronounced quickly and lightly, it means a kitchen. If it be pronounced in a strong and masculine tone, growing weaker toward the end, it signifies a column. Further, the same word joined to various others signifies many different things. M-O-U, for example, when it is alone, signifies a tree, a wood. But when it is compounded, it has many other significations. Mual Liao signifies wood prepared for building. Miao Lan is bars or wooden gates. Mao Hia, a box. Mual Siang, a chest of drawers. Miao Tsiang, a carpenter. Mao U, a mushroom. Mao Nu, a sort of small orange. Mao Sing, the planet Jupiter. Mao Mian, cotton, etc. Thus the Chinese, by differently compounding their monosyllables, can make regular discourses and express themselves very clearly and with much gracefulness, almost in the same manner as we form all our words by the different combinations of the twenty-four letters of our alphabet. The art of joining these monosyllables together is very difficult, especially in writing, and requires a great deal of study. As the Chinese have only figures to express their thoughts and have no accents in writing to vary the pronunciation, they are obliged to have as many different figures or characters as there are different tones which give so much various meanings to the same word. The characters of Tochen China, of Tong King, of Japan, are the same as the Chinese, and signify the same things, though these nations in speaking do not express themselves alike. So that notwithstanding the languages are very different, and they cannot understand each other's speech, yet they understand each other's writing, and all their books are common. Their characters are in this respect like the figures of arithmetic. They are used by several nations with different names, but their meaning is everywhere the same. For this reason, the learned must not only be acquainted with the characters that are used in the common affairs of life, but they must also know their various combinations, and the various dispositions which of several simple strokes make the compound characters. And as the number of characters amounts to eighty thousand, he who knows the greatest number is also the most learned, and can read and understand the greatest number of books by which one may judge how many years must be employed to learn such a vast magnitude of characters, to distinguish them when they are compounded, and to remember their shape and meaning. End of section 72. Recording by Todd. Section number 73 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, the United States of America. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. 
Section 73 How Chinese Children Learn to Read by Pere Du Hald. From the age of five or six, according to the children's capacities and the care that parents take of their education, the young Chinese begin to study letters. But as the number of the letters is so great and without any order as in Europe, this study would be very unpleasant if they had not found a way to make it a sort of play and amusement. For this purpose, about a hundred characters are chosen, which express the most common things and which are most familiar to the senses, as the sky, sun, moon, and man, some plants, animals, a house, and the most common utensils. All these things are engraved in a rude manner, and the Chinese characters set underneath, though these figures are very awkwardly represented, yet they quicken the apprehension of the children fix their fancies, and help their memories. There is this inconvenience in the method, that the children imbibe in infinite number chimerical notions in their most tender years, for the sun is represented by a cock in a hoop, the moon by a rabbit pounding rice in a mortar, a sort of demon who holds lightning in his hands, nearly like the ancient representations of Jupiter, stands for thunder, so that in a manner the poor children suck in with their milk these strange whimsies though I am informed that this method is but little in use at present. The next book they learn is called the San Tisi King, containing duties of children and the method of teaching them. It consists of several short sentences of three characters in rhyme to help the memory of the children. There is likewise another, the sentence of which are of four characters, as likewise in catechism made for the Christian children, the phrases of which are but of four letters and which for this reason is called Sitisi Kingver. After this, the children must learn by degrees all the characters, as the European children learn our alphabet, with this difference that we have but four and twenty letters, and they many thousand. At first they oblige a young Chinese to learn four, five, or six in a day, which he must repeat to his master twice a day, and if he often makes mistakes in his lessons, he is chastised, the punishment is in this manner. They make him get upon a narrow bench, on which he lies flat down on his face. When they give him eight or ten blows with a stick, something like a lathe, diring the time of their studies, they keep them so close to their learning that they have very seldom any vacation, except a month at the beginning of the year, and five or six days about the middle of it. As soon as they can read the Si Chu, the four books which contain the doctrine of Confucius and Mencius, they are not suffered to read any other till they have got these by heart without missing a letter. And what is more difficult and less pleasing is that they must learn these books understanding almost nothing of them, it being the custom not to explain to them the sense of the characters till they know them perfectly. At the same time that they learn these letters, they teach them to use the pencil. At first they give them great sheets, written or printed in large red characters. The children do nothing but cover with their pencils, the red strokes, with black to teach them to make the strokes. When they have learned to make them in this manner, they give them others which are black and smaller, and laying upon these sheets other white sheets which are transparent, they draw the letters upon this paper in the shape of those which are underneath. But they oftener use a board varnished white and divide it into little squares, which make different lines, on which they write their characters, and which they rub out with water when they have done to save paper. Finally, they take great care to improve their handwriting, for it is a great advantage to the learned to write well. It is accounted a great qualification, and in the examination which is made every three years for the degrees, they commonly reject those that write ill, especially if their writing is not exact unless they give great proofs of their ability in other respects, either in the language or in composing good discourses. When they know characters enough for composing, they must learn the rules of the Ven to Chang, which is a composition not much unlike the theses which the European scholars make before they enter upon rhetoric. But Ven to Chang must be more difficult, because the sense is more confined and the style of it is peculiar. They give for a subject but one sentence, taken out of the classic authors. 
in order to ascertain if the children improve the following method is practiced in many places twenty or thirty families who are all of the same name and in consequence have one common hall of their ancestors agree to send their children together twice a month into this hall to compose every head of a family by turns gives the thesis and provides at his own expense the dinner for that day and takes care that it be brought into the hall likewise it is he who judges of the compositions and who determines who has composed the best and if any of this little society is absent on the day of composing without a sufficient cause his parents are obliged to pay about twenty shillings which is a sure means to prevent his being absent besides this diligence which is of a private nature and their own choice all the scholars are obliged to compose together before the inferior mandarin of letters which is done at least twice a year once in the spring and once in the winter throughout the whole empire i say at least for besides these two general examinations of the mandarin of letters examines them pretty frequently to see what progress they have made in their studies and to keep them in exercise End of section 73. This recording is in the public domain. Section 74 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California. United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 74, When I Went to School in China, by Yan Fo Li. Schools in China are generally kept by private gentlemen. The government provides for advanced scholars only. But since the one qualification for office is education, and the avenue to literary distinction and public honors, lies through competitive examinations the encouragement that the government extends to education and learning can be estimated only by that eager pursuit of knowledge which is common to all classes and by the veneration in which scholars and scholarships are held therefore it is not strange that schools are to be found everywhere in small hamlets as in large towns although the government appropriates no funds for the establishment of common schools and although no such thing is known as compulsory education, there is a general desire, even among the poorer classes, to give their children a little schooling. Schools of the lower grades never boast more than one teacher each. The combination system of a headmaster and several assistants does not work well in China. The schoolmaster in China must be absolute. He is monarch of all he surveys. In his sphere, there is none to dispute his rights. You can always point him out among a thousand by the scholar's long gown, by his stern look, by his bent form, by his shoulders rounded by assiduous study. He is usually near-sighted, so that an immense pair of spectacles also marks him as a trainer of the mind. He generally is a gentleman who depends on his teaching to make both ends meet. His school is his own private enterprise, for no such thing exists in China as a school board and if he be an elegant penman, he increases the weight of his purse by writing scrolls. If he be an artist, he paints pictures on fans. If he has not taken a degree, he is a perennial candidate for academic honors, which the government only has a right to confer. A tuition fee in China varies according to the ability and reputation of the teacher, from $2 to $20 a year. It varies also according to the age and advancement of the pupil. The older he be, the more he has to pay. The larger sum I have named is paid to private tutors. A private tutor is also usually invited to take his abode in the house of the wealthy pupil, and he is also permitted to admit a few outsiders. During festivals and on great occasions, the teacher receives presents of money as well as of edibles from his pupils, and always he is treated with great honor by all, and especially by the parents of the pupils for the future career of their children may, in one sense, be said to be in his hands. One who teaches thirty or forty boys at an average tuition fee of four dollars is doing tolerably well in China, for with the same amount he can buy five or six times as much of provisions or clothing 
as can be bought in America. Schools usually open about three weeks after the New Year's Day and continue till the middle of the twelfth month, with but a few holidays sprinkled in. However, if the teacher be a candidate for a literary degree, usually a vacation of about six weeks is enjoyed by the pupils in summer. During the New Year festival, a month is given over to fun and relaxation. Unlike the boys and girls of America, Chinese pupils have no Saturdays as holidays, no Sundays as rest days. School is in session daily from 6 to 10 a.m., at which time all go home to breakfast. At 11 a.m., all assemble again. At 1 p.m., a recess of about an hour is granted to the pupils to get lunch. From 2 p.m. to 4 is held the afternoon session. This, of course, is only approximate, as no teacher is set to a fixed regularity. He is at Uberti to regulate his hours as he chooses. At 4 p.m., the school closes for the day. Schools are held either in private house or in the hall of a temple. The ancestral temples, which contain the tablets of deceased ancestors, are usually selected for schools, because they are of no other use and because they are more or less secluded and generally spacious in a large hall open to on one side towards a court, and having high ceilings, supported by lofty pillars, besides the brick walls, you may see in the upper right-hand corner a square wooden table, behind which is the wooden chair. This is the throne of His Majesty, the schoolmaster. On this table are placed the writing materials, consisting of brushes, India ink, and ink wells made of slate. After pouring a little water in one of these wells, the cake of ink is rubbed in it until it reaches a certain thickness. When the ink is ready to be used, the brushes are held as a painter's brushes are. In conspicuous view are the articles for inflicting punishment, a wooden ruler to be applied to the head of the offender, and sometimes to the hands, also a rattan stick for the body. Flogging with this stick is the heaviest punishment allowed. For slight offenses, the ruler is used upon the palms, and for reciting poorly upon the head. The room at large is occupied by the tables and stools of the pupils, chairs being reserved for superiors. The pupils sit either facing the teacher or at right angles to him. Their tables are oblong in form, and if much use will show the carving habits and talents of their occupants. Usually the pupils are of one sex, for girls seldom attend other schools than those kept in the family, and then only up to eleven or twelve years of age. They are taught the same lessons as their brothers. The boys range all the way from six or seven up to sixteen or seventeen years of age in an ordinary school, for there is no such thing as organizing them into classes and divisions. Each one is studying for himself. Still, there are schools in which all the pupils are advanced and there are others which have none but beginners, but they are rare. I began to go to school at six. I studied first the three primers, the trimetrical classic, the thousand words classic, and the incentive to study. They were in rhyme and meter, and you might think they were easy on that account, but no, they were hard. There being no alphabet in the Chinese language, each word had to be learned by itself. At first, all that was required of me was to learn the name of the character and to recognize it again. Writing was learned by copying from a form written by the teacher, the form being laid under the thin paper on which the copying was to be done. The thing I had to do was to make all the strokes exactly as the teacher had made them. It was a very tedious operation. I finished the three primers in about a year, not knowing what I was really studying. The spoken language of China has outgrown the written, that is, we no longer speak as we write. The difference is like that between the English of today and that of Chaucer's time. I then took up the great learning, written by a disciple of Confucius, and then the doctrine of the mean, by the grandson of Confucius. These textbooks are rather hard to understand sometimes, even in the hands of older folks, for they are treatises on learning and philosophy. I then passed on to the life and sayings of Confucius known as the Confucian Analects, to the American scholars. These books were to be followed by the life and sayings of Minutius and the Five Kings, five classics consisting of books of history, divination, universal etiquette, odes, and the spring and autumn, a brief and abstract chronicle of the times by Confucius. I had to learn all my lessons by rote. 
Commit them to memory for recitation the day following. We read from the top right-hand corner downwards, and then begin at the top with the next line, and so on. Moreover, we begin to read from what seems to you the end of the book. All studying must be done aloud. The louder you speak or shriek, the more credit you get as a student. It is the only way by which Chinese teachers make sure that their pupils are not thinking of something else or are not playing under the desks. Now let me take you into the school where I struggled with the Chinese written language for three years. Oh, those hard characters which refused to yield their meaning to me. But I gradually learned to make and to recognize their forms as well as their names. This school was in the ancestral hall of my clan and was like the one I have described. There were about a dozen of us youngsters placed for the time being under the absolute sway of an old gentleman of threescore and six. He had all the outward marks of a scholar, and in addition he was cross-eyed, which fact threw an, an element of uncertainty into our schemes of fun, for we used to like to get ahead of the old gentleman, and there were a few of us always ready for any lark. It is six a.m. All the boys are shouting at the top of their voices, at the fullest stretch of their lungs. Occasionally one stops and talks to someone sitting near him. Two of the most careless ones are guessing pennies, and anon a dispute arises as to which of the two disputants writes a better hand. Here is one who thinks he knows his lessons, and having given his book to another, repeats it for a trial. All at once the talking, the playing, the shouting ceases. A bent form slowly comes up through the open court. The pupils rise to their feet. A simultaneous salutation issues from a dozen pairs of lips. All cry out, Lao Si, venerable teacher. As he sits down, all follow his example. There is no roll call. Then one takes his book up to the teacher's desk, turns his back to him, and recites. But see, he soon hesitates. The teacher prompts him, with which he goes on smoothly to the last and returns to his seat, with a look of satisfaction. A second one goes up, but, poor fellow, he forgets three times. The teacher is out of patience with the third. Stumble, and down comes the ruler. Whack! Whack! Upon his head. With one hand feeling the aching spot and the other carrying back his book, the discomfited youngster returns to his desk to recon his lesson. This continues until all have recited. As each one gets back to his seat, he takes his writing lesson. He must hold his brush in a certain position, vertically, and the tighter he holds it, the more strength will appear in his handwriting. The schoolmaster makes a tour of inspection and sees that each writes correctly. Writing is as great an art in China as painting and drawing are in other countries. And good specimens of fine writing are valued as good paintings are here. After the writing lesson, it is time to dismiss school for breakfast. On reassembling, the lesson for the day is explained to each one separately. The teacher reads it over, and the pupil repeats it after him several times, until he gets the majority of the words learned. He then returns to his desk and shouts anew to get the lesson fixed in his memory. The more advanced scholars are then favored with the expounding of Confucius's Analects, or some literary essay. After the teacher concludes, each is given a passage of the text to explain. In this way, the meaning of words and sentences is learned and made familiar. The afternoon session is passed by the older pupils in writing compositions in prose or in verse, and by the younger in learning the next day's task. This is in the regular routine, the order of exercises, in Chinese schools. Grammar, as a science, is not taught, nor are the mathematics. Language and literature occupy the child's attention, as I have shown, for the first five or six years. Afterwards, essay writing and poetry are added. For excellence in these two branches, public prizes are awarded by the resident literary sub-chancellor. But public exhibitions and, and declamations are unknown, though Chinese fathers sometimes visit the schools. The relations of the sexes are such that a Chinese mother never has the presumption to appear at the door of a schoolroom in order to acquaint herself with the progress of her child's education. Parents furnish the textbooks as a rule. They are bound in volumes and printed usually with movable type. The pupils usually behave well. If not, the rattan stick comes promptly into use. Chinese teachers have a peculiar method of, of meting out punishment. I remember 
an episode in my school life which illustrates this. One afternoon, when the old schoolmaster happened to be away longer than his wont after the noon recess, some of the boys began to cut up. The fun had reached its height in the explosion of some firecrackers. As they went off, making the hall ring with a noise, the teacher came in, indignant, you may be sure. His defective eyes darted about and dived around to fix upon the culprit. But as he did not happen to be in the line of their vision, the guilty boy stole back to his seat undetected. The old gentleman then seized the rattan and in a loud voice demanded who it was that had let off the crackers. And when nobody answered, what do you suppose he did? He flogged the whole crowd of us, saying that he was sure to get hold of the right one and that the rest deserved a whipping for not making the real offender known. Truly, the paths of Chinese learning in my day were beset with thorns and briars. End of section 74 This recording is in the public domain.